we do have our, uh, have the most important one, uh, which is uh, Adam, who's our, our going to be our first uh, you know, scholarly speaker today. So the fact that he's here means that that we'll we'll be in good shape. That helps. I yeah, I usually hold just for a couple minutes. Yeah. Most people don't hit the button right on the button. It's right. good to see you, Adam. Nice to see you too. Nice to see everybody. Actually, yeah, I want to talk to you later. I have gotten good news on our talk the other day. It actually is going to work out. Great. Okay, that is great news. Thanks. Yeah, all the way to I, I got 120 days beyond the March thing, so it's a split. You would get the whole. You would get a good chunk of the spring. Yeah. So we'll talk. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and and uh, jump in here uh, and get things going. So hi, everybody. Uh, good morning and, and welcome to the second Understanding and Legislative Negotiation Conference uh, here at American University, uh, which is a collaboration between AU's Washington College of Law uh, and the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. Uh, as most of you know, the scholarship we will learn about today is the product of a grant program that we initiated about uh, three years ago with generous support from the Hewlett Foundation uh, and with the help of, of some of you, including Francis and, and Jenny, uh, who were on that selection committee. Uh, it continues the longer standing efforts by Jenny Mansbridge and, and others to facilitate greater understanding of this critical component of democratic policymaking. Uh, so we're very interested to learn today uh, what these scholars have been doing with all of our money. Uh, actually, that's not true. Uh, we, we know what they've been doing, and, and we're very excited to share it with you. Uh, so over the course of the day, uh, we're going to hear about uh, the first large-scale data set uh, of important negotiation cases in Congress from 1981 to 2010, uh, which, is enable, which enables a, a litany of insights about the contextual factors that structure success or failure, uh, mixed method studies that shed light into the role the interpersonal relationships play in negotiation, uh, randomized experiments with actual legislators that assess the manner and extent to which social conformity dynamics affect that process, in-depth interviews with legislators to understand the intersecting roles of race, gender, and caucus membership in negotiation strategies, and a broader study of collaborative behavior writ large in the U.S. House, which yields some surprising insights. And at lunch, she'll be treated to a conversation with former Senator Barbara Mikulski, who knows her way around a bargaining table, of course, as well as anyone. So as Lane Kiffin, the head football coach at Ole Miss would say, get your popcorn ready. I'm guessing very few of you actually know that reference, but that's okay. Uh, the way this is gonna work uh, is that each speaker will present their work for about 20 minutes, and then you'll have about 20 more minutes to ask them questions, which you can do by just using the virtual raise hand function on the Zoom. Uh, I've also been asked uh, to ask you uh, to turn your cameras off when each scholar is presenting their work, you know, putting their slides up on the screen, uh, and then to turn your screens back on, or your cameras, I should say, turn your cameras back on for the Q&A session. Okay, so at this point, I want to hand the virtual mic over to Jenny Mansbridge, Charles F. Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values Emerita, at the Harvard Kennedy School, who is the real mother of this program. Uh, all of you know Jenny, of course, so I won't spend too much time on her bio, uh, except to say that she is the author of several landmark books and her list of awards is longer than my arm. Uh, and my arm is actually pretty long. Uh, I know that she is a role model to all of us. So uh, Jenny, take it away. Oh, great. Well, hello everyone. I'm really delighted to welcome you all today. And, I, and thank you. I, very much wish I could be with you. I think the work you're doing is of the greatest importance. And of course, no one needs to be reminded of the extraordinary polarization we're seeing in the United States today. That polarization has many causes, including the one Frances Lee stresses in her book, Insecure Majorities, that the move from that long period of democratic control of the two houses between World War II to 1980 to these current razor thin majorities change the incentives of the parties from cooperation to mutual destruction. So that's the world we're living in. But amazingly, uh, despite this poisonous atmosphere, things in Congress still get done and members don't like playing a purely negative role. 
So we have something to work with. Um, the work you're all doing on collaboration, interpersonal relationships within caucus dynamics and other issues shows that we can come to understand better how good legislative negotiation works. And as you know, this is a cutting edge field. It's crucial to helping democracies work, but the field is still very new. Um, 10 years ago, when I was president of the American Political Science Association, I, I convened the task force on political negotiation. And those conclusions later appeared in a Brookings volume called Political Negotiation. And before that 2012 task force, no legislative scholar had systematically looked at legislative negotiation. And in the field of negotiation studies, no one had ever studied legislative negotiation. Yet one of the most important things legislators do is negotiate. So we need to study legislative negotiation. Mention legislative negotiation in textbooks, Steve, um, and uh, learn how to do legislative negotiation better. So why are the courses in uh, negotiation in business schools and law schools and public policy schools so wildly popular? Because you can learn to negotiate better. And it's a hugely practical skill um, in the business world. 40 years of studying and teaching negotiation have produced important lessons. Um, and, you know, all that study has revealed that the public and most political scientists and, and perhaps even some of you here don't understand negotiation very well. Most people think that negotiating to agreement is a matter of either finding common ground, finding something you can agree on, or compromising in the standard sense of if you want 10 and I want zero, we settle on five. And of course, those things are important in good negotiation. But, but in addition, there's something extremely important about good negotiation, which is often and central usually to good negotiation, which is a matter of finding ways to give you some you something you want a lot that costs me very little. And so how do you do this? Two big lessons out of that 40 years of, of study and many, many other lessons, but these are two big ones. Bring more issues onto the table. That's the first one. And in Congress, that's easy. Um, in Congress, as Barney Frank said, and, and Francis uh, and Sarah unearthed, the ankle bone down there is connected to the shoulder bone. Everything's connected to every, the ankle bones connected to the shoulder bone. You can bring all sorts of disparate issues together in a deal. And that deal can include things that are very important to one representative and one constituency, but don't cost the rest of us very much. So bring more issues onto the table. And the second is look for the interests behind the positions. Active questioning, active listening can unearth what's important to someone, that, what the interests are behind the positions they're taking. And then you can sometimes find ways of meeting those interests at lower cost than the original position. So those Two fundamental lessons, business schools, law schools, policy schools teach them and many other lessons, uh, teaching more issues to the table, look for the interest behind the position, teach a bunch of lessons that we know make negotiation be easier and better. Um, but until this movement that you're now part of, no one had applied those lessons to legislative negotiation. And without the Hewlett Foundation, this movement would never not have happened in the past decade. It would have happened sometime, but not, not, not this soon. So with the support of the Hewlett Foundation, a team at the Kennedy School, Brian was one of them, developed a set of unique materials, three cases, seven simulations, and an exercise that teach what we now know uh, about how to no negotiate successfully in the context of legislative negotiation. And the Hewlett Foundation supported the first research on legislative negotiation through the Social Science Research Council. And the Hewlett Foundation then supported the creation of the program on legislative negotiation at American University. It's applied, provided support for the hugely popular legislative negotiation pro program that gives training to congressional staff using those Kennedy School materials. And the congressional staff who've taken the training are enthusiastic. And finally, the Hewlett Foundation has provided support for the grants that bring you here today. It's happening. <laughs> the study and understanding of legislation, legislative negotiation is really taking off, and it's incredibly exciting.
So there, there's some big challenges to studying this field because good negotiation takes place behind closed doors and its participants should not disclose afterwards exactly what happened. So how are you gonna study it? They can often discuss both before and after the negotiation, what their original positions were, what their interests were, what new issues or considerations came on the table to make the final deal possible. You can get some retrospective report there are many ways that determined researchers, everyone here, can find to help us all understand better what makes for success and failure in legislative negotiation. And I'm really excited about the research that's emerged, emerged from this grant making session. And I, although I can't be with you today, I'm looking forward to reading it. So to conclude, you know that democracy is in peril across the globe. Legislative negotiation is a great and only barely tapped resource. You here in this room or in the, on this Zoom can help democracies tap that resource, understand it better and use it better. So more power to you. I'm now gonna introduce Bettina Parier. I met Bettina, I can't see her right now on the thing because she closed up the, uh, the view, but um, oh, there she is. All right, I met Bettina when for the task force project, I was interviewing people in legislative negotiation and a master negotiator, Bruce Patton, a co-author of the renowned book, Getting to Yes, said I absolutely had to meet her. So I met her in a hotel in Cambridge. I, I taped an interview of about an hour with her and I was blown away by the many insights she had from her deep experience on the Hill. She then helped us through, think through some of those Kennedy School materials that we were creating and contributed to one, and then served with me on the program that funded the first legislative negotiation grants at the Social Science Research Council. So I was delighted when she masterminded the creation of this fantastic program on legislative negotiation at American University, which is American University is a perfect venue because of that university's strong commitment to hands-on learning and its hundreds of connections to both houses of Congress. And this fall in the Lippincott lecture at the American Political Science Association up in Montreal, I said that our democratic future depends on political theorists, empirical political scientists, and practitioners working together to understand our deepest values, find ways to measure what's going on, and innovate in bringing us closer to those values. Bettina and the Program on Legislative Negotiation stand in the very center of that vital interaction. Thank you, Bettina and David, for making this cutting edge work possible and for bringing together today this exciting collection of scholars. Thanks so much for everyone for, for doing the work you're doing and being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'll jump in and um, I'm going to start with uh, how much we appreciate the in how instrumental you've been in getting all this started. I know David uh, said that you were the mother, sometimes we say the godmother of our program, but you know, you shined a light on what was possible, you know, and you also opened the door for us to help us come through and get this done. So that uh, was a pivotal moment in what we've all been able to do here. So really appreciate that as well as the role that Hewlett has played in its long support for this program, starting with a very um, significant grant in 2019 all the way through today uh, and going forward into the future. So we have much more to do, uh, but I'm gonna talk briefly uh, about the work uh, that we do for those who are less familiar, uh, something David asked me to do. And uh, then I'll hand it off to the program members and I think we'll have a wonderful program today. Basically our program has several components and um, today's program of course features the scholarship aspect of our program. We funded a scholarship now a couple of years ago and we're really excited to see the results of that scholarship today and more to come. Uh, many of our scholars have ongoing work. And uh, I did wanna also highlight that in our latest grant, we have some additional funding, which we will be uh, talking about later this year and offering the opportunity to apply for that funding. So we uh, were very happy to say that the pipeline uh, and the support for the work, you know, of course will continue. Our, uh, our work is also focused on, as Jenny mentioned, um, training congressional staff uh, sent on Capitol Hill 
And we do both a core or fundamentals training and an advanced training based on the Kennedy Center uh, materials, which are fabulous materials, which are public and open and which we encourage other people to utilize at other universities, I might add, uh, because the more we expand and engage uh, people all over the country in these issues, the better off we all are, frankly, because these are wonderful tools to achieve results in negotiations. And that's something uh, that there's clearly a strong desire to make an improvement in that area. And I did wanna thank Brian Mandel, who's with us today, who contributed so much, not only to those materials, but co-teaches a lot of this with us, almost all of it. And we've developed a uh, longstanding multi-year partnership, uh, which I know all of us greatly value. So thank you, Brian, for what you've done and other members of the Harvard faculty and uh, other friends that we've met in the process who've supported our work. So far, we have trained over 300 uh, congressional staffers and we get a range of folks, very senior folks, oftentimes staff directors, chiefs of staff, uh, chief counsels, but also some of the up and coming folks, uh, which they have been encouraged to come in a lot of different offices because on Capitol Hill, people move up so quickly. The opportunity for professional development at the early stages is something they don't get very often. And one day someone could be a ledge uh, aide and the next day they could be a ledge assistant and a year or two later, they're a legislative director. So it's actually quite quite useful to get in the door early with folks. And there's a huge interest in this. Um, and I think uh, we're really pleased to see, to see that, that engagement. The other thing that we try to do is to reach a broad range of people. And we have connected to the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which focuses on ensuring that the broadest range of folks have opportunity for professional development, among other things. And they um, learned of our program, invited us to partner with them, and we have conducted multiple programs now in partnership with the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and they generate invitations with us, and we've worked all of it through the Ethics Committee, so it's sound but it has resulted in making sure that we get this wonderful group um, that we're able to get together for these purposes. Uh, I was mentioning early to Jenny that uh, various folks on Capitol Hill have talked to us about how they've used the program, including for example, the appropriation staff in the house who even told us that at one point they held pre-meetings before negotiations on appropriations bills in which on the agenda was the legislative negotiations training and how to apply it in the upcoming negotiations. They've also indicated a number of things they felt they were able to negotiate more effectively as a result. And we're thinking about how we're gonna capture all of that. We've started that process, but I think it really is something we wanna focus even more on going forward. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are, as I mentioned, promoting this work and materials in other universities. We don't want this to, we want to be the hub. We love being the hub here at American University, but we also want other people to embrace this. And uh, I guess Chris Bertram is on as well here, and he co-teaches and uh, was here from the start as essentially a co-founder in this program. And he and I, he is on the Republican side, I've been on the Democratic side, have been taking this program, not only to Capitol Hill, but to other venues. And in fact, uh, we both have recently joined the Georgetown University faculty as well, and have been te and taught a spring course in negotiation in their Capital Applied Learning Lab. And we've been teaching seminars to graduate students at Georgetown, as well as American University. So uh, we'll be recruiting more faculty going forward, because there's only so many of these you can do. But it's a great start. And that's something we really want to um, make sure that we continue. So uh, really beyond that, I just want to say that uh, we have received another grant from Hewlett. As I mentioned, we have a future uh, ahead of us that we're very excited about. Um, and it goes off into the multi-year uh, you know, future. So we're, we're really gonna be able to get a lot of things done. So let me stop here and let me thank all of you for your work in advancing the study of legislative negotiations, which is something I know we all share as a really important goal and value, especially at this critical time. So I'll turn it back to David and uh, look forward to the program. By the way, I'm gonna be interviewing Senator Mikulski today. I'll say that at noon. And I think you'll find it very interesting. She and I spent a lot of time together ahead of this interview thinking about negotiation and her perspective on that as the chairman and ranking member of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. And she has some very interesting stories to tell that line up with the negotiation scholarship that I think people will find interesting. So 
David, back to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Bettina. So I can't believe it. We are right on time. Uh, this is this is great. Uh, we're going to start things off today uh, with Adam Zelzer from the University of Chicago. He's going to be talking about research that he has conducted with his colleagues, uh, Manny Shadmere from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, and Elizabeth Dorsum at Lincoln University of Missouri. Uh, by the way, it, it sort of uh, has worked out in kind of a funny way that three of these um, grants wound up going to, to people at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly why that happened, but, but there it is. Anyway, uh, Adam, uh, you can go ahead and, and share your screen whenever you're ready uh, and go ahead and kick things Ooh. off. Uh, as I said, you've you've got 20 minutes uh, to talk about going along to get along three experiments on conformity and strategic voting in state legislatures. Thank you. I was optimistic I'd be able to share my screen, but it looks like uh, I need to be allowed to do so. I, I think, okay. uh, you know, sometime long down the road, when hopefully I retire from this business, if there's a Zoom meeting, I will still be unable to, to work Zoom. <laughs> Hopefully, Hannah, are you there somewhere? Can you uh, enable his screen sharing? Yes, sorry, give me one second. Okay. So while I wait uh, to share my screen, let me uh, start off by saying thank you for uh, uh, obviously inviting us and, and having us be here. Thank you for the rare pleasure of starting off a panel. Usually I uh, go last. So thank you for resisting the tyranny of the alphabetical uh, majority, I suppose. Or um, Okay, great. Uh, and I'm particularly happy to go first because that gives me the ch chance to be the first to say thank you to David and Bettina. Um, you guys have shepherded us, shepherded us through really crazy times I know our research stopped and started so many times. So the fact we have anything to share today is really due to you guys and your flexibility and support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as David mentioned, this project is joint with Elizabeth Dorsum and Mehdi Shadmir. When we started thinking about negotiation, we thought about conformity. Um, and so we thought back to kind of the textbook Congresses and the, maybe the textbook deal makers of those Congresses. And so I love starting with this picture of Sam Rayburn uh, and LBJ. Uh, Rayburn was known to tell members, typically new members, that you have to go along to get along. And of course, what he meant was, if you want to achieve anything in Congress, if you have legislation you want to pass, if you want to achieve a position of importance, you need to be a team player. Don't run against the institution, don't pick needless fights, help us pass our agenda and we'll help you when we can. The view we have of party leaders in Congress these days is, is very different. Uh, typically the phrase you hear is herding cats. So this is a cartoon of Harry Reid, uh, but this phrase has been used uh, repeatedly. Uh, Trent Lott named his memoir, Herding Cats. John Lovett has a new book about congressional leadership about herding cats. John Boehner, Paul Ryan, even Barack Obama have been uh, referred to as trying to herd congressional cats. And as a, a former cat owner, what I like about uh, this imagery is it's not just that cats are individualistic and want to you know, do their own thing, it's that they're actively antisocial, um, perhaps like our representatives in Congress. And so we wanted to explore this tension between conformity and individualism in legislatures. So to bring in a little bit of, of past research here, uh, the way we used to study legislatures focused, in my view at least, quite a bit more on the sociological processes and influences that led legislators to vote the way that they did or to take the policy positions that they did. Um, there were strong social norms, there was a respect for the institution that led to a collegial and clubby feel. Members liked being in Congress. Um, strange, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so Donald Matthews quotes an anonymous senator talking about how there's a great pressure for conformity in the Senate. Uh, around the same time, JFK says something similar that you know we just wanna get along with each other, we want to be liked. 
That does not seem to be uh, the norm today in our legislatures or in our in some of our research on legislatures. There is a view out there that we can understand legislators' position taking as a very individualistic process, that legislators have their own ideological predispositions that are a function of their own personal policy preferences, plus those that will help them get reelected, their constituency preferences, et cetera, and that we can kind of set aside uh, what their peers want, what their peers think, or the, the, the context in which they are making these decisions. Uh, there are people pushing back on this very individualistic view, you know, Francis and Larry Evans amongst others, but there is this individualistic view out there about how our legislators make decisions. So in this paper, we just want to ask to what extent do legislators feel a desire to conform? Do they take positions to match those of their peers? You know, I, I was just going to say important sub-question, why? Like that can apply to all of our work uh, generally, but it's not so much why as if we think about social or strategic position taking, how might that manifest? So our focus is on, you know, herding or conformity or descriptive norms. And I'll, I'll you know, uh, ex expand on what I mean by that in a bit. But it also could be that legislators you know, vote strategically based on partisan considerations or whether they're pivotal in a vote. And so we want to see to what extent we can talk to that in our experiments as well. So what did we do? We met with uh, just over 200 state legislators. We're only going to use a subset of the data today. So we're going to talk, uh, talk about the 163 state legislators from Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Missouri. And we informed them about their peers' support for randomly selected bills. And we want to know whether our main outcome, whether a legislator is more likely to support a bill if they are told that many of their peers support the bill too. Our results, spoiler, uh, they're not. They are shockingly immune to conformity. So for our hurting or conformity results, we see no evidence that legislators are more likely to support a bill because it's broadly supported by their peers. We also look at strategic pivotal voting. So there have been some papers uh, before us, and there's some reason to think that party influences matter when the vote is close. You know, party leaders will you know, twist a member's arm and ask for their vote only when that vote is going to be pivotal, otherwise let them vote their district. And we find that when votes look like they might be close, legislators are not more likely to help out their co-partisan. Uh, if anything, they are much less likely to help out their co-partisan, but we don't want to make too much of that result. So as is the case with kind of a null result paper, we might have a lot of reasons to think why this might be. And I'm probably not going to have time, I'm not going to have time to go through these possible explanations. The first couple refer to our, you know, the information we gave the, the state legislators. Maybe it was just not credible. Maybe they, you know, they looked at us, who are you guys, you professors telling us whether our peers support this bill or not? I'm just going to ignore you. Um, and that doesn't look like that's why uh, the information was ineffective. We look at various reasons why our thinking about hurting or conformity might be wrong. We don't see any evidence uh, of hurting using these other approaches or definitions either. We think about how pivotality could be different than what we think as well. We don't see anything there either. So what we're left with is basically the residual, which is legislators simply make very individualistic decisions in our sample. They do not seem to care what their peers do. Uh, you know, of course, one reason, you know, one important outside explanation that we can't you know, entirely uh, discount, of course, is that it's a survey. Uh, we do have some co-sponsorship data, so real behavioral data, but maybe on a survey, legislators are individualistic, but when it's time to actually cast the vote, they're more strategic. It's not clear to me whether they would be more or less strategic or uh, prone to conformity on a survey versus you know, real life behavior, but that's probably something everybody's thinking about, so I'll go ahead and get in front. 
Okay, so uh, to again, engage with the literature uh, a bit. When I think about social learning, I generally think about cue taking. Uh, that's the literature I go to in legislative studies. I don't think this paper actually relates that clearly to cue taking, however, because what's so important about cue taking is the identity of the cue giver. You go to someone because they're an expert or because you trust them. In our experiment, the legislators support that we tell to the ensuing legislators, they're anonymous. We don't tell legislators who we had met with before. So it doesn't fit terribly well with the cue taking literature. It fits in a little bit better with literatures on herding and conformity. You know, these are distinct mechanisms by which a legislator might choose to take a position that matches their peers. I'm going, and I have been already, conflating them because in our experiment, they're observationally equivalent. If you can think of ways to distinguish them, uh, that would be great. Uh, of course, in our study, we find no results anyway, so it's not like we have to really say which of these two mechanisms is it. We don't find evidence for either. But just thinking uh, ahead, how could one distinguish hurting and conformity? I think is an interesting and challenging problem. Another literature that I, I, I like that we're starting to engage with more is, is more quantitatively is on strategic voting. So there is, a, you know, typically when we think about strategic voting in Congress, that that has been discussed with respect to killer amendments. But there really aren't that many killer amendments that people have identified. Uh, and what killer amendments there were were seemingly all from, again, the mid-century Congresses. They were about race. It was this weird tripartite Congress. So it doesn't seem like that is a particularly common activity or phenomenon. There's log rolling, which is also uncommon and difficult to observe and potentially illegal. Uh, although I have seen it in some legislatures, although when I've seen it, it has never worked. It has always unraveled for some reason or another. And then another way to think about strategic voting is to think about pivotal uh, players and why they might be strategic. So uh, a pivotal voter might be strategic for partisan reasons. Uh, this is, you know, Snyder, Gross Close, and Spin Cook, Montanus, and May Magleby point out what I mentioned earlier, we might see party pressure only on these pivotal voters. Okay, so we're gonna look for that. And another way, and we're, we're not gonna quite engage with this, that uh, legislators may be strategic is by looking to the future. So a pivotal voter might think, not only how will my vote influence the policy outcomes today, but how might it influence policy outcomes down the road when I may or may not be the pivotal voter anymore. Um, interesting, but we, we can't speak too much to that. And then the literature outside of legislative studies that is most similar to ours is on this higher order beliefs and, and the substitutes or complements of, uh, of behavior. So particularly the Cantoni et al. experiment, uh, the Hong Kong experiment, in which they inform students in Hong Kong of their peers' intentions to protest, to see whether students were more or less likely to protest when they were told that more or fewer of their peers were voting. So we think uh, this experiment speaks to primarily the herding and conformity literature and the strategic pivotal uh, partisan voting literature. Okay, so what did we do? Um, our design is pretty simple, if hard to, to implement. We found much harder than we thought. We conducted a first round survey in each state where we talked to 10 legislators and asked them whether they supported 10 real bills on the agenda. We also elicited their prior bill popularity. We're, we have those data, we're gonna use them potentially for some things, but not in this paper. We then conducted a second round of other legislators where we met with them and asked them if they supported these bills. But for some of the bills we provide, randomly selected bills, we provided the first round results. We also ask them whether they think the bill will pass or not, which will serve as a nice manipulation check to show that our information is influential. Uh, they do believe it. They do update something, some of their beliefs, but just not their own positions. These three states are all Republican. They are all quite professionalized. Uh, there were reasons why we went to more professional legislators, but I'll leave that for the q and I suppose. And we fielded these in 2021 and 2022. We were all ready to go in uh, winter of 2020. 
We were planning to field this only in Missouri. And then of course, state legislature shut down. And so we were on hiatus for a while, went back out into the field in 2021 to some states that had summer sessions, and then finally were able to get back to Missouri in 2022. The bills in each state are notable uh, in that they are not explicitly partisan. So we chose bills that either had some bipartisan support, sometimes sponsored by members of both parties, maybe they had co-sponsors from the other party, the content was not overtly partisan. And we did that because we wanted to diminish partisanship as a consideration. Now, partisanship and partisan conformity, I think is super interesting, but if we just wanna think about conforming with the interests of the body as a whole, what we didn't want was for legislators to think, is this a democratic bill? Is it a Republican bill? Okay, I know how many Democrats or Republicans there are. That's how many I think will support it. I'll take the party position, whatever. Like, so we wanted to diminish that in this experiment. So these bills should be relatively less, certainly less partisan, but less conflictual, probably less salient, and probably more of a type of common value uh, problem than a distributive or ideological bill. Surprisingly, only two out of the 30 bills we're gonna talk about even reached a vote. Uh, they both passed. And if you're curious, you know, our round one support, so from our survey said 90% of legislators supported uh, House Bill 1082. It passed almost unanimously in Pennsylvania. We had 100% in Ohio support House Bill 3, it passed 92 to four. So like some nice base validity for our survey. The round two participants were mostly from Missouri. Uh, we have uh, meaningful sample sizes from Pennsylvania and Ohio. They were mostly drawn from the lower chamber. We did survey and include 10 senators in Ohio. If we drop them, results don't change. And of course we have Democrats and Republicans. Our treatment again was how many of 10 anonymous peers supported the bill. And the outcomes are individual support for the bill and predicted passage. Do they think it will pass the chamber? Uh, once again, just a reminder about the mechanisms we are interested in, conformity or hurting. Does learning that a bill is popular make legislators more likely to support it? Or conversely, does learning that a bill is unpopular make legislators less likely to support it? And does learning that a bill sponsored by a co-partisan is you know, kind of 50-50, does that make a legislator more likely to support it? Does learning that a bill from an outpartisan is 50-50 make a legislator less likely to support it? So this is our specification for the conformity and herding analysis. We're just gonna regress the legislator support for the bill on an indicator for treatment. The number of the 10 first round legislators who supported it and an interaction of the two. So we would expect uh, beta three to be positive. Uh, when we tell legislators that a bill has high support, we should think that makes them more supportive of it, less, less support, less supportive. And we might think that beta one is negative as well, uh, but primarily we're interested in, in beta three, which we think should be positive. What do we find on own support? Precise zeros. And on, in all of our robustness checks, just zero, zero, zeros. Um, so we can rule out kind of meaningfully large results. We do find a little bit of evidence that legislators update on passage. So if, sure, if we tell you that 90% of your peer supported bill, you should think it's more likely to pass than if you thought it was, it was fewer. We find some evidence of this um, and more evidence that, you know, in, in the appendix uh, in, in the later slides. Our, oh, I'm almost done, I see I'm just about out of time. Our main specification for the pivotality analysis is we want to regress a legislator support on treatment, whether they are a co-partisan with the bill sponsor and the interaction of the two. Again, the idea is that beta three should be positive. When we tell you that a bill is 50-50, if it's from a co-partisan, you should be more likely to support it. Uh, again, we might think beta one is negative, because if it's from an outpartisan, you might be less likely to support it. And we're just gonna subset the data to observations that are relatively close to 50-50. That seems easier than including a triple interaction. 
And so with different bandwidths here, so we have 96 observations where the round one survey was five out of 10. Uh, we had 217 where it was four or six out of 10 and so on. Through all of these you know, windows, we get big negative results on the, 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 the estimate of interest. So if anything, co-partisans are much less likely to support bills that are 50-50 from their co-partisans. These in particular, uh, these estimates, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, um, in the 50% and the 40 to 60% columns, uh, the words implausibly large come to mind. Like these are just enormous, you know, clearly biased uh, you know, estimates. Um, but nevertheless, they are negative, not, not at all what we expect. Okay, so to summarize, um, we find that information on Bill's popularity does not induce conformity or hurting. Legislators do not take positions to match their peers. And the pivotality results were the opposite of what we expected. And we can rule out you know, meaningful co-partisan bias. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, great. Thanks a lot, Adam. That's uh, fascinating stuff. So uh, again, if uh, all of you just want to, you know, use the uh, the function to, to raise your your hands, uh, then Adam can can pull up the list of participants and see whose hands are, are raised and 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 call on you as he likes. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'll go ahead and and um, you know exercise my prerogative as as the co-host here to to ask the first question, which is a simple one. Uh, it's really clarifying. Uh, and that is when you informed people in, in the treatments of you know what their their peers had had wanted to do, uh, did they know that it was you know just ten uh, other legislators that you had had uh, had surveyed? Yes. Okay. So one thing, and and maybe this would be interesting going forward. One design question we had was: Should we just stop at the ten? You know, in Missouri, we ended up talking to ninety. Or right. should we keep updating the information as we get more? Mm. And that seemed like a difficult thing to implement, but potentially could be very interesting as a design. Just the 10. Okay, thanks a lot. Because I mean, I could, you know, if they yes, heard- Yes, but so I will also, since that is kind of the first uh, <laughs> objection we might think is that it's 10 legislators, they're not randomly sampled. How accurate really was it? Well, we have the second round support. And if we just plot the first round support on second round, it's pretty strongly correlated. Um, okay. So it does look like the, the, that information was reliable. And then of course we have more evidence that it seems like legislators actually did believe the information yeah. when it comes to bill passage. So. Okay, great. That's, that's great. And then I'll just uh, follow up with, with one other, uh, which is in your regressions. Um, you know, you did observe that, that, you know, pretty strong and, and uh, significant coefficients for peer support itself, right? Not the the interaction with the treatment, but just sort of like in, in general, uh, the more the legislators' peers supported a, a bill, the more likely uh, they were, um, which, you know, there's a number of explanations for, for why that could be. But um, it seems that one potential one would be that, you know, a lot of them already knew uh, how their peers felt on, on these bills, right? And, and so the, the dynamic could have been going on uh, independent of, of your uh, treatments. Good point. Um, so we did ask, but only in two of the three states. Before we gave them the information, we said, how many of your peers do you think supported it? So mm -hmm. how many of the 10 do you think supported it? Mm -hmm. And on average, they were off by 20%. Huh. Okay. So like that's pretty that's meaningful error. Yeah. Not, obviously, that means sometimes they were pretty accurate, but sure. by and large, they were, they were pretty off. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Valeria? Hi, yeah, I hope you can hear me. I'm driving, but I'm not watching. I'm being safe. <laughs> um, but I wondered if the kind of the framing was a little bit off the to you. And I wondered if there might be some literature and marketing or someplace that you could go to. So if it's a low salient issue, um, a low salient issue um, that uh, very low stakes in terms of how you vote, then maybe you default to a no on it. Um, or maybe, so what came to mind for me was when the people come to my door unsolicited and they're trying to sell me a cable, you know, a trim or something. And they tell me, order whatever. Your neighbor got this service for their house or they 
got this, and I'm not persuaded by it. I just wonder if that could, if there might be another framework that you could use to understand the behavior of legislators when there it's relatively low stakes, there's no cost, um, and how they might interpret um, their own decisions there, like hurting might that even be relevant? Yeah, so, I mean, the way I think about your comment is about the survey. You know, talk about low stakes. It's a survey, anonymous, with some academics. What are we going to do to them? Um, we do have some evidence when it comes to the, their co-sponsorship. Again, we're not influenced. Um, so, you know, we'll, uh, we'll think more about that. Um, you talk about, you know, uh, someone coming to your door. The, the example I, I keep in mind is like a faculty committee, you know, say a hiring committee. And, you know, if I find out that three of the other members on the committee like a candidate, but if I know nothing about the candidate, you would think I would be slightly more likely to say, all right, fine, like, you know, bring them out than if none of them or one of them or two of them like the candidate. Like, it seems like this kind of hurting or conformity is a natural state. Um, there and there is that nice paper by by Gerber and Rogers about conformity in voter turnout uh, and descriptive norms. People just want to match what other people are doing. Um, and, I, and and in that respect, I would think the low stakes actually might make that more likely than less likely. But yeah, uh, who knows? We're we're, we're kind of limited in what we can do with that. But thank you. Yeah. Now, well, if wait. I can, now, if I can follow up. Um, if, if most of the bills are going to die anyway, right, if that's what they think, then again, you change, this is not like faculty hiring when you're going to hire somebody, right? This is, it doesn't matter whether I say yes or no. So I don't mean to press, but I, I just not, not persuaded that. No, I agree. So I agree on our survey, it doesn't matter whether they say yes or no. It is not true that all, they think the bills are going to fail. I think one of the really interesting things, and if people know of work that talks about this, I'd like to hear about it because I haven't been able to find much. Um, legislators are really bad at telling whether bills are gonna pass or not. And in fact, the amount of support that they have, that the bill has is actually not terribly predictive of whether it passes either. You know, Usually we measure support at the end of the process once a bill reaches a vote. I, I don't think we have a ton of measures of how popular bills are way earlier in the process, like when we were conducting these surveys. Um, and so, you know, again, to show the same figure I showed to David, um, a lot of these bills have 80% support or more. Most of them did not pass. They did not even reach a vote. And we asked legislators, do you think this bill will, will pass? And a lot of them said, yes, we, I think it will. Um, but the bills don't. And so that was uh, interesting to, to me um, and, and suggest that they, they do think the bills have a chance and they're real and, and they might pass it. They were, they were wrong. And maybe some of that was pandemic related possible. Thank you, Delaria. Others? While others may be uh, contemplating uh, uh, raising their hands, I'll, I'll just ask you how um, how it is that you recruited your sample. Uh, we emailed and called every state legislator in those states. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, I believe, went around the Missouri Capitol to try to recruit people. She was, she was really excellent uh, at it, which is why we had so many Missouri legislators. Uh, it was a little trickier to do it. Uh, we had RAs actually in every state capital. Uh, so we had RAs in Harrisburg and Columbus and uh, Raleigh, I suppose. Uh, oh, I, sorry, North Carolina people tell me if I got the state capital wrong. Um, and we, we had people here at UChicago to deal with uh, Springfield. Um, and so we had the RAs kind of locally to try to reach out to the state legislators and that, that, was, that was fun. Um, and yeah, it was a little tricky to get state legislators to participate. So um, did they ultimately take the surveys online or, or were you interviewing them face-to-face -face or, or what was going on? They were all Zoom or face-to-face. -face. Mm, okay. uh, yeah, I, for some reason, I, I have an aversion to online surveys with elites because yeah. 
you know, I, I sat in legislators' offices for a long time when they got a survey and they said, hey, you want to take it? Uh, I was like, no, I don't. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but the assistant might have taken it for them. And yeah, yeah um, I was I was wondering about that. So that's really good. That's that's in a really an, an encouraging aspect of this that I think you'll want to make sure that you emphasize because uh, that's impressive, right? That you j just getting that many in-person interviews, really, uh, you know, uh, or in-person surveys with with state legislators, late tours uh, is impressive feat. So, okay, Thanks. we've got Steve and Chris here. So, I'll yeah, step. Chris, I think your hand, your hand was up. Yeah, no, th thanks, Adam. Hope, hope you can hear me okay. So you did get it right. It is, it is Raleigh. I'm glad you didn't say rally because then I might have had to to call you out and embarrass you a bit in front of everybody. No, it's all good. Um, and so anyway, you said legislative professionalism, and so you, you caught my attention when you mentioned that earlier. So if you could say a little bit more now, about curious, why we like, need professional states. Yep. Yeah, just kind of what implications you think that have. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about professionalism. So yeah, I'd like for you to say more. Boy, that's a good question. Um, so simply put, we pick professional states because we, as the other scholars know, the grant was originally, I think, through the end of, like kind of middle of 2021. And so we needed to go out in the summer. And so we needed states that were meeting over the summer. And that was Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, and then, you know, it extended a little, little bit longer and we got to go back to Missouri. Um, so really we picked them kind of for that reason, not because they were professional. Um, it is a little, it's not clear to me actually, and if you have thoughts, I'd be interested, um, what, whether these results would be different in less professional states. Um, there might be more hurting in less professional states because legislators have less information. And so maybe you're say, okay, I, I, I don't wanna you know, uh, stand, stand alone here because my, you know, I don't have an assistant to research this bill. If everyone else is doing something, maybe there's good reason they're doing it. So that 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 could be true. In which case, that'd be a really good reason to go do this in a less professional state um, to see. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just really quickly, Steve. I know you have a question, but um, I, I would like to see some variation there. I think you're exactly right in terms of thinking about the resources, right? And you think about some of the the recent work that looks at how professionalism impacts the way that. Uh, I think people rely on on the copy and text. Um, the pitch, I think, I think like Virginia Gray, Eric Hansen, Josh Chancer, uh, UNC folks. So here I am. You know, I'm a homer, but anyway, professionalism does matter, right? In terms of how people make decisions and so forth uh, in the lawmaking process. So I, I love to see that some variation there. Um, yeah. So now, anyway, I hope that not, I like what you did. I'm not trying to call you out, but I think I think it'd be interesting to see that uh, uh, replicated in a different setting. I agree. No, thank you. Great suggestion. Uh, Hi, Stephen. Hi. Uh, well, I think it's an interesting study, and and it and it and it does show, of course, the difficulty of devising experiments to capture um, the dynamics that take place on uh, in in legislative bodies. Uh, the traditional literature, though, uh, on hurting would focus on uh, the strength of social incentives that committee and party leaders and others, even faction leaders, can bring to bear on legislators. And I appreciate that you can't replicate those uh, factors, uh, which vary over time. You talk about the strength of mid 20th century congressional norms and their weakening over time uh, and the variation across legislatures uh, in, uh, in the strengths of those uh, social incentives. Uh, on the pivotalness uh, question, uh, I, I honestly don't see any literature that says that uh, merely being a 50-50 vote um, generates pressure to uh, to vote one way or another. In principle, then any legislator can be pivotal. I I, I see the, the the core logic to it, but no one argues that every legislator's uh, a target for uh, bargaining. Uh, it's always uh, in the context of some ideological spectrum uh, to identify who might be wavering or who could be whose vote can be purchased the least expensively uh, because there's that underlying uh, dimensionality to preference. Um, and of course, there's a great deal of empirical literature. Larry Evans is in the middle of it uh, with uh, evidence on uh, how legislators, uh, leaders actually, actually target uh, um, middle of the road or wavering um, 
uh, member. So we know that that's really how the problem should be formulated. And I'm not sure that that the mere presence of a 50-50 vote is going to alter a legislator's thinking about where they should land. What do you think? Yeah, I, so certainly we cannot replicate a party leader coming to you and twisting your arm or offering you a concession or a promise for some future vote all of those ways that, you know, and yeah, that Larry or, and others would talk about how whips and, and party organizations win votes. We can't do it. And so, yeah, you might, and so what is our mechanism on pivotality? It is maybe a weird internalized pro-partisan bias. Like, yes, legislators have uh, a desire to represent their constituency and achieve their individual goals, whatever, but they also want to help their party as much as they can, be a good party soldier. And maybe that would be the kind of mechanism that would show up. And it's, yes, surely secondary to kind of intentional arm twisting. Uh, and we don't see it. So uh, point take it, point well take it. On the hurting side, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit and say there are certainly, you know, on, on at least on the formal model side, like desire for status um, certainly fits certain models of conformity. Um, hurting is really about signals and private information. And so even if legislators in this sample don't have a, a pressure for status um, because other people don't know what their, what their position is, um, they are still observing private information from the 10 legislators who went before them. And that information could be meaningful. And I think about a legislator I worked with in Tennessee who was the lone vote against an anti-bullying bill. And the reason was he thought that, you know, this type of bullying was already illegal. There were already statutes against it. And so he stood up and gave a speech about how this was government overreach and we don't need bills like this. It's just a waste of everybody's time. It turned out there weren't laws against this kind of thing already. And he was wrong. And he became known as the pro-bullying legislator. Now, he probably should have heard it. Like, there were 98 other legislators. He probably should have looked at their yes votes and said, maybe they know something about the content of this bill and the statutes that I don't know, and I should follow their guide. He didn't, to his own detriment, uh, perhaps. And I think that's the kind of hurting of just private information sharing that, that I have in mind here. What do you think? Uh, well, my thought is is that legislators uh, operate in a um, uh, in a complex environment, and that party is just one source of uh, social conformity. Um, constituency uh, expectations uh, is an obvious other one. Uh, historically, committee uh, colleagues expectations is another. Uh, in the modern Congress, factional uh, expectations uh, have proven. Uh, to be important and historically they ebb and flow in their significance so that so that when we look at uh, empirical studies that try to weigh the balance of partisan factors in the mid 20th century we would have said oh maybe a third or 40 percent of votes party becomes a live factor but on so many other issues party really isn't relevant and so conformity uh, if it exists if the hurting exists it's with respect to other other groups um, and some of those groups are external to the legislature. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think we can say that social conformity is, is a non-factor in human life. Uh, uh, it, it, it's this particular form of it that doesn't seem to explain much over this particular set of bills uh, in, these, in these legislatures. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, concerned ab about the external validity, the general the, the, the degree to which we can generalize from these findings. Yep. Uh, experiments are very limited in their external validity. Um, we are the first to do this kind of experiment for sure. Um, to the extent that legislators do seem to be internalizing the information and actually valuing the information, essentially valuing the whip counts that we're giving them, um, there's no reason this shouldn't be done over and over. It couldn't be done over and over with different types, with different groups. So absolutely, one thought we had, and I'm curious, we're out of time, um, looking at kind of support within party, within faction, within committee, et cetera, 
one could imagine looking for conformity in all those ways. But we just wanted to start off with conformity with the institution as a whole, setting aside all those subgroups and all, all those cleavages, just with everyone, uh, do we see it? And I'm obviously not saying that conformity doesn't exist, uh, but we couldn't find it um, in, in our, our fairly narrow slice, our very narrow slice uh, of legislatures. All right. Well, uh, we are at time, as you noted, and and, and again, we are uh, staying perfectly on schedule here this morning, and so that's great. And and I appreciate uh, all of that, Adam. Uh, again, I think this is a these are a fascinating set of studies. You guys did a a, a ton of work. Uh, the the results are are counterintuitive, um, and you know, um, give us lots of, of of more things to to think about. In some ways, it would have been you know more exciting had had there been some results, but. Uh, but but either way, um, I encourage you to continue with this work, and, and as Bettina said, we uh, should be able to help you with that. Uh, all right. So next up um, is uh, Matt Green uh, from Catholic University, and uh, I am and particularly in, enthusiastic uh, about this project. I, I feel like in some ways it it comes directly out of the the dinner that we had at at APSA several years ago, and Valeria was as, was at our table that that night as well. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember that, Valeria, but um, but this uh, data set and, and, and study and results that Matt's going to share with us, preliminary as they are, uh, I think are really exciting. And, and so take it away, Matt. Um, so let me um, go ahead and uh, share my screen and see if I can if I have, if I also struggle to do that, um, it is a, a pleasure to be here virtually and to um, see so many of you and so many um, friendly faces. Um, and I want to start by um, apologizing for those of you who came to the, um, who were at the presentation uh, I did of this back in April. Some of these slides are going to be very familiar to you, but I do have additional data and some additional findings I'm excited to share with you and also to get your feedback. So. Um, before I begin, uh, I also I put at the bottom some of the folks I have to thank, including some people who are here who offer some great suggestions and advice for me in pursuing this project uh, and some good research questions, some of which I have some preliminary answers to. And I especially want to thank, uh, of course, David and Bettina and the Program on Legislative Negotiation, as well as uh, my uh, research assistants who've been doing a great deal of excellent work collecting a lot of data from a lot of sources. So this uh, project, um, <clears throat> is about um, uh, using a, a, a basically gathering data, creating a new data set to uh, try to get some leverage on this question of legislative negotiation and the circumstances or factors which make it more likely to succeed in Congress. Um, so as we know, um, uh, negotiation and compromise are central to legislative success and especially in the American political system with separated powers, bicameralism, and relatively heterogeneous parties. You can't get things done, uh, certainly can't enact a law or even necessarily have a majority in favor of a bill in either chamber of Congress without some negotiation. Um, so from this, uh, one of the important research questions that we have is what makes legislative negotiation more likely to succeed or fail. Uh, and as Jay Manbridge said earlier, this is something that not many folks had really touched upon in the congressional setting until relatively recently. Um, but it's obviously uh, extremely important. Now, before I continue, I should just say a little bit about what I mean by legislative negotiation. Um, in this case, I'm defining it as structured discussions between two or more sets of individuals that include at least one member of Congress that have some disagreements over the content of a policy proposal. And by success, I define uh, what by what I def how I define success is agreement that's reached such that the proposal that's being discussed moves to the next stage of the legislative process. It does not mean that what is being negotiated becomes law necessarily, but that whatever the next stage is in the legislative process is reached as a result of these negotiations. Uh, I'll just quickly go over some of the research that's already been done on uh, legislative negotiation and the circumstances under which it's more likely to succeed, um, because we have a fair amount that we already know based on this prior literature. We have uh, you know, formal theory, deductive research using things like um, game theory, looking at bargaining, looking at things like 
What are the structures of the rules under which negotiation is taking place? What's the order in which things are being considered? Um, and from that, we learned a lot about some of the elements, the structural elements that make negotiation more likely to succeed. Um, we've also had research that looks at individual case studies or makes general observations about legislative negotiation. Um, so uh, Sarah Binder and Francis Lee, uh, their essay on negotiation, talking about some individual cases and other work that's been done as well. Um, to give us some flavor for what, a bit, given these circumstances, these individual cases, what makes negotiation more likely to be successful. We also have research that looks at broader factors that create a favorable environment for negotiation. Um, do we have unified government versus divided government? Uh, what do we have a, a president of a particular uh, background or uh, you know focused on negotiation or having a background in negotiation? So these have also given us some insight into what makes negotiation more likely to succeed or fail. There's also a set of literature that's looked at the characteristics of negotiators. What is their background? Do they uh, do they have extensive experience? In negotiation, um, other elements of uh, you know factors or characteristics of negotiators that make them uh, more likely to be successful. Uh, but what we don't have is a database of cases of uh, negotiation in Congress across a broad time period. We have a lot of individual cases, but we don't have a large data set of these cases. Um, something that Sarah and Francis noted in their um, in their. Uh, piece on negotiation back in 2013. And having a data set of this kind would be uh, useful for a number of reasons. For one thing, it would allow us to generalize beyond individual case studies. So we can think not just about what happened in, uh, you know, in case X with Bill Y, but also if we're looking at a lot of different cases, we can make broader generalizations. It might also allow us to uh, identify some new factors, things we haven't anticipated that make negotiation successful or not, and maybe even some of the complex relationships between factors that uh, induce success in, neg in legislative negotiation. Um, if our N is large enough, we can in theory test various hypotheses about the circumstances under which negotiation will succeed. And if it's a broad enough period of time, we might be able to find some trends over time. So it's one of the things that was brought up uh, when I presented the, this work back in April of 2021. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well in my presentation. So there's a lot of advantages to having data set like this. And that's really the goal of this uh, project. Now, before I talk about how the data uh, was collected and is being collected, uh, I want to talk about some general hypotheses that uh, can be tested with this data uh, about what makes legislative negotiation uh, successful or not. And I've divided these into the who, what, where, when, and why categories. Some of them are drawn from prior literature and some are others that, um, that come from myself or other places. So the first set of hypotheses is about the players themselves, not so much their characteristics as who they are. So um, one of the uh, most important ideas about negotiation is that the president plays a very critical role in bringing differing parties together, uh, both, both across parties and then within uh, a political party, usually their own political party. So uh, one of the hypotheses that I test is, a, is whether the, pre the, the presence of the president or White House staff in negotiations increases the likelihood of success. I also include leadership. Um, now I have here when party leaders are involved, I think um, really it's leadership in general. It could be committee leaders as well. Um, the idea being that since these negotiations are in Congress, presumably leaders are best equipped, well equipped to negotiate and bring compromise um, because of their skill set, because they know the players well. And of course, they've been chosen in many cases by those individuals. The second category is the what. Um, and here uh, I'm testing the hypothesis that it's about the issues. If you've got highly polarized, if you've got an issue that's highly polarizing, um, that is difficult to draw, uh, to, to build compromise uh, around, then you're less likely to see, um, less likely to see success in negotiation. And as well as issues that are cross parties versus within parties. Third hypothesis is about the where. Uh, and so uh, as Jay Manbridge, Martin have argued in 2016 and others as well, uh, negotiations in, in the private sphere, away from the public eye, um, 
uh, are supposed to, and, and theoretically make sense, they increase the likelihood of success in negotiation. So uh, that's a third hypothesis that can be tested with this data. The fourth is about the calendar or when. Um, and here specifically, I'm looking at what Lee and Binder call the penalty defaults. So if there's, a, if there's a deadline, if we're approaching the end of the fiscal year, for example, that would increase the likelihood of success because the, because failure, the costs of failure are extremely high. And then finally, I have this why, um, which is about tactics and relationships. And the idea, and, and so here, um, what I'm interested in is testing whether or not trust among negotiators is important. Um, there's been a lot of literature on the importance of trust as a necessary precondition for the success of negotiations, both in Congress and outside of it. And so I wanna see whether or not this data can test that as well. And I should note that there, obviously you can have more than one of these uh, explain a particular successful case. It's not, uh, these are not mutually exclusive. So the data itself um, is basically uh, the sweep approach, which uh, David Mayhew um, pioneered and others have used as well. The idea is you're using, you're basically looking through a large segment of histories, a large number of histories, uh, journalistic accounts to try to find cases of uh, whatever it is you're looking for. And then hopefully some explanations as well, if they're available. So there's two kinds of sweeps that this project includes. One is uh, looking through major Congress related publications, um, primarily congressional quarterly, using keywords to find uh, descriptions of negotiations, compromises, um, you can have agreements, you can have uh, stalemates, et cetera, but basically trying to find journalistic accounts of negotiations over specific bills or policy matters. And that has turned up uh, 175 articles to date. Um, and so we're still finishing the coding process of this because it's a fair number of articles, but um, these, are, uh, these are articles that describe negotiations or potential negotiations uh, on legislation. The other source are books, articles, biographies, or autobiographies, uh, or histories that discuss the passage or failure of individual bills. Um, and there's a fair number of these. So far, uh, about 260, I think 259, 260, 200, I guess it's about 260 books, articles, and biographies and autobiographies have been reviewed. Um, the majority do not have uh, detailed descriptions or enough information about legislative negotiation to be included in the data set, um, but about 20% had at least one or more cases of legislative negotiation. Um, of particular note, I would say our reading lawmakers autobiographies. I think I talked about this in my talk last year, um, which is interesting, can be kind of tedious. Um, and I've actually sort of gleaned some interesting, um, at least I have some general thoughts about uh, how these can be useful, these, these memoirs. Um, but you do also see a fair amount of um, self-aggrandizement to be blunt. <laughs> um, and, and also just some weird, some weird memoirs that people write. Um, but I can talk about that question and answer if people are interested. Okay. So the unit of analysis uh, here is negotiation over one or more sets of issues. And um, the time period that I'm looking at here is between 1981 and 2010. So it's a 30-year period. Um, uh, now, I should note, it's possible that you can have multiple negotiations over a bill or proposal. And so uh, in this case, uh, the key for the data collection process is to separate those. So rather than saying this was a bill, there was a series of negotiations, and then it passed to say, well, OK, so for, you know, there was a negotiation within the party. Then there was a uh, negotiation at the subcommittee level. And then maybe there was private conversations that were going on and then negotiations in the uh, in conference, and those are all treated separately because they're all different stages of the legislative process and often have different negotiators. Uh, and as I mentioned before, failed negotiations doesn't necessarily mean that a bill or proposal is defeated. It usually does, but sometimes um, you can have a bill come to the floor anyway and still pass. It was just that the goal was to have maybe uh, either a bipartisan negotiation agreement or the majority party, like in the House, uses the rules such that they can still pass this bill and limit the ability of dissenters to defeat that uh, or amend that legislation. So each instance is negotiated, uh, excuse me, each instance of negotiation is coded along a number of different 
uh, variables. These are some of them. So the bill and proposal, who the participants are, what are the issues that are under contention? Was there a successful resolution? And then um, if any reasons were given by either the participants or the person writing the account, the journalist or the historian, for the success. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. I do want to note there are limitations to this data. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it is not a random sample. Um, we are trying, uh, my research assistants and I are trying to find as many cases as possible, uh, looking as broadly as possible. It is not a random selection of histories or journalistic accounts. Um, so what does that mean? Well, things that are less salient, negotiations over relatively minor issues, negotiations that are so private that no one other than the players know about it and no one's really talking about it, um, those are not likely to be captured in this suite, as well as conflicts that are so intractable that there's no negotiation to begin with. So a bill goes to a committee um, and the two sides are so split uh, then in the decision, you know, among the deciders that they just decide to let the bill die. Okay. Um, it's also, of course, contingent on how lawmakers and journalists choose to describe the event, the outcome, and the reasons for the outcome. So uh, one has to be cautious about folks who say this bill was going nowhere until I stepped in and resolved the, uh, resolved the conflict um, in the case of an autobiography, which happens sometimes, though not as much as you might think. So let me talk about the, the findings uh, a little bit here. And um, I will, again, preface this by saying that these are preliminary. We're still trying to gather uh, as much additional, as many additional cases as possible before we are, uh, before we're done. And in addition, um, um, there's still some analysis. I'm gonna present some preliminary analysis, but there's so many different ways to cut this data. I'm just gonna talk about a few of them. So uh, at this point, there are 189 individual cases of completed uh, negotiations and completed either successful or failed from 1981 to 2010. Of those, 134 are reported uh, as successful or were successful, so about 71%. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, just give you, just very quickly before I get to the aggregate data, um, an example of success from the data, the Energy and Water Appropriations uh, Act of 2003. This was one that was a, uh, some very serious contention that was actually uh, not with across parties, but within parties, but uh, across chambers. Um, and one of the issues was about uh, defending, about funding to develop nuclear weapons. And another was about how to store nuclear waste in the in Yucca Mountain. For those who aren't familiar, this has long been a debate over whether to put uh, nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain in Nevada. The House bill, this is again a Republican Congress, uh, gave more money for Yucca Mountain storage as the Bush White House wanted. But the Senate bill was taking the lead of Harry Reid and was uh, limiting uh, the ability to store uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain and had more funding for nuclear testing. To cut to the chase, you had um, uh, this famous, well, not famous, but it was certainly, um, they talk about it a lot, this negotiation that took place on the balcony of a Capitol leadership office between subcommittee chair David Hobson of Ohio, a uh, House member and Senator Pete Domenici of New Mexico. Um, and Domenici called it the hardest negotiation I've ever had. And they ended up finding a way to compromise on this issue. So you can see you've got um, some key players that are involved, subcommittee chairs. You also have a private setting. Uh, and of course, it's an issue where you can in theory find some middle ground because it is about, uh, in part about dollars. There are also failures, such as the Social Security spending issue in 1982. This was a big issue in the early 80s, how to shore up the Social Security Fund. And you had a, a gang of 17, one of many gangs that we have in Congress, um, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, President Reagan, trying to find some resolution to this. Um, but it fails. Uh, and it fails uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is a lack of trust. Another of them is that it's Social Security, which has become the has been turned into the third rail of politi of uh, American politics, uh, in part by Democrats, and they have very little incentive to try to, to look like they're going to cut Social Security, especially in an election year, which is another factor. Okay, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to, um, the remaining, I guess, five minutes or so that I have, I'm going to uh, talk about some of the aggregate results, some of the findings here, and the extent to which they can help test those hypotheses I discussed earlier. 
So one way to look at, for example, the first hypothesis, which is about the folks involved in negotiation, is to see whether or not there's a difference in the rate of success of negotiations where you have one of these key players involved versus when you do not. And we do see that uh, when presidents are involved or when party leaders are involved, the success rate of negotiations is larger. Now, it's not a statistically significant difference, but it is, uh, it is uh, in the case especially of uh, negotiations involving the president, uh, it is uh, sizable. And that would certainly suggest that party leaders or presidents are really important in helping negotiations succeed. Now, there's another way, though, to get at this question and at the other hypotheses, which is to look at how the players or the, uh, the, the journalists or the historians um, uh, attribute, to whom they attribute or to what they attribute the success of a negotiation. And I should say before I jump to that next slide, um, in the uh, chapter that I co-authored with David um, in, the, in the Rivals for Power book, um, where we're looking at, in that case, we're looking at president's role in particular, uh, we note that presidential success is contingent on some other things, like whether the negotiations are within a party or across parties, if it's within one chamber or across chambers. And so it's important to note with this, uh, in, in the case of who's involved, as well as some of these other hypotheses, that success may be contingent on things that, um, you know, it's not just whether they're involved or not, but on other factors that make them more likely to be successful in influencing the result of the negotiation or influencing whether the negotiation is successful. So if we look at accounts of success, um, the most common explanations for why negotiation is successful include White House participation, which is about 21% of the cases. Far more frequently though, it's congressional leaders, either party leaders or committee chairs or subcommittee chairs that are given the credit for success of negotiation. So the players or those who are giving the accounts of these are looking at leadership in Congress as being critical to the success of negotiation. Less common are explanations that are related to or map onto other hypotheses. So for example, only four cases of success do you see the privacy of the negotiations being attributed to or being given credit for a success. Also, um, either a deadline, a statutory deadline, for example, or being near the end of a Congress or close to election, those are not given very often as an explanation for success. And trust among negotiators is also a rare explanation for success. Now, I don't take these to be uh, definitive um, proof that these hypotheses are, or failure to prove these hypotheses, or, or at least the null hypothesis, right, that these three do not matter. So because, for example, it might be that these negotiations are in private, and that is not attributed specifically as a success, but because it's in private, there's an understanding that other things are that matter, like say the, the White House uh, participation or leadership, um, congressional leadership participation um, is, is more likely to succeed. So some of these, I, you know, I feel the, either this is not, this is sort of tentative or um, more digging is necessary to really see if a lack of privacy or if privacy doesn't really matter in these negotiations. Um, there are some other explanations that are common, I wanna note. One of them, which sort of falls partly into the why, but also perhaps into the differences between the players on policy, is the willingness to revise or drop legislative language. This is brought up very often, that one side or the other was willing to make a compromise. Now, of course, why are they willing to make that compromise? Could be for a number of reasons. But that fact that the players are pointing to the willingness to adjust is important, uh, their position and what the content of legislation is. Um, the high political cost of inaction is another common explanation, which to some degree is about deadline, but is actually, I think, a little bit different because it's usually about things like if, I, if we don't pursue this or if it doesn't succeed, uh, the voters will be mad. Um, or the other side, the other party is likely to take over one or more chambers of Congress or win the White House, and then they'll have an advantage. So it's a general sense that there are, um, there are costs associated with not acting on uh, particular legislation. It can also include other things like there's been a natural disaster, right? When we need to act, it's not a deadline per se, but failure to do so will look badly, will, will make us as, uh, as negotiators and our parties look bad and maybe even Congress look bad. And then also um, a number of cases look at entrepreneurs. So neither leaders nor the president, but individual members who are acting entrepreneurially to bring some agreement 
uh, in, a, in a negotiation. What are some uh, counts that um, for failed negotiations? Well, the most common explanations uh, are differences in ideology and policy. So that's the second hypothesis. I think most interesting is the number of times that the involvement of leaders or presidents is considered to be detrimental, that their participation actually led to failure of negotiation. And I think it's an important caveat that we have to remember that sometimes leaders are either not very good at negotiation or they're deliberately trying to torpedo those negotiations. Um, others include negoti negotiators who don't act in good faith, a refusal to compromise, or a large number of rank and file lawmakers who would oppose any negotiation at all. Um, finally, uh, just very quickly here, and then I'll be done, um, I wanted to point to a few other findings based on questions in part that people raised when I presented this elsewhere. Um, where negotiations are more likely, uh, where they take place, is there a relationship between that and success and failure? And what we see here, for example, is that in uh, conference committees, you see a larger rate of success, or at least a proportion of success, of a proportion of cases that are successful that are in conference is much higher than if it's an informal environment. So a negotiation in a private room or just among lawmakers informally, um, those are much more likely, uh, those you see a higher failure rate among those. Um, and I can talk more about why that might be in the question and answer. Um, have success rates changed over time? Um, not that much. Generally speaking, about 75 to 78% of cases are uh, successful regardless of the time period. Here I've broken it down by decade. And then uh, one question that was asked uh, last year uh, when I was presenting this preliminary research was whether leadership involvement has changed over time. And it's changed a little bit. Uh, the green is uh, yes and the red is no to the question if party leaders are involved. We do see in an earlier period leadership, uh, party leaders being less involved in negotiations than they have been since, which certainly would conform with our general understanding of how party leaders and leadership structures have become uh, more powerful, they have more resources, and are more deeply involved in the legislative process. So uh, to conclude, uh, preliminarily, uh, we have, based on the data that's been collected, uh, participation in leaders, the flexibility in the language in bills, and high cost of inaction lend themselves, it appears, to greater likelihood of success, broad ideological differences, um, I also said, yeah, leadership participation itself can also contribute to the failure of negotiations. Um, there are still some data that we're collecting. Um, there's a lot more things that can be done with this data that we've just started doing and hopefully can look at some individual cases as well. And I'll stop there. Thanks. All right, great. I just wanted to call your attention to um, some comments that were in the, the chat as you were talking, uh, several of them uh, from Jenny Mansbridge and, and Valeria chimed in uh, as well. So you might want to perhaps start with, with those and, and then you could move on to, to Sarah and, and go from there. Sure, be happy to. And first I'll start with David and my red wall. Yes, this is my red room. <laughs> this is where I've been doing, I started doing Zoom calls back during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to uh, the uh, Jay Mansbridge's uh, question. So one of the things that I haven't had a chance to do is to break down the data by the source. Um, but I think that's a really important question because um, the, I mean, certainly in terms of the number of auto, percentage of autobiographies that mention negotiation at all is relatively low. But I also want to see whether or not um, you have, uh, uh, there's, there's, um, there's a relationship between the reasons given for a result and the source of that result. So to the point I made earlier, you might have lawmakers saying a lot more, talking a lot more about um, either leadership or about themselves as entrepreneurs when it's an autobiography. But if it's a journalistic account, they might be looking more at leadership or at presidents, for example. So I haven't looked at that data yet, I, 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 but I think there is a possibility, right, of a pattern there, and that's important particularly for the ability to kind of use this to test other hypotheses. Um, on the Yucca Mountain negotiation, right? So you ask, was it all compromise or middle ground or integrative uh, negotiation? I'll have to go back and look in detail at that. There was the money side of it. Um, there was certainly compromise, but I think on the Yucca Mountain, there had to be, uh, it, was a, it was a lot more complicated because uh, as you probably know, Harry Reid on principle opposed having any nuclear waste in Nevada. 
Um, so those kinds of things uh, were, I think, made it especially difficult. And I can't remember exactly how that was um, that that particular issue was resolved in a way that was perhaps something like more integrative, as you mentioned. Um, but that certainly is something that I think does come up in these cases. Um, it might be worth then, some some other researcher or you in a different era um, uh, going into that particular case, um, particularly because. It was described. You described it, and I'm sure it was described in the in the work that you read as compromise and middle ground, because that's the that's the language that everybody has. They don't have the language of integrative negotiation. They don't have the concept of it. Um, negotiator, good negotiators do, but the ordinary public does not, and then the ordinary legislator does not doesn't have it. They might do it, but they don't have the the concept of it. So it wouldn't wouldn't be reported. Um, but it'd be fun for some graduate student of yours or something to actually sort of go back and, and interview people and try to find out what actually went on in that negotiation. Just a thought. Yeah, it's a great idea. Unfortunately, I think Pete Domenici is no longer with us, but I'm sure that his staff would be around. Hobson, I think, is still around. Um, that was, and I should note, originally with this project, it was also going to involve some real deep digging into archives to look at specific cases. Um, but as you, as you heard, just uh, so with the previous project, the pandemic hit, all the archives closed. So we kind of had to modify our, our uh, you know, our research plan. Um, and then yeah, uh, Valeria notes about integrative negotiation. Um, yes, and fighting the good fight. And that's that's very important as well. So I'm glad that you, you raised that. So David, do I call on people? Do you call on people? You're muted. Well, Sarah's not. She she looks like she's raring to go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, uh, excellent. Thank you, um, uh, Matt. This is a great project. Um, I'm very excited someone is doing it. I'm very excited that you're doing it. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I had two questions. One, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about the unit of analysis. And I, I'm still a little unclear what exactly counts as this. So I'm looking at the, your keywords for searching compromise negotiation. I'm just trying to understand what exactly is captured by that. And in part, I ask because you said that there are some conflicts that you say are so intractable that they don't make it to the negotiation stage and you don't count those. So I guess I'm like, in part curious whether there's some selection process that's going on between the conflict and negotiation, and if so, what that selection process is. And that might be fine, um, but I'm, I just I would like to get a better handle on what's, what exactly is captured by those 189 cases. Um, and then the sure. second question, I guess, is just a descriptive one. You showed the overtime uh, by the decade buckets on, I guess, um, success rates and uh, leader involvement. But I, I'm curious, just like the raw number. So you have uh, almost 200 cases, 30 years, so six-ish issues a year. Is that steady uh, across time? I mean, granted, six is small, so it's each year, so it's hard to tell, but um, are there what does the distribution look like for the um, for those cases? Sure. Let me take the second. I'm just trying to right now. I'm looking at my uh, spreadsheet season here. If I have that data, or did I replace it with another table? Um, the I, I want to say I don't have the exact numbers offhand, but I want to say that you had probably the largest number in the kind of the the first and and to some degree, the second bucket. So particularly in the 80s, 1980s and 1990s, um, fewer in the early 2000s. And that's in part because there are simply fewer histories written and fewer autobiographies written of lawmakers then. Um, that's also why I stopped at 2010, because from 2010 on, you know, we just finished the decade, there's still stuff coming out about Trump, right? Still stuff coming out about immigration and, and so forth. So um, you had a larger number of those earlier cases than in the later ones, uh, later buckets, if you will. Um, to your first question about what's exactly being captured. So I will say those keywords, the idea was to try to have a fairly broad way of capturing what could be a, a potential negotiation. I didn't want to just use the word negotiation. 
um, because it might bias against, um, you know, conversations that are happening or discussions or what have you. So one of the, you know, one of the problems, of course, is when you use the word conflict, you get all kinds of random stories. <laughs> they have nothing to do with negotiation at all. There's a personal conflict between Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi. You know, staff don't talk to each other. Um, so the idea then was to look for um, an actual, uh, so basically what's being captured in each of those is as I said, it's one or more players who are having some kind of, you know, negotiation or there's some sort of dispute they have to discuss over one or more policy matters. Um, and it could be, and it usually is a particular bill. Um, sometimes it is about an aspect of a bill. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, a more general before even a bill is introduced sometimes. You know, how are we going to solve this particular problem or issue? Um, and then, uh, you know, and so, so I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's kind of the, the way that the, you know, the terms are gathering all kinds of things. And then um, the idea is to find those specific kinds of cases. And I should also note that oftentimes we have the opposite problem where we would have, usually it was a biography or an autobiography where the member of Congress would say, there was, uh, you know, I really want to get this bill passed. Um, the other side disagreed. They thought it was a bad bill or they wanted this. And then we reached an agreement. Like, can you tell me anything more? I mean, this is just, there's nothing to work with here. And those, uh, you know, I, I, you know, technically it was a negotiation. So it went in the database, but it's not included here because there's just no information. Um, and so that vagueness was frustrating at times, but, um, the, you know, that that was kind of part of the the perils of this project is you get a lot of a good number of things like that. Um, that's I, I feel your coding pain. I mean, I, I guess the question is whether there is an even more select group of issues that make it to negotiation, right? That maybe pairing it back even further might be helpful, even just to do another pass through and I'd like thinking of the difference between so if you're quoting recent congresses on immigration I assume immigration would be a conflict that's intractable and it's actually not at negotiation stage except for the year when it eventually like 2018 when it actually came to the floor but is, is that but but we know that's is, is, am I thinking about what you're trying to capture correctly that because immigration let's say in this congress we don't seem to well, I, I take it back, right? It was discussed about whether they could get it into reconciliation and so forth. Like, is that negotiation or is this just, as you sort of suggested, kind of roughly conflict over an issue that's actually not subject to sitting down and negotiating? Well, if there's a negotiation over a bill and one of the issues that's being negotiated is, for example, whether to include immigration reform, then that would be included in the case. If it's though someone telling leadership, I want you to put it in the bill, and leadership's like that's not going to happen and there's no there's no real conversation or there's a report that said you know say there's a news report that says a number of lawmakers really wish this was in the bill but they're not in the negotiation process they're not they're not you know it's just something they would like and it's not really considered seriously um then it would not you know be considered because lawmakers want all kinds of things in bills right um you can also have reports or news accounts that say you know there's a group of lawmakers that really feel now's the time to do immigration reform and then that's it, right? They introduce a bill, they have a press conference, but it doesn't, there's no actual sitting down with players and saying, this is gonna go in this or can it go in this? Then, you know, those would not be counted because it's not two or more players having a conversation about a specific policy or proposal or bill in which that is on the agenda. And that also does mean, just one more thing I'll say on that, that of course there are things that get left off right away and it's possible they never really get recognition because maybe there is a negotiation and someone says, well, how about immigration reform? And everyone says, no, that'll kill the bill. And then that's it. it's never really talked about again. Um, so those aren't, aren't, aren't likely to be captured, right? Because it just happens so quickly and it's just vetoed right off the bat. So that's another way that there's a limitation of this data is that some things just, they get thrown out there, it's a trial balloon, pop the balloon, uh, and no one gives it a, a second thought. Yeah. Um, excellent. I mean, I think it's a hard problem, but I think it's important to, as you're doing to try to figure out like what exactly counts. And it may be that some sort of salience filter here 
if you're looking for ways to, to uh, slice the data so that you're only picking up the ones where there are more than two in a room so you're not faced with the difficulty of the two guys in the in the autobiography like maybe that's maybe that's outside the the scope of what you want to explain perhaps but good point. Um, it's great i look forward to uh watching it come along thanks sarah i you can do this yourself matt but uh i think valeria was next and then laurel and, and there's some more in the chat too so we should probably try to to zoom through them we've got a little bit of time because we're heading into a break but Go ahead. Okay, oh. uh, Valeria. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. This is um, really exciting. And I think I'm gonna take a, a slightly different tack from Sarah, even though I think her questions were were um, um, important and and um, useful in, in directing kind of what is the scope of this? What is this really? What is not negotiation, right? <laughs> um, you know, what don't what don't we want to count? But I'm actually going to ask you to to be thoughtful about what what actually counts. Um, and so, um, one of the things that to me comes up when we're studying like landmark legislation or or these big ideas and and um, and uh, lawmaking um, is that oftentimes we we. I think we overlook questions of race and gender, um, ethnicity. Um, and this might not be for your current project, but it should certainly, I think, be relevant as we move forward is um, what, um, what kinds of negotiations will we capture? What will matter? Um, and, and what about those big issues that matter to certain groups? So you can think about in landmark legislation, we're always going to see the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, but we're probably not going to see passage of the King Bill, right? But for Black populations, that is a very, well, for the entire nation, perhaps for the world, right? But at least for this particular group, it is a major feat perhaps in those negotiation, I don't even know if we could even call it negotiation, right? It was a it was a battle, it was a fight. There was certainly some negotiation. I don't know if it would come up in, I don't know whose um, biography it might come up in or, or where you might come across it. Like, and, and maybe it's already in your data set or Lily Ledbetter, right? That, that piece of legislation. Um, and what's interesting to me about something like the King Bill is for a long time, like it had plenty of co-sponsors at lots of interest, but when it passed, you're not gonna see the co-sponsors, right? Like you're not, in that particular moment when it passes, nothing is suggesting that it will, at least not publicly. Um, in any case, I just wanted to, to put that out there. Hopefully somebody does it um, and follows up on this in that way. Um, good project. Thanks, Valeria. I just wanna say something on that because that's a really good point. One of the things I've uh, I found really advantageous about looking at memoirs is that um, you know memoirs by um, by women in Congress, um, by you know folks with different uh, ethnicity, they they talk about things, they talk about different things, and they prioritize different things. And I don't know if I have enough of those to really get leverage on that, but you know folks like you know Clyburn's autobiography, Luis Gutierrez's autobiography, the things they're talking about is different than what their peers. Uh, who are white, uh, who are, you know, uh, other backgrounds are talking about. And um, I, I just think it's inherently interesting, um, but I also think it's a way in which um, this approach can capture things that wouldn't otherwise be captured by other individuals, by other narrators. Hey, Matt, one more thing, I think, um, and, and this, is, this is really small, so thank you for saying that though. Um, I wonder if there's a difference between trust and credibility, right? So you don't have to trust somebody well, maybe there's not, but it seems to me that you can think, okay, they're credible in this particular instance. I don't trust them more generally, right? But they're going to be credible in this particular negotiation. And I just wondered about that. Um, I don't know how you would measure it or know it, um, but I, I wondered if maybe some other ideas around that signal trust might actually come up that might not be specific. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I'll think about that. Uh, Laurel? So thanks again, uh, really interesting project. Um, I guess the question that I have, um, I guess builds on these questions about kind of pushing you to think about kind of the, the cases and what's included, but it goes back to something that you said during the talk, which was that you acknowledge that it's not a random sample. And so I'm trying to figure out kind of 
what we can and can't take from the sample in terms of the hypothesis tests that you want to look at. So I guess the first thing is that based on kind of how you searched for the cases, it seems like there's a good chance that you might be identifying more successful negotiations than unsuccessful negotiations because the kind of types of search terms you talked about, the fact that when legislators are writing biographies or autobiographies, they may be more inclined to talk about the things that they're proud of and their accomplishments than, you know, the disasters. Um, so, you know, I guess I, I struggle a little bit then with figuring out with the hypotheses, how much weight I want to put on kind of the factors that indicate successes versus failures when I'm not convinced yet that the overall sample is representative of those two bodies kind of equally well. So then I was thinking, you know, are we are we better off taking the 70% of the cases that are successes and looking at kind of those as, you know, can you can you say those are representative of the successes and then look at, you know, the factors that are associated with them or something. Um, but yeah, so I guess the question is really just kind of getting you to say a little bit more about or um you know, the nature of the sample and how much we, how, where you think we can engage in hypothesis testing given the nature of the sample? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's a couple of ways that you actually already kind of hinted at. One is, or mentioned, one is to say, given that, right, a case is successful mentioned in this source, what are the most common explanations? So it would be less a sort of, in any neutral environment, what will make a legislative um, negotiation successful or not would be given there's been a success that's been reported, what are the most common explanations? So that's a more limited kind of finding and it's not as, as ideal as being able to do broad hypothesis testing, but it might be uh, a, a, a better methodological approach given the data. Um, you know, the other would be, it's like, you know, I think you were, you were mentioning or hinting at was to sort of compare it with something that is random or something that is a broad universe to see if it's a representative sample. I'm not sure how I would do that. I'd have to think about that a little bit. Um, but if we're finding that, you know, legislative negotiations are about successful 70% of the time and some other way of capturing them, um, then one might feel a little more confident about this sample. But I, but I, but it's important. I'm still thinking about this. I'm glad that you raised it because I don't want to, I don't want to overstate what we can and can't do with this data. Um, I think it's useful. I think there's a lot we can get out of it, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put so much weight on it that it ends up kind of breaking. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up. So we have a, a little bit of slack in our in our schedule, which is why I've I've let this go uh, a little bit long, but but not too much. So I you know, I, I I feel like maybe we could uh, have a whole one day conference just on Matt's project. Um, but uh, but we will go ahead and stop in, in just a second. There are a few other um, comments in the the chat, Matt. That maybe if you get a chance during a, a break or something, that you could respond to there. Um, but otherwise, I, I did want to give Bettina uh, an opportunity just to offer a comment on, on integrative negotiation before we go to break. Thank you, David. And this will be quick. But um, I did think because, you know, Jenny had started it at the beginning and had also brought up the question of integrative negotiation as something uh, to study more closely since the concept of compromise doesn't capture some of the trade offs that get made in an integrative negotiation. But the thing I was gonna suggest, and I know you're aware of this, but wanted to offer uh, to think about is that projects like Yucca Mountain and uh, others that have a long and complex history, there are cohorts of people that are pretty deeply familiar with the issues at the different stages and what may have been traded one for another and how they reach certain milestones. So. In terms of resources, and I recognize in the way that you're doing the research, you're getting a lot of terrific information uh, and coding information, but in terms of filling in some of those blanks and gaps that might help you, it even might help you think of new terms that you wanna search for. Um, it's probably useful to even tap into some of the uh, senior wedge staff that we have in our program who've lived with this issue for such a long time or know people that have that might be able to help you uh, dig a little deeper, particularly in a case like Yucca Mountain. That would be great. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you, Bettina. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, like I said, uh, we're on a break now. Uh, make sure you, you come back uh, a couple minutes before uh, 
11 so that uh, Jim and Jason uh, can start their presentation. All right, thanks.
Jason, do you know if you're already able to share your screen or not? Let me check. Okay. Are you the one who's starting? Yes. Okay. Seems like I can. You can, yes. All right, great. Phew, because I'm not actually, I wasn't going to be sure how to allow you to if, if you couldn't. So um, great, great news. We got like two minutes. Thanks for being uh, the only one, I think, who, who knew my Lane Kiffin reference, by the way. <laughs> I watch college football, David. I'm offended. What is this? Did, were you familiar with that particular reference? Not that particular reference but i know who kiffin is it's amazing he still has a job but i guess if you're good at it in college football you can be redeemed <laughs> hey he uh is not the most likable guy but he he seems to be pretty good at, at that job yeah, that, that's a, there's a trend in football with that right yeah, it's <laughs> urban meyer but let's not go down that road <laughs> yeah no kidding no oh kidding. man chris that's not fair Lane, lane's no no urban meyer <laughs> that, that's i don't think anyone is chase oh <laughs> uh, I think football in general might not attract the nicest uh, fellows. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, okay, everybody, it's um, essentially 11 o'clock. So if you um, are not back yet, um, you know, come on back. I guess if you weren't back, you wouldn't hear me say that. Um, but whatever, uh, we're going to go ahead and allow uh, Jim Curry and, and Jason Roberts to, to begin their presentation now on interpersonal relationships and legislative action in Congress. Jason's going to start things off, so take it away, Jason. Morning, everyone. Let's see if I can. All right. Everybody see it's okay? Well, scream if you can. Uh, well, thanks for spending your, your morning with us. This is... Uh, oh. Uh, as, as David said, Joe and I are working on a project on interpersonal relationships in Congress. And our big question is, do interpersonal relationships between members have any effect on, on legislative action on Capitol Hill? Um, we explore that and in, in we'll talk about a couple of things today. One is the collaboration between members of Congress in terms of original bill co-sponsorships. We'll present some data on collaboration within committees, but in particular on how relationships between chairs and ranking members of committees affect committee output. And we really hope to get some input from, from those of you who are here today um, on the future directions for our project. We are at a bit of a crossroads on where we want to go next. Uh, so some background to our project. Uh, if you If you read most of the congressional scholarship on how what explains legislative outcomes? You see a, a big role for parties, perhaps ideology and constituency uh, effects to play a big role into why members behave they do and what kind of legislative outputs we may see. Uh, and so that literature doesn't have a lot of a lot of place for interpersonal relationships, but we think there are good reasons to expect relationships to matter. Um, insider accounts are perhaps the, the biggest reason we expect this. Uh, and almost, you know, as, as Matt's presentation pointed out, people are quick to point to relationships when they're talking about negotiations. Uh, I mean, in the, in the current Congress, I think uh, we, we've all been regaled with stories in the press about things that have gone on on, on Joe Manchin's boat and how important uh, boat diplomacy has been to getting things done in the current Congress. There's also some research on psychology and, and workplace relationships. And I, I think those of us who've been in, in the academy long enough know that there are Perhaps some of our colleagues we enjoy working with more than others and have better relationships with. And then there is an existing uh, literature on norms and networks in Congress that would suggest that uh, relationships could play a role in outcomes. And so our, our three goals here then would be to understand how relationships uh, with mem between members form, uh, where in the legislative process we might expect to see the effect of relationships if it does have an effect on legislative outputs. And then I think the, the most challenging part of this is going to be to we're, we're trying to find a way to systematically measure and assess the role of relationships in the legislative process. You know, in that way, we have a lot of the same problems that, that Matt was just discussing. And, you know, how do we define what, what the effects are? What is the set of cases? What's a success? What's a failure? These are all the kinds of things that we are also wrestling with. And so we're, we're hoping to get some 
some feedback from, from you all on that. Uh, so our approach to this is, is a mixed methods approach. Um, we began with some semi-structured exploratory interviews. Uh, to date, we've done about 21 of those interviews. Uh, again, like Matt and others have said, COVID interrupted our, our best laid plans. We had intentions of doing many more interviews than we have done at this point. Uh, but with, with Congress shutting down for COVID, it was very difficult to do that. We, we did a couple of Zoom interviews. We found that those were both more difficult to schedule, ironically, and uh, just less helpful overall. Uh, but we, we did get 21 interviews in. They were about an hour each uh, with high-level staffers. Our sample, I think, skews about two-thirds Republican at this point. And we asked them you know, to, to help us understand how legislative actors understand relationships and relationship building. And we really tried to get our interviews to help us understand what the indicators of relationships were and, and where we could look to, to see evidence of this without interviewing every single person who, who works in Congress. Based on those interviews, we, we were able to develop a, a few hypotheses and indicators that are that we, we could use for quantitative analysis. So we have some analyses of how official CODEL travel uh, between members of Congress, how that affects legislative collaboration. Uh, that piece we were able to get accepted into LSQ a while back. And then our more, more recently, we've done some work on how uh, committee effectiveness, uh, we, we used a, a measure developed by a UNC graduate student, Emily Amundsen, uh, to get a, uh, try to get a handle on how the relationships between chairs and ranking members on House committee might affect committee output. So I'll, I'll talk through all of these things briefly. Uh, just to summarize what we found from our interviews, the, we, we got complete agreement from all of our sources that relationships matter a great deal in lawmaking. Uh, they also universally agreed that travel was the most important source of relationship building in Congress, in particular the overseas CODELs that members go on. Um, we, it, tons of evidence on that. Uh, this matters because relationships build trust between individuals. Again, this, this builds on what Matt was just discussing. And this makes members much more likely to want to work with people that they trust and, and they have overlapping interest with. Uh, so, uh, you know, a few fun quotes from, from, our, from our interviews. Travel is the best thing you can do to build relationships. You know, why would that matter? Um, people say it's because the travel is intense. You spend time together all day long. They're small groups. You're, you're forced to interact with each other. Uh, Many people mentioned that there's no press around, uh, no one's tweeting the trips. Uh, and so with, without the pressure of being in DC, members can, can be more open with one another and be more candid about how they want to, how they could potentially work together. Uh, and so, you know, why does this trust matter so much? Uh, you know, this, this person saying, you know, the, the two members that, that this, this interview was referring to said they were implacable opposites on most issues but they trusted each other on this one particular issue so they could work together. Uh, trust helps with communication. I think this is very important when you're, when you're talking about negotiating positions. This person says he and I could trust each other and be candid with each other. We were able to speak frankly about how each side sees the issue. We can say there's a problem with X, Y, and Z. We can't move on where our limits are and explore what's possible. And several people remarked to us that, that this ability to talk about where you might be able to give on an issue without it leaking out to the press or, or being on Twitter was, was a very important process. This is actually not a quote from an interview. This was from a, a recent story in Politico, or not a recent story, I think it was last fall, uh, discussing the, the collaboration between Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina, and Chris Murphy on, on gun control. And Tillis actually talks about Codell's as a, as a part of this and travel. And, and the article mentions that Murphy and Tillis didn't know each other at all until they traveled together. And, and Tillis says, we're working 12 and 14 hour days. We travel two or three hours from country to country. And it just gets you in a position where you can build that trust and you build that familiarity. And that serves as a basis for getting accomplished what we did. So uh, consistent relationship on that. Um, and so that led us to then uh, our first quantitative indicator we want to talk about, which is uh, bipartisan original co-sponsorships and travel. So we're, we're relying on, on two, in some ways, indirect indicators here. So consistently, people tell us that, that travel is where you get relationships built from. And then when we ask, you know, where, where are you going to see the effect of these relationships in the process? They say it's going to be on, on bipartisan and on original co-sponsorships. People talk to us a lot about how important it is to have a, the people who work together on, who are original co-sponsors are the people who have typically 
collaborated together on a bill. And so this, this person sums this up nicely, it says the stupidest thing you can do up here in our committee is introduce a partisan bill. This is a committee that almost all of its legislation comes to the floor uh, through suspension. So he's saying, you know, basically, you know, here's our bill, don't get on it. You know, you could do that if it's a messaging bill, but if you, you're going to have to have a Democratic co-sponsor, if you're going to have to have a chance to be successful in a committee that's relying primarily on, on suspension of the rules to get a bill to the floor. Uh, in terms of a committee effectiveness, uh, we had a lot of people tell us that where we would, would see the effect of relationships is between is, is in the relationship between chairs and ranking members of committees. We got regaled with lots of stories about horrible relationships between chairs and ranking members, about people who didn't speak to one another, and, and then how much a difference that makes when those people do work together. So here's, here's two quotes on that. The previous chair and ranking member had a great relationship that affected how the committee worked. The chair wanted the ranking member to be receptive before they would try to move a bill. He says, comparatively, I don't think the new chair and ranking member has have as good of a working relationship. Um, again, this was this is one where where people tell us this is going to be important, and it's it's been difficult to come up with a with a great quantitative indicator. Uh, when we we push people on this, we would get some some feedback like, well, you know, the committee hearings will be of a different tone, and there'll be you know just not as much fighting in the hearings. And that's that's a much more difficult concept to, to operationalize. So we'll, we'll talk about what we did and perhaps some of you will have ideas of how we can improve upon that. So in the in the first analysis we're, we're doing, this is uh, about how travel between members affects collaboration. We have uh, two quantitative analysis on this point. The first is just a simple member level analysis that asked the question is, do members who travel more in a Congress introduce a larger proportion of legislation with bipartisan co-sponsors? So this is a, a broader measure. It's simply, if you're, if you're traveling more, are you collaborating more with people from the other party? And then a, a little more of a, a focus test of this is we, we focus on the individual dyads who are serving together and, and do, the, do these pairs of members who travel together. So if I've traveled with Jim, do Jim and I in particular are we much more likely to collaborate uh, together? Um, so we we have the percentage of bills that are that are bipartisan co-sponsors, with one or more bipartisan co-sponsors. Uh, our key independent variables are the the number of codels that members have gone on, either in total or together, and the number of days traveled on these on these codels. We also have a, a number of control variables: seniority, party. Uh, electoral circumstances, and and we have member in Congress fixed effects. Uh, I won't bore you with with tables. So we have a we also did a matching analysis to, for for this to make sure we were to try to make sure we were comparing similar kinds of members on this. And so this is simply a, the dependent variable on, the, on these figures is simply the uh, proportion of bills that a member introduces that has a bipartisan co-sponsor. Uh, and both for the match and unmatch analysis, we do see a positive relationship between the number of trips a member has taken and the propensity to find bipartisan co-sponsors for their uh, legislative initiatives. When we turn to the to the dyadic pairs analysis, so this is, you know, did these people travel together? The number of times they traveled together uh, and, and then did that affect the number of bills they sponsor together? Um, for all pairs, we find a, a fairly strong effect there, and we, we do a, a more modest but still significant effect for bipartisan pairs of members traveling together. So it, it does seem to be the case that members who travel, uh, especially who travel with people of the opposite party, are much more likely to work together with, the, with members of the opposite party when it comes time to, to sponsor legislation. Uh, in terms of committees, we are, we're asking the question, is that are House committees that are led by chairs and ranking members who have previous relationships more productive than those that lack relationships. And as I mentioned, this is a much more difficult um, empirical puzzle to get at. In many cases, by the time these people are becoming chairs and ranking members, any relationship that they had is probably many, many Congresses and moving backwards. And so, you know, both for from an, an empirical, from, from a theoretical point of view, I don't know what the lag structure should be, for chairs and ranking members and how far back you'd want to measure their relationship. And then even if we had a, a model we could write down on this, it's, it, it would be almost difficult to, it'd be very difficult to estimate that empirically. But we did, um, as, I, as I mentioned, take advantage of the committee's legislative effectiveness scores. This is again, developed by a, a UNC graduate student, Emily 
Amundsen, and it works a lot like the, the Volden and Wiseman legislative effectiveness score starts with the, with the bills referred to committees and then measures the output of these committees uh, from there. And so we have these data from the 103rd to 116th Congress is, uh, again, we, we try to measure this by the number of, of CODEL trips that the chairs and ranking members have taken together before they became chair and ranking member. We also explored this a little more deeply with the travel network within committees. So, you know, we, we measured the density of the travel of the members of each committee. And we also have a measure of the number of, of bills that the chairs and ranking members had originally co-sponsored together uh, before they became, before they took the chair and ranking member role. And again, a, a number of controls similar to what we had in, in our previous uh, models. Uh, to sum that up, I don't have any pretty figures for that just now, but there's there's really no evidence that we can find that chair ranking member travel in the previous Congress affects committee effectiveness. Uh, as I mentioned, this could be that there's some sort of long lag structure here that we simply can't pick up with the data we have. Um, we don't find any evidence that the travel density of a committee, so how much more the committee travels as a group or, or together, has any effect on that committee's effectiveness score. But we do find, similar to our earlier analysis, that previous collaborations between the chair and ranking member is positively related to committee effectiveness. So if you want to say that the, the previous collaborations is an indicator of a, of a relationship between those two, then we do find some support for the idea uh, that chairs and ranking members who have a good working relationship do have a more smoother operating committee in terms of, of committee outputs. Uh, so to sum that up, our, our, our interviews universally agree that interpersonal relationships are a very important factor in, in fostering the legislative collaboration. Uh, travel is the, perhaps the best indicator of relationship building. And we do find uh, fairly solid evidence in our, in our individual level work, especially that the link that there's a strong link between travel and collaboration between members. Uh, there's some evidence that that chairs and ranking member collaborations also foster committee success. And so that's that's sort of where we are to date. Um, moving forward, some questions we are we are interested in exploring uh, are does a member's identity characteristics, such as age, race, gender, affect their ability to travel and build relationships? I think those of us with with small children can all attest to the difficulty of of work travel when you when you have small children at home, and so does that limit? the ability of certain kinds of members to develop the kind of relationships that foster legislative collaborations. Um, much like the rest of us, we wonder how COVID interrupted relationship formation in Congress. Um, while the rest of us were sitting at home, Congress was as well. There were, there were not as many CODELs uh, in the, since COVID has hit. So we do wanna look into that. I mentioned we are at a bit of a crossroads roads in the project. One thing we are, are trying to consider is whether it's worth our time to try to go do more interviews now. Uh, Jim has recently been able to do some interviews for another project, so it does seem it's possible now to get back into office buildings and, and talk to people if we want to go that route. Uh, we'd have to th we want to think more clearly about what else we want to learn from interviews, but we are certainly open to doing that. And then we we do have a lot of things that people mention to us in interviews that people would would tell us stories about particular bill episodes, both on the positive and negative side. You know, we have lots of notes that say, you know, this bill happened because these people worked together because they had a good relationship. And this thing here did not happen, not because, you know, there was not overall agreement, but because these people just couldn't stand each other. So they would not work together. And I think we would we'd like to explore some of those things, but uh, we, we have a lot of the selection and coding issues that that Matt and Sarah were talking about in the in the previous presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and hopefully well, we want to thank you all. Thank uh, David and the center and everyone for funding. And we're going to stop there and, and take your feedback and questions. You can take your own questions, Jason. I assume you see Laurel and Steven there and Jason. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Laurel. So thanks for sharing this work. Um, again, a really another interesting project and exciting to see uh, where you're going with it, both in the kind of the, the two different directions of thinking about uh, ways of looking at this relationship. Um, it's just a, a small thought that I had in terms of trying to think if there's a way to actually leverage COVID as a as a positive instead of a negative. Um, it kind of something I was thinking about in terms of the point you made in the last slide. 
And I'm not exactly sure what the right comparison Congress would be, but I was trying to think, you know, if your intuition is right that COVID disrupted the kind of travel patterns and the types of um, interactions that build these relationships among members, could you do something that compared freshman members arriving during the COVID pandemic to freshman classes in previous Congresses and kind of trying to look at whether again, I, what the outcome is, is a little un, unclear. I know that's been part of the problem throughout it, you know, whether it's the bipartisan co-sponsors or whether it's um, some other measure of how they're interacting, kind of building relationships. Um, it could be a nice kind of natural variation there uh, to be able to take advantage of. Yeah, thanks, Laurel. That's a really good idea um, as a nice, clean way that potentially we can get out. Like, is that class different? And is that class affected by COVID? Because that, that would be, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Steve Smith, I have you next on my on my screen anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a fabulous project, and I, you know your first results here uh, about the Codell effect uh, is um, uh, is enticing. It's consistent with the frequent recommendation that if members only spent more time with each other, uh, that uh, they'd find it easier to work with each other. Uh, Codells, of course, are reasonably common, but um, are far from the only way in which members can interact with each other uh, out of the workplace. And so, uh, you know, Jason was suggesting more interviews, but I wonder whether you should do a systematic survey, maybe with chiefs of staff, uh, just to get a better feel for how much time legislators spend with each other outside of the workplace, and especially with um, opposite party uh, colleagues, um, uh, just to get a better handle on this frequent recommendation that they that members engage in retreats, uh, stay in DC over more weekends, and do all those sorts of things, you know that that um, uh, are just so frequently uh, a part of everyday recommendations. Um, any thoughts about that? I, I think that'd be great if we could do something like that. I mean, as you know, there is a lot of variation in who does and doesn't ever stay in Washington over the weekend or beyond like the minimum amount of time. Having some data on that would be really, really useful. Um, I don't know how successful we'd be at like a survey of chiefs of staff, but um, if we could do it, that would be, I think, really helpful. What do you think, Jason? I agree. I do wonder how much variance there's going to be there, but or, uh, beyond Codell's, but so there, you know, maybe maybe some others here can get at this, but a lot of people told us that somehow there was something special about travel that was different than other time together. Uh, that the overseas travel takes the pressure off things in ways that uh, if you tried to force a bipartisan happy hour or something, it may not work as well. I don't know the answer to that, but um, you know, we did it's like us going to a conference in town. We don't like it. We we want to go out of town. Uh, right. Then we can get spend some time, real time, with our friends. Uh, that's the case, but that's why things like retreats and other things are suggested that maybe the world of legislators changed so much they just can't spend weekends in DC. They can't spend time with colleagues. Um, but I wonder if there's not, not some way to get a grip on the effect of these other forms of social connection that members could have, at least in principle. Just a thought. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah. Um, great. Uh, thanks. This is, uh, uh, I'm glad to hear about the LSQ piece, which I look forward to reading. And uh, that may be where you answer my question. And you may have answered it while I uh, tuned out briefly during, with apologies um, in the middle of your presentation. However, I do have a question and then one comment um, or suggestion. So do we know who goes on the Codells? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about selection problems here about, right, if you go on Codell, are you more likely to in terms of your sponsor your co-sponsor behavior. Um, is there analysis as well about who's more likely to go on the Codells in the first place? And I guess the parallel question is, do we have any over, well, in my magic list of things I'd like to have, is there, there Codell uh, data over time? I, I kind of missed um, the time period that you had here. Um, um, and then I have one suggestion when you're, well, I'll just add my suggestion on uh, while I'm piling them on. Um, in terms of uh, what we were just talking about with Steve and uh, ways of getting at these um, venues and conformity and so forth, um, I don't know if you've spoken to Dan Lipinski um, as someone who's just 
on the outs of his party. And as he's often said, um, uh, people weren't happy with his fraternizing across the aisle. But I wonder whether you might glean something from him about other ways to think about um, venues for looking at these sorts of uh, interactions. Yeah, uh, that's Sarah, thank you. That's a great idea. Um, I talked to Dan really early on when we were starting this, but I should talk to him again now that we've developed it more and get his thoughts. Um, he would definitely have some interesting, um, an interesting perspective on this that, may, that might be unique, but may also be very interesting, really useful in that sense. Um, to your question about like, if we've looked into who travels, we haven't spent a lot of time looking into specifically who does and doesn't travel. In the paper, we have some discussion of like the degree to which members are allowed to be engaged in this process versus not like who's invited. Um, in the paper, we try to present it, in the LSQ paper, we try to present it as not us trying to nail down sort of like a specific effect of travel on everything else, but travel is a broader indicator of who is more or less likely to uh, be interested in engaging in relationship building in the first place. And then, you know, among pairs of members of Congress, who is more or less likely to, like, as, as dyadic pairs, be interested in engaging in relationship building. Because you're right, like, there are certain members who are more inclined to travel. There are certain members who are more likely to get invited to travel. And we have some, some quotes and some other um, insight from the qualitative component on uh, the committee leaders saying there's certain people they try to leave out of the CODELs because they don't want them around to sort of spoil things. Which makes it a le less of like a clean sort of like treatment type indicator of like a prior we had no relationship and now we went on this and we did, which probably happens sometimes, but more of a broader indicator of people's propensities to develop relationships. Um, and in that paper, we use that to test like, okay, our members who are more likely to have this propensity more likely to collaborate in this way, um, which makes it maybe not as clean as, and as satisfying. But and this is where we use also the matching processes to try to deal with some potential selection effects. Um, but ultimately, it's very, it's all a very endogenous process that that is part of what makes this so difficult. But also, I mean, I, th I think the way you explain it there makes sense, right? Yeah. It's an indicator of some broader behavioral treat, uh, trait or what have you. Um, yeah. So not the causal claim about having gone on the trip. So, I mean. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah, all good. I mean, it, it is the case that most new members do go. I think a lot of committee leaders and party leaders encourage freshmen to do this. So I do think it probably takes a while for them to develop the reputation so that they don't get invited. Um, but that <laughs> we might be able to figure that out in some way. I mean, I think in the LSQ paper, we have this great quote from John Boehner's book about how he, you know, essentially that was his way to retaliate against people's not let them travel. Um, but um, so, so there is some, some serious endogeneity there. And he, and he didn't last a speaker all that long, <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, no causal inference implied. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. David. Yeah, so uh, following up on that, that was going to be my main question. So uh, thanks, Sarah, for, for beating me to the punch. But I, I guess a corollary is not only selection issues in terms of who, you know, is more or less inclined to, to travel or, or get invited, but, but I'm just, and this might be something that you know, if at the moment that you are invited to go on a trip, do you know who else is also going on that trip or, or who else has been invited? Because uh, I wonder about that too. Like, you're like, oh yeah, sure. That sounds like fun. Oh wait, never mind. That that dude is going, I don't want to go uh, anymore. Uh, and, and I wonder if that could, could play a role here. So that's the, the first thing, question that I had. I'm just going to go ahead and, and throw everything out here and let you respond. I think it's quicker that way. Uh, the second thing I, I put in the chat, which is that looking at your at your figures, you know, I see, you know, a, a very slight, you know, statistically significant relationship for for bipart for a bipartisan effect, but um, you know, and then the overall effect, which suggests that the effect just among you know the intrapartisan effect must be huge, right? I'm, I'm, and and I'm wondering if I'm right about that, and and that's really you know potentially very very meaningful, especially when you think about you know more and more a lot of these important negotiations are intra party. I mean certainly all the stuff that we've dealt with the past couple of years, you know for the you know all the stuff about Manchin's vote and stuff and and uh, and and whatnot has has been intra partisan. Um, and then the third thing I, idea I had, and I don't even know the extent to which this is really that much of a thing, but but I've heard stories about in in recent congresses maybe for the past decade or so 
uh, you've got a lot of younger members, um, male members in particular, who sleep in their offices uh, during during the week. Uh, and uh, and I can you know you sort of like imagine almost like a fraternity type of um, uh, situation there. And and again, there there are obvious gender biases there and whatnot. But I wonder if any leverage could be gained over you know knowing exactly who's doing that, uh, and if and if those people wind up uh, working together more. So those are are all my questions. Thanks, David. These are really good. Um, in terms of, I'll try to get to each one of them. In terms, of, I'll, I'll start with the intra-party effect, which I think is really interesting. I think we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about intra-party negotiations and inter-party collaboration as much because we've been so focused on the way the interviews presented this, which is um, relationships are particularly helpful in building cross-party collaborations. Um, but I think you're right, and I think there's even some sort of like undercurrent of some of the interviews with, especially with committee chairs and ranking members talking about needing to be able to have strong relationships with their members on the committee and be able to not only move them along, but sometimes keep them in line. Um, so there's definitely something there that we should spend more time dwelling on. So thank you. Um, on the, do they do they know who else is going on the Codel in the first place? I'm not sure, maybe Jason has some insight into that one, but I don't, I'm not 100% sure if they are given sort of the full guest list. Um, at the time of the invite or not. Jason, do you know? I don't know. I thought Bettina might be able to comment on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you want me to comment on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, That'd I mean, great. often they organize those groups to go together and the list is fluid because their schedules are so unpredictable. So there's not so much a list with a capital L as an evolving group, but uh, usually people have some idea of who's going. And I can actually chime in here uh, as someone who's been on a CODEL. Um, and it was definitely a circumstance where, um, like Bettina was saying, you know, we had a list, we had a sense of who was potentially going to be invited, um, but not a full list of, you know, when we agreed, we didn't know that Catherine Harris was going to be on the trip, for example, right. uh, which was fun. <laughs> so, yeah. The leader knows everyone. So that's like, you can yeah. definitely use like the leader as like, obviously they're doing the invites, but the kind of co- non-leader members may or may not have a choice in who they're traveling with. Okay, okay that's good to know. So I think we could spend more time in the, on the interview stage asking about like how um, they receive um, these in invitations and their thought process at the point of receipt it would be really interesting. And David, I apologize, I've forgotten your third question now at this point. The one about uh, young members sleeping in offices and, and whether oh, yeah. that creates a fraternity effect. Yeah, that would be really interesting to find out. I don't know if we know comprehensively who does and doesn't stay in their office. Um, maybe this is another reason to, uh, for me to reach back out to Lipinski, um, given that he was one of these office sleepers in a very nice setup in his office for him to stay the night. Because uh, he would certainly could at least give us some initial insight into did that mean he interacted a lot with the other members who were sleeping in their offices on the Hill? I know he saw a number of them in the gym which is another one of those things you hear talked about all the time, about time spent at the gym can be helpful for this. Um, so that's a really good angle that we should spend some time digging into. Thank you. Um, Christopher Clark. Hi, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, so a question I had as you all were talking is uh, thinking about caucus membership. And so I, I didn't realize just how many caucuses there were in Congress. Turns out there's a ludicrous amount, but I did see one thought would be you all might find of interest right and Jason not just because you're from Alabama but so you have Terry Sewell right black congresswoman democrat from Alabama and her and Adrian Smith are like both part of the congressional rural caucus and Smith who I didn't know before is from Nebraska Republican uh, white guy and so I just think that's really interesting to think about right and I know caucuses differ in terms of how often they meet right I don't know all the rules of the game but that's a right someone opts into that no one is forced to join right uh, relationships are built. There's some shared interest that they have, at least, right, both want to represent rural Americans, although from different parties, right, uh, and have different priorities in other ways. Uh, there might be something there. Um, you, you know, find someone to go and, and do all the coding. At least I know for the 117th, I was able to find it, you know, in the middle of your talk. Uh, I imagine those lists might, might go back in time, but that might be a neat way to also measure um, how people relate to each other. And this is sort of a funny comment, but I was talking with a guy about pickleball, and so maybe there's something there, too, about, right, pickleball, because you know, I'm getting too old for basketball now, or I'm straining muscles and all that, but right, those kind of like ways of, of playing, right, golf together or, or squash or something. That's more of a joking comment, but I really do think the caucus thing might be something. 
<laughs> yeah. I like the pickleball thing, though. If we could get Dan, yeah, who gets to play pickleball together, it'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, like Sarah's comment, I hope there is a pickleball caucus to tie your two points together. Um, I would be interested, like the caucus thing could be potentially interesting. And, and as Allison pointed out in the chat, Jen, Jennifer Victor has a ton of data on this and has done a lot of work in this space. Um, I think, and and I think I don't I don't see that she's here. But if she was, I think she would be the first to tell you like a big challenge of this is knowing which of these caucuses are actually active and which aren't. And if you could have information on which ones actually meet and do things together, that I think that could be. I think you're right. You're right. On, you hit the nail on the head that that could be another way in which you bring members together that have common interests and maybe that helps them develop some sort of at least per professional relationship that could lead to collaboration, but that's the ultimate challenge, right? So which of these, there's so many of them on the books. Or for instance, when I worked for Dan Lipinski, um, he ran the STEM Education Caucus. He also co-ran the Zoos and Aquariums Caucus. And the STEM Education Caucus, quote unquote, met, but we were the only member that showed up. It was us and a bunch of lobbyists, and we talked about what our priorities might be on STEM education. And the Zoos Aquarium Caucus had an annual, like, quote unquote, gala in which you went to a room with a bunch of other members and they had zoo animals walking around, which was probably the most bizarre thing I ever did on Capitol Hill, but it was only once a year. And so like, there's a lot of, probably a lot of variation there in like the degree to which these things actually bring people together. And that would be fascinating to have. Uh, but I know Jen Victor has had, has certainly had trouble like pinning down that very precise thing, which is probably where they do matter. Uh, but thank you. Um, it's a good thing to think about. <laughs> That's right, Mike would have been to that gala too. <laughs> um, John Sullivan, I see your hands up. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm, I'm John Sullivan with Partnership for Secure America. Um, just for those who, who don't know, we had pioneered kind of the PLN and applying that to congressional staff, so bringing in our colleagues from Harvard. Uh, and, and we're grateful for all the, the innovation and support that now AU has brought with housing program within them. But, um, and, and I've been going in, I've had meetings all morning, so I apologize, I've been in and out. But I'm curious to know if, if you are also leaning in to try to understand which offices staffers are participating in extracurricular activities at, at our organization. We run something called the Congressional Partnership Program. So twice a year, we'll get 30 congressional staff together, have that split down the middle between R's and D's and they'll go through a multi-month experience and we have a retreat component of that. And that's really like a highlight of everything where we get everyone just outside of DC, we go to Airlie and Warrington. Um, and it, it, it's amazing how you kind of see everyone take off their, their working hat and they relax a little bit. We engage in some topical discussions and we'll do some exercises. Bettina has actually uh, observed our retreats before but to understand if, if certain offices are more apt to participate in, you know, your Brookings institutions, your Wilson Center Heritage, whatever, uh, congressional programs, and if that is creating kind of synergies of cooperation, because that, that's what we observe. Um, we don't take any positions. We don't try to push any policy. We are just trying to facilitate those connections. The metaphor I've used is the fine connective tissue that bonds members and their staff to their peers is just atrophying or outright deteriorating. And so we're just rehabilitating that ability to work together. And so are you, are you planning to look at congressional staff participating in this and, and what effect that has with their bosses? We've definitely looked at it already from like the interview standpoint. Um, and this is, so this is, I mean, thank you. This is an excellent point because I think we, we agree 100% that staff relationships are just as important, maybe sometimes even more important um, than the member to member relationships where a lot of the interviews revealed like staffers saying like, well, you know, I've known my counterpart over on the other side for a long time. So it helped us be able to get together and, and cut through some of the BS and figure out what we could or couldn't do. Um, and so, yes, in a sense, we are very interested in that. Um, I think the, cha the challenges are largely the same as finding like good from turning from the interviews where it's very apparent that this stuff matters to finding the systematic data for us to test it more broadly. And so things like what you're doing um, would be really useful to have, have like more information about, um, but it's, it's always that like the comprehensiveness of it. Yeah, and you're using so many decentralized data sets that there's no, general just housekeeping of it. Um, if, if we can be helpful at all, feel free to kind of reach out to me. We do, do surveys and stuff. So 
I mean, we have some quantitative data on all of this, uh, but I think you're you're honing in on a couple of like very strong points. We have a saying in our organization, you know, legislating is a very social activity and it has to be because through those social interactions is where we develop trust. And, and that's really where our programs shine is, is these staffers build trust with one another. So at least if they're trying to cooperate or collaborate, they know each party's coming across in good faith. And, and I have a, a mentor who, who's a former congressman out of Arizona and he has commented he was he was there in the 90s and saw the change of when members were, were in DC a lot more and how they would see each other at restaurants. They would interact with one another in a more relaxed setting. And, and that just doesn't happen to the same degree that it used to. And I, I think we, we see that play out in, in kind of our, our legislative and, and partisan debates. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, John. Bettina, you have your hand up. Camera and everything back. Just real quick to add a couple of points partially related to John, but on some of the things you all mentioned. and. Uh, just think about whether these are areas you want to follow up on. With respect to the CODEL issue, uh, organizations like John's, the PSA, you know, you also have the uh, member level ones like Aspen. And uh, those trips really immerse people in settings totally away. You know, they just came back from Iceland and before that this summer they were in Geneva and uh, they did an energy trip to Iceland uh, just recently. Uh, talked a lot about climate change, but it was primarily focused on energy as a theme. And so it attracted a significant number of Republicans. But I think that that's another area where interactions are important. Um, and those are funded by foundations, et cetera. Uh, and I think the value of the relationship building is important to study because there's a lot of infrastructure to relationship building in Congress that requires belief by these foundations and even by leadership that it's worth doing. Um, and we see, you know, and what, you know, we observe has been at working in Congress for a long time, that those relationships are quite powerful. And I, I've talked to you about some of that. Um, also in talking to uh, people about what happened in the pandemic and how much damage it caused for relationships, which some have argued all the more reason we need to get together more in these other settings, Codell's, Aspen, otherwise, are things like proxy voting, uh, remote hearings, uh, remote voting, member turnover, uh, there has been the opportunity to not be there at all. You know, it's really gone to an extreme. And I heard that from some members very recently. And some people were asserting they really wanted to get together more in some setting uh, in order to make up for the deficit that occurred because of that situation. And lastly, you know, Senator Mikulski is joining us shortly. And She's got some, you might want to ask her some about the relationship issues. We're going to talk about that, but um, things like dinners uh, and organized events that certain members do build rather remarkable relationships that translate directly sometimes into legislative uh, success. So we'll talk about some of that. You'll have the chance, but I think that's another socially, you know, social way of organizing that actually may be happening monthly in some cases. Uh, that builds a lot of uh, connection and potentially uh, legislative action. Yeah, thank you, Bettina. These are all great suggestions. We spent some time at one point trying to get data on the Aspen Institute um, stuff, I think, which we struck out on, but maybe that's a good motivation to, to get back into it. Because uh, we well, agree, like the foundational yeah. travel is obviously just as important. I would say they have new people at Aspen now. So Charlie Dent, is now in charge of congressional. Okay. They just put, got a new person who used to run the one campaign uh, or be involved in it. Um, but, you know, so they've got a, a, a sort of re-energized focus on this with new leadership and it's Republican leadership. Anyway, I would recommend connecting with them because I know uh, I interact with them some and they really get this issue and they, it is a whole different crew now. So it's worth taking a run. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. We would definitely will then. Um, and I agree with you on the, the proxy voting, the remote hearings, the remote voting, all the remote stuff. You hear that all the time talking to people now in Capitol Hill, as you, as you said, and as you know, as a problem for this particular type of thing. So maybe there's some leverage there we can dig into as well with mm -hmm. if we can get a sense of, you know, who's been more or less likely to take advantage of these of these of these remote opportunities um, in, in, in the last couple of years, that would be fantastic. So thank you so much. 
one last um, thought about roommates. I mean, about sleeping on the hill, by the way, uh, yeah. <laughs> in your office. Um, roommates. Some members have got apartments that they've shared or have other shared spaces. And uh, there's some older stories about that. I think Chuck mm -hmm. Schumer, mm -hmm. George Miller lived together. And, you know, some of the people that were part of some of these are bonded in certain ways for life as a result. So I think yeah, anything where people have frequent interactions, no matter what the setting, helps humanize the other person and give a sense of like, what do I expect back from this person? And what are the stakes, you know, if they do something backstabbing or whatever, and it really can change the dynamic. So no matter what the setting, I don't think it's as much what the setting is as the number of interactions and the chance to spend more private time together. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. Thank you so much. And on the Chuck Schumer things, I interned for Dick Durbin way back when I was in college when they were living <laughs> together and had the horrifying experience of seeing Chuck Schumer in his boxers. Wow. So. <laughs> oh yeah. They all have nicknames for each other still. They're all there's a whole yeah. thing, you know, and even people who visited them and, and were connected to it. You know, it's mm -hmm. you know, anyway, I do think <laughs> that this matters a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yep. Um, David, is there time for me to answer anybody's questions in the comments or should I just follow up with them directly? Um, I think that you should either follow up with them in directly or you could put some responses in the chat so other people could uh, could benefit from those. Um, okay. But uh, but yeah, you know, I want to give people a chance to, to grab some lunch or whatever before you come back uh, at noon to hear Bettina uh, interview Senator Mikulski. Uh, I think that's going to be um, uh, a really um, enlightening conversation. So Go do that. See you in a few. Yeah, we're going to start at 12, right? With the interview. That's exactly right. So make sure y'all are, are back and ready to go by then. And David and Hannah, she's coming a little bit early and have there's some struggle with her internet. She thinks it'll be all right, but I wanted to flag it so we can help her because she'll log on early enough to troubleshoot. Okay. I think Hannah is back now. Is that right, okay. Hannah? Yes, I'm back. Yeah, great. Okay. We'll keep we'll keep an eye out for her and see if she can log in successfully and we'll take a look and test out how that's going. Cause she she just sent me an email about it.
Senator, are you there? Senator Mikulski, I think I saw you. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. There you can go. Can you see me? I can see you too. You look great, very bright. <laughs> so we're all hooked up, right? Looks like we're good. So uh, they're oh, coming great. back as well. <laughs> well, that's all fine. Uh, I've been a little busy this morning with the University of Maryland. Tell me, how is the morning going for you all? Oh, very well. I mean, we've had a series of presentations. I sent you an agenda on that. We yes. were just talking about relationships, which segues uh -huh. very well into uh, things you're very familiar with. And in fact, one scholar was asking a little bit earlier, I know a lot of people are at lunch right now, but about Lily Ledbetter and how mm -hmm. that got done. So you may get a question related to that. And um, yeah, no, I think it's been going quite well. We have some really interesting people here today, all our scholars that we're funding. Uh, Jenny Mansbridge did an introduction this morning from the Kennedy School and she's uh, really kind of a, the fa one of the founding supporters of the work we do. Uh, I think you'd really enjoy meeting her. She, I think she's already gone off to do something uh, else, but she has amazing energy and she's really committed to these issues. And Frances Lee has been here. I don't know if she's still here right now. I'm looking uh, from Princeton. Yeah, she's here. And, uh, you know, Chris Bertram from T&I and I and I are working on a chapter of a book with her. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of good discussion about trying to study legislators and how they get things done and how do you do that as political scientists. So, you know, it's, it's interesting and something we need to figure out better than we have so far. <laughs> well, I think it's great that American University has this, established this program in the study of presidential and congressional studies. I think congressional studies are often overlooked I also think like books that I've read about like how Obamacare got done, they mm -hmm. leave out the women, they leave out the caucus. You think mm -hmm. it was only the finance committee mm -hmm. and that the health committee didn't exist. Uh, so people often write about, I use the term us because once you're a member, always a member, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can call it a vocation or, you know, a cult following, depending <laughs> like, but uh, uh, no, I think this is excellent, and I think this is important work to be done, because uh, I'm sure we'll dis in our discussion uh, as we move forward uh, today, is people really say when all is said and done, does more get said than get done, mm -hmm. and um, and I wondered about that. Uh, of course, Senator Boxer uh, and I were always on the side of reform mm -hmm. and um, improving the process, but. I'm looking forward to our conversation today in the Q&A. So we'll go through like our 30 minutes and then perhaps like yep. an open mic. Is that it? Good. That's it. Good. And uh, they'll have, I'll help moderate that. They'll have like hands raised and chat questions. And so I'll go through those and kind of pass them along to you as those arise. Good. I think that's a great way to go. Can and I, can, uh, I just, can I just jump in? I just wanted to say, my name is Wendy Schiller. I'm a professor at Brown University. And I worked for Pat Moynihan, my first job out of college, when you got elected to the Senate in 86 in the summer as your campaign went along. And, um, and I happened to be also a little bit on the petite side. And I have just <laughs> always, you were the most inspirational person, you know, 22 year old getting to the Hill, watching you come to the Senate from the house and just, you know, for, and your work on breast cancer funding research, the first uh, uh, bill ever to fund breast cancer. And, my mother had breast cancer when you passed that bill. So I just want to say personally, it's just a really great thrill to see you today. And so I'm really well, looking forward to your conversation. Wonderful. And it's wonderful to hear the rest of the story. Uh, I thought that Senator Moynihan was one of the, was truly a prodigy uh, yeah. and a force. And yes, yes. Well, we, we can talk about this a little bit. And, um, you know, the, the Constitution only mentions two congressional committees. They left the rest to us, uh, to the Congress to decide. But that was the Revenue Committee, of course, in the Senate, the Finance Committee, and the Expenditure Committee. And that was the way they maintained the check and balances on the uh, executive branch, um, that no president could arbitrarily raise a tax. And any spending had to go through the Congress and, and originated in the House. So it was very interesting. But we're the only two mentioned in the Constitution. Yeah. 
That is interesting. That's it, most people definitely do not don't know that. And there've been a lot of creations since some of them very large, like Homeland Security and uh, some of the others that have taken on such a big role. Do you mind? We are recording this conference. Um, yeah, you don't sure. Mind put it. Okay, thank no, you. No, I'm fine with that. Yes. Okay, great, great. That's helpful because people like to go back and, and look at the conversations. And I think it's a super, super help. It's uh, we've got about one minute, Bettina. Whenever you're, uh, whenever you and the senator are are ready, um, you know, okay. feel free to to take it. Okay. So Do you want to just welcome every? I know the camera. Are they, well, we keep the cameras off during the conversation. Do you think everybody's right. basically back? Uh, yeah. it's it's hard to know. Um, but I but I know okay. that our our time is got is it with with the senator. I uh, don't want to you know. Got it. Fine. No. <laughs> well, I'm here. I'm very excited about this program. Uh, and I'm so pleased that such a distinguished group of people are actually taking a, a scholarly approach to this. Uh, because most people think all you have to do is show up and have opinions. Uh, you can kind of wing it. Uh, and you can see, but in the very nature of this course, uh, all negotiations occur mostly on a building block basis. And anyway, I'm glad about it. And yeah. I'm here for whatever you need me to do. Great. And well, I'm an eager participant. <laughs> well, we really appreciate it. And, and we're also excited about the um, the, the video series uh, that, that Hopkins uh, has put together on on your life and work. And I think Bettina is going to mention that in a second. So I'll, I'll shut up uh, and, and let, <laughs> let Bettina uh, and you take the floor. All right, I'll go ahead and start. And David, when we do get to questions, I'll look in the chat, but if you notice some things piling up or otherwise, we can maybe work together on that. Okay. Uh, well, I do wanna welcome uh, Senator Mikulski. So excited uh, to have you here today. We're really fortunate that you were able to join us and have the opportunity to talk to you about your perspective on legislative negotiations over your long career in Congress. I think it's helpful to share information about your background just now, even though, of course, you need no introduction in many respects, but you've had such a terrific vantage point on how legislative negotiations are occurring now, but also over a significant period of time. So let me just start for a minute and give a little bit of background and context. Um, Senator Mikulski is the longest serving woman in congressional history. She started with the Baltimore City Council and then went on uh, to 10 years in the House and 30 years in the Senate. In 2012, she became the first woman and Marylander to chair the Senate Appropriations Committee. She's known for her work in women's empowerment, equity, health, civil rights, education, jobs, research, innovation, cybersecurity, um, <clears throat> seniors and veterans. She has been a champion uh, with space exploration in particular and has played a key role in saving the Hubble telescope. And we'll probably talk a little bit about that and the relationships that came of that later today. Um, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama in 2015. And of course has received many other awards and honorary degrees. Senator Mikulski started out as a social worker and a professor before her legislative career. I don't know if everyone is aware of that, and it had an impact on her approach to politics and public service. Senator Mikulski retired from the Senate in 2017, like my former boss, Senator Boxer, when she became the Homewood Professor of Public Policy at Johns Hopkins University and taught there through the spring of this year. She remains affiliated with Johns Hopkins and serves on multiple boards as well. And I just wanna welcome you, Senator Mikulski, uh, give you a moment to say hello, and then I'll dive into these questions. Well, good morning to the scholars and to those who are watching this. I think what American University is doing in uh, its program or the study of the presidency and uh, congressional uh, and, and Congress is really crucial. I'm happy to be a participant in this today and eager to talk about how you get things done and you really get things done through the committee process and through the negotiation process. So looking forward to engaging in a, a conversation with such distinguished people in such an essential topic. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, I did want to flag, and David brought this up earlier, I put in the chat a link that um, I recommend you take a look at uh, that has really got some wonderful stuff in it. It is uh, a Johns Hopkins link. It's the Senator Mikulski's library at johnshopkins.edu. You'll see the link. I have a hot link in the chat. And it does contain some wonderful background, many things that many people may not be aware of, uh, from the space program to the senator's history and, and how she got to Congress to begin with and many of the remarkable uh, accomplishments that you've had, particularly on some of the women's issues that already have come up today, which, um, you know, even though I've worked with you for a long time and known a lot about your distinguished career, I found those documentaries to be really interesting and really um, fun to watch. So I definitely recommend you take a look at that link. But let me jump into some questions, Senator, and I wanted to start by asking you about how you've approached legislative negotiations, in particular as chairman and ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, where you were, of course, a lead negotiator, and you also had to take into account many parties to the negotiations operating on different levels, from leadership to committee members and the White House. Can you share your insight on multi-party, multi-level negotiations, and how did you navigate the different roles of all these players? Well, first of all, when I approached the, the, the chairmanship um, and uh, had to move very big bills, the so-called omnibus funding, which was the entire funding for the federal government. And I took over at a time when Senator Inouye, the beloved and esteemed chairman, had unexpectedly passed away. So I kind of got like a battlefield promotion, but I had been at this a really long time, as you said. The way I approached it was a combination of political experience and my social work background. The first thing that you learn in social work school or to be a good social worker is that you have to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. The second thing was that the most important thing was communication based on courtesy. And when I approached the Appropriations Committee to move this, the first thing I knew was what it wasn't. It wasn't an argument. It wasn't a debate. It wasn't about scoring points. It was about resolving a difference and accomplishing an agenda. And I had three objectives policy, funding, and the politics. I was not free range and I wasn't just going in as Senator Barb who wanted to do her own thing. I was representing the Democratic Caucus and the Democratic presidency of Barack Obama. So I needed to know, first of all, what was my authority to negotiate? Not only that I was chairman, but that the president, the Democratic Caucus, and its leadership had said, this is, go for it, Barb, Senator Barb, and you know the policy recommendations had come from what had been arrived at, at the authorizing level, like what Senator Boxer had shared in the Environment Committee, which was so crucial. So when you walk into that room, you just don't kind of strut in and throw something on the table and say, well, you ready to begin? No. It's who you represent and the authority. Now, the first thing is we had to go with where President Obama was. And the great thing in working with President Obama and the Democratic leadership is we agreed on goals. Strategy and tactics, President Obama left to Harry Reid as the leader of the Democratic and the, the of the Democrats and to me. So strategy was determined within the institution. Tactics were decided by me and my subcommittee chairman. And so when you go in to negotiate, you have to have authority. You need to know what are your, your objectives that you seek and what is the negotiating space that you have. But it all starts with authority, communication, and courtesy within your own party as you then approach the people that you're going to negotiate with. When you go to then the people you're going to negotiate with, well, it helps to have known them for a long time because you have been building relationships a long time. But I found that, um, and this is a fun tactoid, and um, one, of course, was that we were going to be negotiating 
Democrat to Republican within the Senate, and then we would be senators negotiating with the Democrats. Now in the House, the Appropriations Committee was being led by Congresswoman Nita Lowy, a very dear friend of many years. We nicknamed ourselves the Obama Mamas. <laughs> I thought you, I thought this is not something scholars tend to know, but it showed the collegiality we had with a president who we had agreed upon goals. We actually met with the president in the Oval Office. We were in touch with his OMB director every single day of the negotiation to see how it goes. So you see how it goes, and then it goes to then meeting with the other party, which we can talk about. Talk a little bit more, if you would, about the role of the authorizing committee, because everyone is not always as well aware as you know of the role they play in the appropriations process um, to sort of inform what's going on in the process and how does that relationship actually end up building either support or even opposition to the bill if things clash between those two? Well, I made it my point, my focus as chair to be in close touch with the authorizers. I viewed them as like my kitchen cabinet in helping me move the bills in a successful way. Remember, policy, funding, and politics. Those were the, the three things that I had to be aware of. In terms of politics, the first rule was do no harm to what is existing and what we like. The funding is a is advisory. The authorizer set policy, but we appropriators set the funding, which drives the policy. So as we negotiated, as the Republicans would offer policy differences, or often in terms of the environment, they would want to train a trade a poison pill rider on the environment for more money. Like we'll give you more money for X if you agree to mountaintop running or getting ready of the, the Superfund program, all of those kinds of things. And this is where I would come back to the authorizers for their advice, for, for their expertise, their advice, uh, and their recommendations, in addition to what was coming from my subcommittee that was the relevant subcommittee. So I had a rule, which is for the relevant, for the people who were involved in making policy, nothing about you without you so the one of the most important things in negotiation is the conversations you have with others outside of the negotiation so you agree on the goals and on the outcomes that you seek and i found the authorizers invaluable in terms of the advice they gave and then the support within my caucus to get the votes i needed to pass the bill because uh, Everyone is an independent uh, thinker in the Senate, as you know. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> the case. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about- But does that show how there's a continual consultation? Now, it was done not only by me, but we can never overlook the role of staff. Staff, staff, staff. Um, often, particularly the committee staffs, have vast experience and expertise. And it was very important, and I encouraged this type of communication. Uh, often in the past, some of the former chairmen viewed the authorizers as advisory. I viewed them as more than that. That we were, you know, we were, we were a team and we were going to get the best policy. We were going to get the most appropriate funding. And we were going to follow a rule called do no harm. That whatever we did, we would come out better than the same or better than when we went in. I wanted to bring up an issue we talked about before our uh, our class today, um, our conference today, that came up in appropriations that illustrates, I think, you know, how do you get to a point where you can get something done and it isn't the position necessarily that everybody started with. Uh, but it's about how do you get what your interests are and what you need as opposed to what you might want. And you had mentioned Head Start as an example of that, where President Obama had started with one point of view and then where it ended up if it was to get something done. Could you share a little, you know, your perspective on what happened with Head Start and appropriations? 
Yes, as we were negotiating money for Head Start, we wanted, we, the Democratic Caucus, and through its authorizing, wanted a substantial amount of money to start a reform view of Head Start. President Obama was very much the education guy. He gets a great reputation for health and many other things that he did. But he was, and he had a very aggressive Secretary of Education in Arne Duncan. And we all knew early childhood education and Head Start were important. However, the Republicans had decided they were going to stymie Obama at every chance they got. So what they said to me and to team, you know, team Dem was, we'll talk about more money for the old program, but we won't give you a nickel for the new program. Well, I was cranky, 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 but being cranky doesn't get anything done. You have to have savvy. So what did I do? Went back to Democratic leadership uh, and also spoke to the relevant authorizer, Senator Tom Harkin, who is also an appropriator. And we knew that anything new had to have new rules, new regs, and so on. And they said, do two things. Go for the most money that you can get because this is the second and last term of President Obama. So get as much money as you've done. So we raised the bar of what is the funding. And second, put in legislative language, if you can, to explore or do demonstration projects on new models. And that's what we did. We took the money, we took more money, which was great for kids because we had established trade routes back to states and local communities but we gave the groundwork for further exploration or demonstration projects. And I think what one of the things that's so helpful about that example is sometimes, you know, those new types of negotiations fall apart because the desire to have the new program sometimes overwhelms the more practical approach about the underlying interest in getting something done now where there's such a great need. So I do think it's a good example of shifting off the initial position looking at what are your underlying interests, which is to strengthen, really bolster this program now. And you got a result. And that doesn't always happen. Sometimes people get stuck on their original position and it's hard to move. Well, and this goes to another phrase that I used when I would go back. Every Tuesday, I would have to present status of negotiations to the Democratic Caucus. I gave a report and they gave me feedback, sometimes quite vocal and supportive, sometimes vocal in a little, you know, different direction. But what essentially was that compromise, and this is often viewed as a, as, as a, as a, as a, as a when I use the term dirty word, that I said, we can compromise without capitulation. We're not giving up on the kids. We're never gonna give up on the kids. That's capitulation. Well, is it the best way to help the kids? Take the money you get, raise the bar for funding, lay the groundwork because appropriations will fight another day next year and we can build greater support and maybe do a couple of demonstration programs to show what we're talking about really does help kids and can be achievable and sustainable. And so well, that's the difference. Compromise without capitulation. If we're asked to capitulate on principle, well, or fundamental premise, like we're going to be here for the kids and do the best we can by Head Start, then 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 we're out. Then no, you don't compromise. Well, and we we talk a lot about um, the concepts in negotiation, uh, you know, in this group, and one of them is the term compromise. Sometimes means splitting the difference, giving up your principle in some substantial way, but getting something else. But let me move to what you said, which is without capitulation, because there's something we call and this is you know in the in the academic side of negotiation it's integrative negotiation and the idea is you're making trade-offs and you give away something less important but you get something more important back and we don't call that compromise as much as making those trades and integrating the interests of the parties so that let's say in your case with head start the republicans are saying it's not in our interest to let there be a reformed head start program but you realize okay, we might be willing to give that up, but only if you really double down in your investment in what is what our underlying interest is, which is funding Head Start. 
So we, we've had this concept of integrative negotiation that moves away from the idea of splitting the difference or capitulating on key issues and instead is more about trade-offs, you know, and high and low. You give something you can live without to get something you really want. This kind well, of yes, I was giving like, what was the agreement on a specific thing? But yes, there would be, uh, there would be trade-offs, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I'm gonna come back to one of the important things is relationships and communication. It is absolutely essential that you are communicating with the people who empower you to be the negotiator uh, and also in some ways have greater expertise. People don't realize the appropriation staff is a meaner staff than the authorizers. It doesn't look that way because we cover all 13 you know, subcommittees. And uh, that's absolutely important of communication. You know how I said, talk to this senator, talk to this, and so on. But so did our staff. Uh, relationship has to be built on communication. And I must say, even where there might be a prickly relationship, like with the other party, on a particular issue, or even generally, um, courtesy, respect, listening to the other opinion uh, certainly helps. But, um, you know, relationships have to be built over time. Um, and you never know where they're going to come from. Uh, so when you look at the Appropriations Committee, uh, I had an extraordinarily positive relationship, both with Senator Bond um, and then, but also the chair of the committee, Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, uh, a rock ribbed conservative from Alabama and loyal to his party, loyal to Alabama. You get the picture. However, Senator Shelby and I had come to the House together. We had served on a committee. I watched him when he changed parties from Democrat to whatever. I knew him a long time. He knew me. So we knew how each other functioned and what our priorities were. However, what was drew us together? Shelby is the home of, of the space program on space flight. It's where Walter Brown Bronkin. So Senator Shelby is a space guy. Senator Barb has Goddard Space Agency, the home of space science, the Hubble telescope, the new Webb telescope, the thing that just knocked an asteroid off its trajectory it might save the planet one day. So, and then coming to the Senate after the year of the woman and so on was Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson of Texas. Well, I won't go through the backstory about how she and I got acquainted, but Senator Hutchinson was on the Appropriations Committee and she's Houston. Remember that famous line, Houston, we got a problem. Well, there we go. So you had a threesome, if you will, of people from their states where space was an important part of our economic development and quite frankly, of our statewide pride. We're very proud of Houston and Alabama's proud of itself. And we're very proud of Goddard. We even had Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth there one time. So our bottom line was Shelby, you know, Kay Bailey, Barb Mikulski, we were together on space and we believed in a balanced program. We worked together and I think we achieved very good things. We saved the Hubble, helped in the Webb telescope, eventually launch, eventually even on and um, doing other great things in space science, like mission to planet earth, working with authorizers who were then like Senator Gore, we created Mission to Planet Earth, which was so important to you in the Environment Committee because you actually saw the planet from way out there. So you see how all this works and you develop relationships in the Senate based on mutual alliances that are beneficial. Uh, you also build them when you visit states, like Senator Shelby invited me to come to Texas and say Houston, which I did. And she invited me to come to her rodeo, a rodeo that they had every year. And I said, you know, the only horse I've ever been on has been a merry-go-round. 
I mean, what the hell did I know about riding horses growing up in blue collar Baltimore? But anyway, I went to the rodeo, bought a little cowgirl hat in the kids department that fitted me. I got on a buckboard, a buckboard with the aid of a pickup truck. She was on a Palomino truck. We rode into the Astrodome together. She carrying the American flag, me in the buckboard raising to God bless America. We have the pictures. We laugh about that every time we chat. But I say that because then I did go to Houston. I went to the DeBakey Medical Center. She then, I mean, we did things like that. That's what builds relationships. That's what I worry might be fading now. Senator, uh, could you talk a little bit? I know there's a lot of interest in this in your starting that women's dinner with Kay Bailey Hutchinson and how that built some relationships that led, you know, to people working together on women's health or Lily Ledbetter and other things that might even have been some hard, not so much on the health issue, although that was very innovative, but some hard votes like Ledbetter, the Republican women voted for that, even though it was a tight vote. Can you talk a little bit about those dinners and what the rules of the game were and what, how that helped? Sure. Well, anyway, Senator Hutchinson gets elected and I'm in my office and, um, uh, my staff tells me that Senator Hutchinson's on the phone and I say, I'm going to call her back. My staff says, hey, we didn't want to call her back. I mean, she's that Republican from Texas and you know how they are. I said, no, I don't know how they are. I've never met a woman senator from Texas before, but she's another senator. The rules of this, the, the tradition of the Senate is senators call each other back. We talk with each other. And I called her back and she shared with me that she had a, a way of reforming IRAs, the, the, like the retirement saving that would be beneficial for women. It was a great idea. And her staff didn't want her to call me because I was the liberal mouthy feisty Democrat from Baltimore. And anyway, we worked on this idea. We went, we, she and I went out to dinner to just talk about policy strategy feasibility and achievability we had such a good time because we talked to each other with each other about each other i got to know herself and some of the uh, discrimination she faced even though a law degree nobody would hire her in texas because she was a woman they kept referring to her as a cheerleader even though she was a, an accomplished tv journalist and you all back you get the picture so we decided we had such a good time to invite the other women. That began the dinners. But at that first dinner, we the only two things we could agree upon, some of us are pro-choice, some of us are not. Some of us are balanced budget, some of us are not. So was that we would agree on two things, more money for breast cancer research because it was un, underfunded. And the second thing we would agree upon was that we would be a zone of civility. That among each other, when we would be on the floor or in committee, we would conduct ourselves not with the prickly habits. You see, Gingrich guys were being elected to the Senate and they brought the brash things that for the Senate, but we would be the zone of civility. For our dinners, we decided one, we would not be a caucus, we would be a force. There was no Goodness test or what and so on but also that there would be no staff no memos and no leaks men would be invited only strategically we did have dinner with a, a guy by the name of barack obama who invited me to this lovely home <laughs> uh, we had the pictures and so on so but that's the way the dinners develop. And you know what? We got to know each other as people. Um, and um, I treasure those gatherings because we were a force. And even when on Lily Ledbetter, when I went to the floor, Senator Hutchins and I agreed on goals. She was the senior Republican woman at the time. And that women should be paid for equal pay for equal or comparable work. Um, she offered over nine amendments. I defeated those amendments, but still people talked about how 
interesting the debate was, how it was based on merit, et cetera, the pros and cons, and so on. And we showed what a zone of civility could be on the floor. That also came up during when we brought Barack Obama's Obamacare to the floor. I offered the, the Women's Amendment, uh, which further expanded services for women and made sure just simply being a woman was no longer a pre existing condition. Senator Lisa Murkowski offered an alternative, and uh, we joked about it. You know, I said, You've got longitude, I've got attitude. Uh, but they mess our names up all the time. But again, we debated it with force, with vigor, but with courtesy and respect. And at the end of the day, I think we arrived at very good policy. Uh, and you know what? The Senate enjoyed our debates. And it wasn't just when Senator Barb was offering legislation. Um, it was just generally true whether it, it was the others doing that. Look at what Senator Boxer was able to achieve on the environment, just following that same modus operandi. So um, I'm very proud of the fact that we had that zone of civility. I'm very proud of the fact that the women continue to meet, maybe not as frequently as when we were there, but it is a different day. I think that uh, the impact of the war on terrorism and the attack on us, I think then COVID had a tremendous impact on the functioning of the institution. And then, of course, I think the election of Donald Trump was in and of itself disruptive in the insurrection that our dear colleagues had to live through. You, you know, we talked about the polarization and, and you can't have of, this conversation without that. But let me. I, I didn't want to go on, it, but you know. Where do you think we go? I mean, go we ahead. talked about relationships and about civility, and uh, there are some things getting done, particularly among members that may observe some of that or have built relationships in the past or conduct negotiations more privately. You know, we talked about the CHIP bill. There's potentially Electoral Reform yes. Act, big infrastructure. What's your quick take on, not that this could be a whole week of a conversation, but, you know, we're all focused on how worried we are about our democracy and polarization, but some things are still getting done. What's your perspective on, on how those pieces fit together and where we might go from here? To well, make it I, think, I think things, the traditional way of thinking, you know, before everything used to get done through committees and the chair of a committee was usually the leader. Now it's done through gangs, like the, the gang of seven, the gang of 14, you know, uh, sometimes we get to be the gang of 100, but, um, and let's just take like the work on the infrastructure bill. Uh, that took place outside of the normal and usual and customary committee structure. You, meaning when you chaired environment and public works, the public works part was really infrastructure was one of the reasons Senator Moynihan was so instrumental in that, not only his passion for the environment. And of course, there was Senator Boxer who did a great job. Hey, bottom line, but it's these groups outside that then meet. And um, I think anything that gets something started, if it's outside the process is good. But I still believe in the give and take of the committee process the public hearings, which gives both experts and advocates a, a chance to come forward. Uh, the fact that you have to begin your negotiations, not at some big bill at the end, but you're negotiating all the time. Who are the witnesses? Where are we going? And when you have to move things from subcommittee to full committee. So I believe that the Cook gang group is very good at getting things started and maybe a framework but I believe it is in the committee process that we really need to hold firm and that we use the committee the way it was before to gather information. We're negotiating with both sides and to come up with good policy, good funding that is not only desirable, but achievable, affordable and sustainable. Well, let me thank you for that. I think that's, you know, there, there are some paths forward. We're obviously in a pretty uh, fraught time, but I think uh, the scholars here today may have some questions. Uh, and so let's turn to that. And David, did you want to open it up for questions? And did you have one? 
Yeah, thanks a lot uh, to, to both of you. So I have a, a couple of questions I want to toss out there, and there's probably not enough time for you to answer them uh, both. We'll see how many other questions come in. So you can pick which one you respond to now, and, and we'll see about, about later. Uh, the, the first is, I was wondering if you might uh, give us a little inside baseball uh, information about the, the civil disobedience uh, by you and Senator Braun back in 2009. Uh, uh, on the floor that that changed, um, you know, the tradition of of no pants on on the floor by by women and how that sort of that effort came together, and um, and then the other one maybe is a, a you know sort of a, a bigger question uh, is you know you were you know instrumental uh, in in the passage of Lily Ledbetter uh, and you were also really behind you know a, a longstanding effort uh, on the Paycheck Fairness Act and and you know with the former. Uh, ultimately passing and, and the latter not and, and dying in the Senate a number of times. And so I'm wondering about, you know, what were the different factors that led to the, the passage of one, but not the other? Uh, and as you look back on it now, you know, if, if you can sort of like imagine different scenarios playing out uh, that could have led to the passage of, of paycheck fairness as well. Let me talk about Lily better and paycheck fairness. And then hopefully maybe the, uh, Pantsuit Revolution, we can use as one of our uh, wrap up commentaries. Um, when President, and, and this is often what is not in textbooks or whatever, um, in terms of paycheck check fairness, there was really a movement that was created outside of the Congress. This is a movement, women's driven thing. This didn't come from some expert coming in to talk to us about a problem. This was a grassroots movement that Lily Ledbetter was one of the chief spokeswomen uh, uh, because of the way she had been treated so unfairly and going all the way to the Supreme Court. Okay, now President Obama, so Hillary Clinton comes to the Senate. She's a champion of that, we get behind it. Um, and also um, when Barack Obama became president, um, on his way, after the day of inauguration, on his way over, the, the Senate traditionally has a lunch for uh, the president and the first lady. It's a bipartisan lunch. It's a celebratory welcome, um, kind of kick off to our relationship. Uh, that's And anyway, on the way to the lunch, President, excuse me, Senator Kennedy has a seizure and goes to the hospital and he never really comes back. This is, Billy Ledbetter Bill was in the Kennedy committee and Senator Dodd, his dearest friend in the Senate says, you know, Ted, you know, what's happening to Ted? Stabilized, diagnosis going on. But Dodd says, you're gonna get a call from Ted and probably the president we want you to handle it better while well, I get started on the healthcare agenda. We want to move fast in the president's 100 days. And I get a call from Senator Kennedy from his sick bed saying, Barbara, I want you to take Lily. I really can't come back to get this done. President, they're, they're really figuring out what happened to me here. And President Obama wants this to be his first bill. And you're going to hear from it. I get a call from the president of the United States. You want to stand up straight. You're sorry you didn't get your hair done that day. I mean, lipstick on, ready to go. And President Obama, in one of his first conversations with him, his presidency, I made the promise. We talked about it in the Senate. You know where I've come from. I want, you know, you're it. Chris is going to take over the health care agenda and start moving on that. Would you move Lily? And you're empowered to do that as if, in, as, as kind of like acting chair of this movement. And that's when I just took over what had, we had already developed and then began to move it on the floor. And then that's when we got four times, that's again goes back to the, the legislative strategy you consult with, you know, where the president is, the Democratic leadership, the committee chairman, which I was acting on. Really only, but remember, my authority there was Chris was the acting chairman. My authority to rule the roost on that was on Lily, and we then moved the bill 
and uh, I could go through all the ins and outs, but I just talked about, you know, Kay Bailey offering alternatives, uh, amendments. But again, that's where we tried to establish the zone of civility. Alas, it held among the women, but it didn't hold within the Senate. But at the end of the day, we did pass Lilly in the Senate and in the House. It became the very first bill signed by President Obama. And I was there. There's the, it was just a very momentous moment. But that just opened the courthouse door. Then that goes to paycheck fairness. And we could not get that moved primarily because we wanted women to steal, to really have access to compensation and to be able to go to court. The minute you mentioned trial lawyer, the Republicans shut down. You say trial lawyer is going to be involved and they say, oh, it's full employment for trial lawyers. Well, better that than impeachment lawyers. But um, anyway, I, 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 don't let me get snarky. We're zone of civility here. Um, but that's how it really got done. But the reason we've never could move on paycheck fairness was over uh, the, the fact that women would have access to su suing for uh, uh, compensation. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. And, and well, what did you think like about that drama? So you see how the committee process is important. We've been working on Lilly as a committee with Senator Kennedy, um, the women, you know, of the Senate working on this, certainly the Democratic women with him. Um, Hillary had taken the lead and then she went off to be Secretary of State. Uh, you know, there are a lot of Senator Kennedy gets sick, but you see how we didn't miss a beat. And again, we go back to the committee process. Senator Dodd functioned as acting chair, was taking over the health care. I took Lily. Senator Harkin was working on health care uh, with Senator Kennedy. Those two guys were taking the lead. So you see how the committee process worked while we were in full communication with the president and full communication with the Democratic leadership in my caucus. Thanks a lot. That's that's extremely uh, helpful. It looks like Steve Smith is is up next with a, a question for you. Yeah, time is going. I mean, each one of yeah. these case examples. <laughs> Hey, Steve. Hi. Thanks, Senator, for being with us today. It, you came into the Senate uh, when uh, Senators Byrd and Stevens were taking turns being chair. and uh, But those were years in which most of the regular appropriation bills uh, were considered and taken up in the Senate and, and enacted. Uh, of course, in, in recent Congresses over the last decade or so, um, uh, that whole process has has fallen apart and we've fallen back on CRs and, and omnibus bills. Uh, has that uh, change radically uh, altered how, how much real negotiation uh, among senators on appropriations takes place? Uh, I'm guessing that it has. Senator DeShelby, for example, this year announced way back in May that there would be no regular appropriations bills considered before the elections. Uh, and, and, and so what, what has that meant for the role of an appropriator uh, in, in the Senate and the importance of, of the kinds of negotiations you've now just described uh, at the committee level in such great detail? Well, first of all, under the age of Byrd and Stevenson and, um, and their predecessors, we followed something called the regular order. And what the regular order meant was we followed the rules that were given to us, which is the fiscal year begins October 1st, and you're supposed to pass the funding bills by October 1st. So they drove the train to always meet that October 1st deadline. Now there are 13 subcommittees in appropriations. Each one comes up almost as a full committee bill or you would do a mini bus and cluster them and so on. See, once again, that strategy and tactics that usually was determined by the chair. However, politics being what it is, particularly with the Gingrich revolution, uh, that was all thrown up in the air. So regular order went by the wayside. The power, I think, of the committee chairmen 
was diminished. More power went to uh, the the leader, whether it was the majority leader of the Senate. Um, though Senator Daschle uh, did things differently. He established like a kitchen cabinet of the author. I won't go into that. It'll be, we'll be teaching the course here. But um, I believe that if, again, the old days, because they followed the regular order, the subcommittees were to resolve as much differences as they could. So the power was with the committee chairman who empowered the subcommittee chairman uh, on appropriations. And we were talking all of the time. And we also built camaraderie between the staffs. So for example, one of the things that I did, uh, and even before I was chair, um, People love the Orioles, or at least now, we, of course, we love the way they came back this season. But um, I would be able to have them invite them just to a ball game. House, you know, I mean, Republicans and Democrats, they would come over. We'd have fun one evening and just laugh and cheer for the team. Um, there were when governors, both Republican and Democrat, Bobby Ehrlich, Martin O'Malley, uh, we would have a day on the bay for staff where we would take them out, we'd show them the Port of Baltimore, the Bay. Of course, I brought cabinet people like Christy Todd Whitman, as well as Democrats. But you see, you encourage the relationship so that regardless of what party was in power, the staff had some social glue, not back slapping and horse trading and whatever, social glue of camaraderie, conversation, candor. Can you do this? My boss wants this. Oh my God, Harry Reid will have a fit if we don't do that. Okay, so, or Mitch McConnell. I mean, it, it was a, more of that kind of give and take. And I think now it has gotten so testy and prickly, those kinds of encouragements. You know, when we passed our bill, you know, Senator Shelby and I had a, a pizza party. You know, we invited our staffs. We had a great time together. You know, uh, you know, it was the pepperoni caucus at that time. I mean, we just had a good time only because we were proud of the fact that we got our work done and we did it with honor and integrity and nobody capitulated in principle. So you see, it's all of this and it has to go on though in a steady way. Building relationships is not an event, it is a process. Senator, uh, Wendy has a question. That'll be the last question. And um, Already? <laughs> yeah, we're already at quarter of one, if you can believe it. <laughs> Wendy, do you have a question? I do. Um, Senator Mikulski, you talked a lot about the nature of uh, senators, female senators, and how you encourage a particular kind of negotiation and style and camaraderie and civility. Um, if you were advising in 2022, particularly the midterms, let's just say, and you think about uh, a female senator like, you know, Karen, uh, Cortez Masto in Nevada, you know, can you think about the ways that this polarization has changed the freedom or flexibility of female senators to be engaged the way that they were maybe 10 or 20 years ago? Um, maybe the primary system or even ranked choice voting for Lisa Murkowski. Do they have the same flexibility to adopt a style that is different from their male colleagues? No, I think the parties dominate now. Uh, and again, back in the day, and I don't want to make it sound like the golden age, but it was a different age, was that we didn't campaign against each other. Like I wouldn't come in and campaign against a Republican senator, um, you know, there. And so there was a pretty robust campaign against Sue Collins. Um, I, we don't have to go down the list. Uh, people then went against uh, Debbie Stabenow. Um, and so we would not have done that. In other words, we believed in campaigns. We believe in the contest of two parties, et cetera. But, um, it's, we, we kind of like took ourselves out of that a little bit. And I think that adds to the prickliness, but the nature of the Republican party has changed. And I don't have to elaborate on that. It's in the news. And I think that 
uh, has affected a lot of things. And that's why I think they often have moved to this quote, gang approach in the Senate, you know, so that they would have a chance to go to each other, but they are less hindered by top-down political mandates coming from either the Democratic leader or the Republican leader. And I remember a time when we were, we were in a shutdown. It was led by, the shutdown was really being led by Ted Cruz, uh, who I won't elaborate on. But uh, Senator Collins came to the floor, and I have a superb relationship with Senator Collins and, and an esteemed relationship. Um, don't always like some of her votes, but nevertheless. Um, and she told me, she went to the floor and said that they had a group that was meeting and that they were putting this forward and uh, some ideas forward and that could perhaps break the log jam. And I was on the floor chairing uh, and I said to Senator Collins, get started. If you have uh, right now out of everything you said, I think I only agree with three. But what I agree with is that you're trying and that you have a bipartisan group that wants to come to us to talk about ideas for breaking the law jam. Go for it. So I was encouraging an outside process to be able to come back to the regular order process. But I did it based on trust, respect. I knew the parties involved and so on. So you see how now going outside of the process is more effective than others. I'll tell you the other thing, and um, this is where I really disagreed with President Obama and the people who got elected with him in 2006. President Obama did not like earmarks. I loved earmarks. Uh, <laughs> it enabled me to help many things in my state um, because I have so many of the federal labs, et cetera, but the Chesapeake Bay, I won't go through my list. Um, and it was often small things. Like I remember a con very conservative Western Senator who came to me and said that he wanted a earmark. This is when we still had them. And his Republican, counter his Republican chair said, go talk to Barbara. Um, it was gonna be about a community center on an Indian reservation. He said, what do you think? I said, I said, well, if you think it's a good idea and the people who are most affected in that community think it's a good idea and it's not gonna be named after you, uh, then let's see. He said, because it would bring so much, it'd be like a settlement house on, on the reservation. So we, we worked on that. So, but it created some goodwill. He could also brag how he was helping. Yes, he bragged. I didn't care about that. What we cared about was not, not the secret ones, not the lavish ones, not the bridge to nowhere ones. But I do think the demise of earmarks, and I do know that um, uh, as Senator Shelby and Senator Leahy go to their next chapter in life, um, that um, they help bring that back. I think that should help the process because it means every Senator has got a little skin in the game. Uh, and by the way, just as we wrap this up, on Tuesday night, I'm going to the retirement dinner of Senator Shelby, and I'm going with affection, admiration, appreciation, um, hope they have a little bit of that Alabama barbecue that I came to like when he would do some of the staff binding that we, bonding that we had, you know, we found, we found that food often just helped sometimes, not only like the Senate women's dinners, but even like with the staff, let's get pizza. Let's, you know, we'll tr the chair and the ranking will, you know, just treat to, to Chinese. And um, maybe we can't get nuclear treaties with the Chinese or whatever, but maybe we could have Chinese food. So you see, but it was to just, just smooth it out a little bit, just have conversation. Does that help? Is that different than the yes. textbook? Yes, yeah, yes. And I'm teaching Congress next week. So very helpful. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so let me go to the pantsuit. 
So uh. when I came to the Senate, you know, women were just really starting to wear pantsuits and, and so on. And I'm short and I'm chunky. And like I just wear slacks because like if I tour Maryland uh, and I'd go to a lab or a military base and be getting in an SUV, you know, skirts really didn't work for me. So I became kind of, you know, pantsuit type person. But the Senate had kind of like this dress code and Senator Byrd was the keeper of it. My chairman in appropriations and someone who was being a mentor, very welcoming mentor. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to wear slacks and one day it's going to be cold as hell. And I don't want to go in trying to think, it's when women still wore stockings with seams. Can you believe this? I feel like I'm talking about not only the other ages, but the dark ages. So I knew I went to the parliamentarian. First, I went to the historian in the Senate. I said, is there any prohibition? No. I went to the parliamentarian. They said, not literally, because before men had to wear like dark suits and so on. We've made exceptions like Ben Nighthorse Campbell didn't have to wear a tie. He could wear his string thing and representative of indigenous people. So no, there's no prohibition. And then in keeping with conversation and nothing about you without you, I alerted the bird staff. I didn't go to Senator Bird. I alerted the bird staff that one day when it was going to be cold or rainy or whatever, I was going to walk on that floor. Okay. Okay, we'll tell the boss. We'll go the boss. Tell us today, though. So one Saturday, we were in session. It's always those weird things like Saturday sessions, right, you know, and it was raining and I commute every day from Baltimore, but I wore my nice St. John's knit jacket, pair of black slacks, nice crisp white blouse. We told the bird staff it was going to happen. I told George Mitchell that it was going to happen. And I walked on. Well, there was more staff on the floor that day than I think I've seen at a New Year's Eve party. But I walked on and Senator Byrd was there presiding because it was appropriations. And I sat down and, you know, I walked over and I said, good morning, Senator Byrd. He said, good morning, Senator Norkowski. Why don't you just take your seat? And if you want to speak, let me know. And, and that was it. So I felt like the astronaut who says, one small step, you know, for mankind, one great step for whatever history. So that's how that, and then of course, my very able, able ally, Carol Moose Braun, joined me and others joined it. And that's how we had the pantsuit revolution. And of course, once Hillary came, I, I would never do the headband route, but uh, once Hillary came, it kind of became, you know, emblazoned in, in, in the Senate. Well, just a humorous but you see what I mean about communication, conversation, checking with people. I did see if there was a rule of the Senate, because the Senate has more arcane rules. Um, and sometimes they work for you and sometimes they don't. Anyway, does that cover it? Uh, I think it does. I I think so. And we want to thank you so much for being part of our conference today and our keynote speaker. For all the scholars here today, you touched on a lot of things that relate to some of the things they're studying. And I hope we'll have the chance to work together again in the future. We're really appreciative of well, your Well, I would look forward to it. I think you have an excellent program. Uh, and I think you're really helping build the pipe, pipeline of future staffers. And if we can, even if we can go back to a time of a zone of civility, a zone of civility and following a regular order, I think democracy would be well served. Thank you. Thank you. Agree with that. And we're working on it. <laughs> so we meet again. Yes, absolutely. Take care, Senator. Bye now. Thank you. Okay, so thanks. I think that we can, you know, given that that ran over a little bit, we can get away with um, pausing for five minutes uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that people, you know, can can take care of things they may need to take care of. Uh, and we'll plan on starting again at, at 105 when Nadia, Chris, and Anna 
uh, will begin their presentation. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.
All right, it is 105, uh, and so we had better go ahead and, and get started again to stay on schedule. And so now we are going to hear from Nadia Brown, Christopher Clark, and Anna Mahoney on collective representation negotiated by Black women legislators. I'm not sure uh, who is gonna gonna start off, but I see all of you have your cameras on now, and so I'll just uh, mute myself and and let y'all to it. All right, Nadia is going to pull up our slides, I believe. Yeah, that's my job. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for having us. The caucus kids are back. Uh, so uh, Nadia and Chris and I are excited to um, share with you the um, project that we've been working on um, regarding uh, how caucuses and their members play a role in legislative negotiation. And so we really appreciate Bettina and, and David's uh, assistance in trying to get us some interviews with members of Congress. We've reached out to our friends at the Center for American Women in Politics and and we have come, we keep running into some, some barriers as far as um, getting access. Um, so we're gonna share with you today um, some work that we've done in the Maryland State House. Um, and uh, it actually ties in um, quite, a, quite a bit with the congressional uh, caucuses as well. As you can see here on our first slide, we have um, an interview with a state senator in Maryland who, um, really references back to this uh, mantra of the Congressional Black Caucus in saying that there are no permanent friends or permanent enemies down here in Annapolis because the important thing is we need to understand and every once in a while I have to remind people that the agenda for us down here is much bigger than all of us. And so she's not just hearkening back um, to um, the Congressional Black Caucus and the way they sort of establish themselves within the larger institution, uh, but she's also reminding herself and her colleagues and Mary Maryland, um, that despite being united in some of these organizations, um, uh, the agenda and the substantive representation that they want to do for folks um, is, um, you know, going to be a product of negotiation and compromise among themselves and their differences. So um, as we've talked about uh, with this group before and continue to take our show constantly on the road, um, we see caucuses um, as these organizations within institutions that harness collective political power. Um, and we're particularly interested in identity uh, and constituency-based caucuses, which are organized around a particular personal characteristic. So that might be race, it might be gender. Um, but in the case of the Congressional Black Caucus, for example, although they are united um, under this um, same uh, uh, shared racial identity, um, the members themselves vary within the organization as far as gender goes, um, as far as who their constituencies are, um, and the pressures from them, their age, um, their status within the institution, you know, both their, their actual age, but also um, their tenure, um, and sometimes their political ideology. So while they may um, share some long-term goals, um, they may differ in their strategies and how they want to pursue this, um, as well as some of the details of these plans. And so we began um, this project really interested in how Black women navigate being members of multiple caucuses as a consequence of their intersectional identity. Um, but as we're getting more into the project, we're also seeing how negotiation happens within these collective shared spaces. So the research questions motivating um, our, our current project um, are what role um, identity-based caucuses play in negotiation and how do members of caucuses work out their differences and build consensus around an agenda uh, as well as a strategy to achieve it. So um, as you all know, um, caucuses can be organized around particular political policy issues or around these shared identities, um, but uh, those caucuses are specifically spaces that are created so that the members um, can work out um, how they're gonna accomplish their shared goals um, within a private space, which um, sort of gets to some of the, the principles of um, negotiation on that next slide. So um, in the, the wonderful um, political negotiation a handbook, um, uh, there are the, uh, the characteristics of what um, really facilitates good negotiation. 
And we see um, caucuses in particular um, continuing to provide really two of these key points. One is the capacity to forge informal and ongoing personal relationships. And this is definitely something Nadia is going to talk about later that really emerged from our interviews um, from Black women in the Maryland uh, State Legislature, that these caucuses are places that facilitate relationship building, which of course is very important capital within legislative institutions. And then finally, the capacity to negotiate in private. These are spaces that are particularly organized um, for people who share a particular characteristic um, within um, predominantly white and male institutions. And so these caucuses are a place where people who are perhaps um, assumed to have all of the same positions and ideas um, can actually work out their differences within a, that, that private safe space. And so that's um, a lot of what we're going to be taking a look at um, with the interviews today. So I will turn it over to you, Nadia, and you can talk about uh, the work that we've been doing. Sure. So, <clears throat> sorry. So thank you. Thank you, Anna, um, and also to David and Bettina for this opportunity. So I'll, um, I'll take up the back half of the paper now. So this spring, um, or last spring, I guess, uh, in March of 2022, we conducted 10 in-depth Stummy semi-structured interviews that were open-ended with Black women legislators in Maryland via Zoom. So it's also important to note, right, that these um, these interviews did not take place in person because of the coronavirus. Um, and although I'm now at Georgetown and in close proximity to the Maryland State Legislature, all of the legislators felt more comfortable convening via Zoom. The way that we conducted these interviews were that I would be the interviewee. Anna was on for tech support and kind of, you know, just making sure that all the things ran the way they should on Zoom. But the legislators saw me, another Black woman, asking questions, right? And they did not see Anna. We even, Anna um, was introduced as Anna M and not Anna Mahoney as any way to kind of um, allude to there might be someone of a different racialized background to, um, on the call. And so this way, right, we were trying to really elicit this really um, in-depth sister speak where a Black woman legislator felt free to talk about the experiences of being a Black woman legislator with another Black woman. Although I'm not a legislator, right, but I share similar cultural um, background to legislators that would make them um, more likely to share information with me than they would have Anna or Chris. So we chose the case study um, Maryland for a couple of reasons. One, Maryland has um, the oldest women's caucus, functioning women's caucus in the United States. It also has one of the largest and most effective Black caucuses in the United States. When we started this project, or this actually this year, 2022, is the 50th anniversary of the Maryland Women's um, Caucus. The legislature is a very diverse legislature. Um, Maryland itself is 31% Black. The Black, um, there's almost 80 members, 80 Black people in the um, legislative um, Maryland legislature. And there is a large number of, of women as well. The legislative structure is set up in a way that really is conducive to having more diversity. So the Maryland state legislature is made up of um, multi-member districts, which allows one district to share a same uh, number of three delegates and one senator per each district. And again, right, the caucuses have had a long um, history of stability. Um, and we'll come, kind of come back to this in a bit because <laughs> we kind of had a national experiment during, um, during the collection of the data for this project where the Women's Caucus in some ways just became defunct and in some ways because the Republican women walked out. So I'm happy to talk um, about this during Q&A and so we'll be Chris and Anna. So these are some of the larger themes that we observed in, um, in these short 10 interviews. The plan is to go back and conduct more interviews, um, but, we, but we are very grateful for the initial 10 interviews that kind of gave us, I think a really good working insight into how black women legislators are thinking about becoming, or thinking about being members of single uh, issue caucuses and how their own identities as intersectional beings really impacts the work that they do within these caucuses. 
And so this is just an overview of all of the themes that um, that we found throughout the interviews. And I'm gonna highlight four in particular in um, the next couple of slides. So the first is that there's heterogeneity and that complicates consensus building. Bipartisanship is a barrier. I'll talk about these two. Um, one we heard over and over again is that because there's such a large number of black legislators in the majority party, that there is a greater amount of political power that the black caucus has vis-a-vis -vis every other caucus in the Maryland state legislature. And really right, black women find themselves overburdened. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide um, with their legislative responsibilities because of their dual identities. They really like caucuses for building and maintaining relationships, but mentioned that in the era of COVID, um, meeting via Zoom really loses some things. And they are aware of some trade-offs, right? Like, so now more people are able to attend things via Zoom and maybe able to connect in ways they couldn't if they were always in person, but not being in person, right, really um, kind of misses that interpersonal connections that we've been talking about in other paper presentations earlier this morning. And then the last, um, the last slide I'll talk to you about is that these current caucuses structures are not set up to be intersectional. So these, um, and I just as an aside, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, we've given all of the women pseudonyms to protect them um, and to protect their anonymity. So, um, so what you see here are not the actual names of the legislators themselves. So this first quote is from um, a legislator that we've named Patricia Quigley, and she shares. Um, but you know, with the Black Caucus, we're not a monolith, right? We all have different ideas. I've been to places where you know where you're talking about Black families and Black individuals, and everyone else didn't grow up the same. Everyone Black didn't grow up on welfare, so we have very different perspectives. Likewise, uh, Representative Rachel Bernstein said, "We are all Black, so we know. So we know we think about things the same way. And if we're going to move this way on legislation, for example, but it's like, oh, we don't, right?" Depending on what jurisdiction you're from, your black is different and there is, than they are from a different jurisdiction. So it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, there are fluent black individuals and then you got some elsewhere that's like, oh, you were where we get more working class, lower class individuals in my district. And I think that's okay. But I wanted that legislation to the black caucus. There's heterogeneity in black life and experiences. So both of these quotes, I think, gave us some real interesting um, understanding in a state like Maryland, which is 31% Black, and there are different issues. So what we found was that legislators that were from um, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, had different views of legislators that were from Baltimore County or Baltimore City. And the ways in which the legislators were talking about what is a Black issue? Who are we trying to help? What are the kind of topics that our constituents are interested in? It reflected their districts and their constituents, but it also reflected them, right? And so legislators were also um, keen to talk about their own backgrounds as a business owner, as highly educated, earning a PhD, and that they didn't relate to some of the issues that other Black people, most likely in instance, referring to Baltimore City. Oh. This next um, slide is about challenges with the Women's Caucus. And again, happy to talk about how the Republican women have left this caucus. So this first, uh, this first quote comes from Representative Shayla, Shayla Hillsborough. And she says, the caucuses work together on certain issues when it's particular importance, and we've been good at supporting one another, for example, at like the Black Caucus. And I believe so, but the unique outlier in each of those is the Women's Caucus, which is designed to encourage bipartisan participation. So the Women's Caucus will either have a member of the majority party or the minority party as a chair, and the decisions are based on the collaborative, the collaboration that exists. We're looking for things that you're able to get bipartisan support, and in the area of women's rights, there are a lot of things, oddly enough, not a critical mass or consensus. For example, looking at things like fair wages for women, uh, sometimes there's not a consensus on what the best direction is to go in. Looking at things like women's health care in particular, uh, reproductive rights, you know, there's clearly not a consensus issue there. So we try to find areas that we can collaborate. And I'll just note here that this interview was conducted before the Dobbs decision was handed down or even leaked. Um, and so we were already kind of seeing these kind of challenges or issues within the Maryland state legislature and how women were finding it difficult to work with one another because of partisan basis. This last quote comes from Representative Kalisha Tolbert and she says, 
You know, with the Women's Caucus, obviously I'm a woman. So it's important to be part of those conversations as well as a partisan group. And so you have women who are Republicans and Democrats. So we might not necessarily agree on the majority of these issues, but you can agree on some that are important to women. And you know, some for me, I think, identify with them in different ways. Of course, seeing it's hard to really look at which one identifies most with my values, which most um, with most of what I do. But if I mean, if I had to choose, I probably would say the Black Caucus. Bipartisan Women's Caucus, man, it's hard to get things done. I identify with the Black Caucus, I identify the most with the Black Caucus. And so part of this, right, is really um, identify with the Black Caucus because it's not necessarily a partisan um, caucus. The majority of the members of the Black Caucus in Maryland are Black. There is one Republican member of the Black Caucus. But the issues of trying to get things passed as a woman is much different when they don't have an eye-to-eye -eye agreement on what a women's issue is. And this other quote is from Senator Marcella Worthing. Now, this is a pseudonym again, but it's um, important to note that this woman is the highest ranking Black LGBTQ member of any state legislature and um, in, the, in the United States. And she has been doing this kind of advocacy, advocacy work as an out Black lesbian for decades. So um, I was really excited to interview her again and to do this follow-up study. And she just kind of came out the bat when we asked her this question about like, how was it serving in these caucuses? And she said, well, I just feel that there's a lack of really understanding issues that are based on either the race or gender or willingness to look at intersectionality. And also I'm out. I'm only one of two out legislators. And so the kind of low key, sometimes not low key homophobia in both caucuses, well, not so much the women's caucuses, but they're more Republican in the women's caucus. So there is, you know, some explicit homophobia. And then just sometimes it's just interesting because it seems like the larger the group gets, the less cohesive. An anecdotal observation is that it's just a few of you and you're just fighting for the basic, you know, rights. There's an assumption that you can all agree on a lot of policy things, but as the group gets larger and larger, it's really clear that you don't. And so calls to the blacks or blackness or calls to womanless, womanliness, has very different meanings for different people. Both the Black Caucus and the Women's Caucus do not look at intersectional issues. And so we hope to do a follow-up interview with Senator Worthing. Um, and she was happy and is happy to, to meet with us again, but really getting this deep understanding of the pushback that she uniquely faces as an out lesbian uh, Black woman in this legislature. And this last quote, um, you know, is just about basic time management and that Black women in the legislature face this double minority tax. And so this is what Representative Talia um, Henderson said to us. It's very difficult time from time management standpoint to be active in a group that the Women's Caucus, for example. I belong to two counties. And so those kind of delegation caucuses meet on Fridays. And, you know, the caucuses support different agenda options. And in the House, we'll try to engage in public outreach component of all of the caucuses. Although I don't generally, although I don't generally don't participate in the outreach of any of the caucuses as much as I would like to. You can't serve on all the caucus, <laughs> caucuses. It's a time management issue. One that prohibits one from being involved. And several legislators shared this, right? That they were pulled to, to their... Um, Democratic caucus, their affinity group caucuses, the single issue, um, single identity group caucuses like the Black Caucus. In Maryland, many, many, many are members of the Latino caucus as well, and the Women's Caucus. And there's just not enough time in the day. And so this looks a lot different, right, if you don't belong to one of these identity-based caucuses and you have the opportunities to split your time doing other things. And what, what um, Representative Henderson said is like, really this time, you can't split yourself. And several other women mentioned this in, in our interview. So to conclude, right, um, part of this larger project, this book project, we're still interested in securing interviews with the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus for Women and Girls to figure out, right, what is the push or pull that moves Black women from just, um, as 
from just exploring the legislative agenda in either the Women's Caucus or the Black Caucus? And when is there this need to kind of separate and form your own? In Maryland, it's unique because the Speaker of the House is a Black woman. And many of the women that we spoke with told us there was no need to have a Black Women's and Girls Caucus in Maryland because the Speaker is a woman and she's already putting a lot of issues of interest to Black women and girls on the agenda. Um, but in places where Black women don't have power, right, what does this look like? So we're interested in kind of seeing this. Um, and we want to kind of, again, like figure out how people's identities are and their relationships with one another are mediated on their policy preferences, their different kind of affinity groups and the roles that caucuses play. So I hope I'm not out of time. We'll stop there and open it up to questions, feedback, wholehearted disagreements. Maybe none. <laughs> Hi, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, maybe uh, I, I was uh, uh, interested in, in your comment um, about uh, the Republican women walking out uh, and said that uh, you might have a minute to say more about that in the Q&A. So why don't we start with that? Yeah, no, this is this was a surprise to all of us um, while we were collecting this research. Um, so what happened? So there's an informal um, agreement, nothing that's written down in the constitute in the in the in the caucuses bylaws, but that every three years the president will then become a member. They'll switch. You know, the parties will switch presidents. And there are, um, again, informal regulations or rules that the sitting vice president, who is usually a member of the Republican Party, if it's on that third year, will then ascend to the presidency. Well, the members of the, the Democratic women thought that they weren't going to get anything done with this Republican woman and that they had lived through other years of Republican as president and really stymieing the advancing of policy issues in the Women's Caucus. And so they ran a Democratic woman from the floor and she won. The Republican women said that this violated the norms, um, it violated their opportunities to push their agenda and work within the Women's Caucus and they resigned. So at one point, we initially thought that the caucus was just going to disband because there was only now a one party caucus. But the caucus is still operating, but basically in effect, like just a Democratic Women's Caucus. There is no word from the Republicans about when they will join again or you know, what's their, their next step. So we can't say in any foreseeable future um, you know, what's going to happen. After this woman's term, will they then move back to the same rules? Will they form something new? I mean, like this is something we don't know. Okay, thanks. I uh, I have a, a couple of things. I'll I'll just start with um, with one more, which is a a big picture type of question that that you can't answer uh, in relation to the to the work that y'all have done, but but you might have thought about it um, in in relation to some of that work and and can maybe speculate as to, as to what y'all think. You know, uh, I think we all observe how in in recent years. Um, you know, both at the level of the, the mass public and in, increasingly uh, in Congress. Uh, I don't know the extent to which this is true in state legislatures. I, I, I would guess it probably is, but it, it is definitely becoming the case in, 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 the, in the House and the Senate that, um, you know, the, uh, the partisan gender gap uh, is growing, right? Um, uh, whereas the, the, the partisan racial gap is shrinking, Right, um, you, you've got sort of like more Republican people of color uh, than than you did uh, just a few years ago, and uh, and uh, um, whereas you know, maybe fewer um, uh, women uh, re Republicans. Uh, I mean, that's not true in 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 the Senate and the House, but it's true in the mass public. Anyway, uh, my question is is how you could imagine these changes, right? These shifts of, of a growing gender gap um, and a, and a shrinking. Uh, slightly anyway, uh, racial gap affecting these sort of caucus dynamics and, and the intersectionality within them and, and the ability for people to, to forge coalitions and, and find ways to, you know, advance some kind of a, of a common agenda with those changes uh, taking place. Does that even about? make sense? Does it does. Have... It does. Okay. I, think I, can, I can tackle this or do you want to others jump in? 
I was just going to say Ringe and Victor, uh, in their book about uh, the networks and caucuses, they talk about how during times of increased polarization, if it causes gridlock, gridlock within the institution, that we might see actually a proliferation of these groups to try and mm -hmm. ameliorate that and to work around that. Um, but I think, um, you know, certainly what we have seen with um, women's caucuses, you know, when women were more closely um, aligned on ideology in the 80s and 90s, there were more women's caucuses, they were more bipartisan, um, and as Republican women became um, uh, more conservative, those, you know, ties sort of frayed. So um, I, I think, um, like Nadia was saying, um, it's sort of, we're, we're not sure what's going to happen, but certainly these are challenges to these kinds of organizations. And also what they choose as their priorities, right? Are you working on women's status within the institution or are you trying to work on substantive policy issues? Yeah, and I mean, and I, I would add that some of this we kind of, we saw, we are seeing in the data is that as the caucuses are growing, and even in terms of like partisan gap or gender or racial gap, but there's just more diversity of thought and experience. And I do wonder, right, like what the effectiveness of these caucuses will be once it's just much more of an explosion of, of different identities. Um, and, and kind of, I think it would kind of mirror what we see in public, right? So thinking about, um, Ishmael White and Cheryl Laird's uh, Steadfast Democrats, where right, they try to figure out like what's that push and pull that keeps Black folks particularly in line with the Democratic Party. And it's really these social forces, their institutions, networks, and communities that even if they are conservative, they, they have Republican-leaning ideologies, right, that they are pulled back in or they're, they're kind of um, pushed into line by Black social um, forces such as culture, institutions, networks. And I think there might be a split of people who see themselves on paper, right, as Democrats because of what this means in Black communities, but is much more like a Jim Clyburn, right? Like as someone who is, is like this blue dog. So there might be these, you know, splits. And what we saw in the data with it, that's we're splitting not just down, um, you know, regions where, you know, where they were from, but really around generation. And so I am like enthralled to see what's going to happen when there are more yeah. millennials and Gen Zs that get elected. And even, because um, we're seeing this now, um, oh gosh, what is the generation right above us? I can't think. Um, I'm Gen X. Yeah, the Xers, X? sorry. Come on. <laughs> How can you do it? we always get forgotten? We always get yeah, that's forgotten. The reason, that's the reason we're called X, right? Anyway. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but you guys are doing good work in the legislature. <laughs> oh, I'm a geriatric millennial, so um, yeah, at least you guys don't have that title. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, so they're I mean they're already pushing back on some of these these boomers in ways that I think are extremely like smart and telling and different than what the literature says how identity politics work and how they are operationalizing their actions and still paying deference to the old timers right um in ways of like I understand that you've laid the groundwork for us and that you were doing the best you can with the tools in which you were given but I have these other ideas right I have these you know these more innovative ways and one of the ways that um, the younger members talked about really frequently is joining the Latino caucus and these are black women who um, pay to be members of a Latino caucus because they want to be able to find coalitional support between the black caucus and the Latino caucus to move policy through. The Latino caucus in Maryland is a very small numbers, but it's enough numbers if you can get the right kind of more progressive people in the black caucus to join with the Latino caucus members. They don't need those kind of older um, boomers to get on board with issues that they're seeing as really intersectional. For example, um, um, thinking about large numbers of undocumented Black immigrants um, in the United States, right? And so the older members of the Black caucus are thinking about immigration as silly and Hispanic issue. And what the younger members are saying, you know, there's a large number of Jamaicans in my district, um, people from Panama, and you know, who, who are coming here undocumented and need to find employment or that the, the CARES Act should be able to apply to them, which it does now here in Maryland, right? And the older members are just like, this isn't something that I'm interested in, right? So I'm, I'm just, I'm interested in what this next generation will do. Thank you. Uh, I think 
Yeah, Wendy Schiller has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, Translating between all sorts of technology. So this is a terrific project. And I <clears throat> I also hearken back, obviously, to your 2014 book, when you have a, a, a long chapter about um, uh, Black women and Black men and domestic violence legislation. So it makes me think about, again, and I, I did this a little bit with Matthew Green's project, you know, the, the issue area that you're talking about, like you just mentioned immigration and undocumented. And do you see sort of bigger cleavages potentially either amongst women or generationally or self-constructed race or self-constructed ethnicity based on the actual issue area that you're thinking about? And I wonder how you're developing that and how you're thinking about measuring that. Yes, well, another one that came out were um, women who are primarily women who are working in the field of healthcare. And so thinking about like LPNs or people that are coming into people's homes to do healthcare or kind of care work, particularly now during um, during COVID or when it's, you know, child care shortages, elder care shortages. And a lot of these women are um, low income women of color. And it's so interesting that the younger women were bringing this up as something they were trying to get both the Women's Caucus and the Black Caucus on board with, but neither one of them wanted to touch it. And part of it, well, the Women's Caucus ended up doing it, and that came in through the back door. But the Black Caucus, um, according to some women, were much more focused on like respectability politics issues. So what are things that we could do for business owners? You know, how are we trying to get some of this CARES Act money to, you know, to, to really support Black businesses that are failing? without thinking about low income wage earners who are doing this work that they don't want, people don't want to do. And the way that it got through the Women's Caucus was one of um, a legislator, the first black woman legislator in Anne Arundel County, which is a, a more uh, predominantly white uh, county, worked with her co-district member delegate who was a white woman to get the Women's Caucus to buy into this. Now, when the black woman was telling this to the Women's Caucus, they were like, this is not really an issue that we wanna get behind, right? It's like, this is a labor issue. And they really didn't see this as something that impacted the groups that they saw themselves more closely aligned to, right? Because this was a very low income, again, black and brown women who were performing these, these service duties. And that's how the Women's Caucus came aboard because the white woman then introduced the bill that her co-delegate, you know, brought up. And it was really like these, these policy issues that like sex trafficking came up as, as one of the things that, um, that the women were concerned about that no one else were talking about, right? Like th this is again, like the importance of having people from different demographics at the table is that they bring these issues up that other other people aren't talking about. But the part that the women were saying were really these intersectional issues, right? These are low income, these are low wage earners, right? Um, this is, I mean, a particular segment of these women, let me be clear, right? Like it wasn't everyone. Um, so those are some of the policy issues that we're, we're thinking through. And our plan is to write a chapter. So we have a chapter that's like just the process, like, ooh, there's some interesting things, like how are you working in the caucuses, like the institutional side? And then the other side, it's like the policies. So what are some things that you are advocating for? What are the avenues that you're using to advance those? Um, and so, yeah, we see those going in those two directions. And Jamil brought up Nadia Marijuana too, which I don't think came up in our interviews, but would be a really interesting one, especially right now. Yeah, I think to go back and do do more of these interviews. Yeah, so we we did these interviews in March, and so while people marijuana came up as a as an issue in the Black Caucus, not in the Women's Caucus. Um, or so the issue was um, basically boomers who were seeing marijuana as this gateway drug, and if you were going to um, open up or legalize it, that it was going to move back into this downfall spiral of like social disintegration. Um, and then we just don't want the smell of smoke. We don't want to think about people smoking and it's a drug. And kind of like, you know, the ways that we had previously thought as a society about marijuana. And then the younger group were saying how this is not an issue that the Black Caucus is ready to tackle because of these interfactions. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a gendered issue. Here was much more, I think, of like a older generation, younger generation, respectability politics, those who were like, let's rethink this. Um, but I and we just happened to just be talking to women. So I do wonder, right, if we if you know, if we do talk to black men, will we find the same generational differences? You know, I, I don't know. Thanks, Jamil. 
All right. All right. Oh, it looks like Steve Smith uh, has a question too. So <clears throat> up on in, Steve. Well, let me just bring the subject of caucuses back to the table of legislative negotiation for a moment. Um, uh, uh, Nadia, I think you, you've been emphasizing uh, building organizational strength uh, uh, within a caucus and maybe coalition building across caucuses um, and uh, tactical decisions about issue agendas and common interests and so on that are associated with that, all of which seems to focus on increasing bargaining uh, power. Um, uh, which is a lot different, uh, but related to uh, legislative negotiation. Uh, in your interviews, um, is, is there much focus uh, on, on developing better negotiation uh, skills or tactics uh, in uh, pursuing uh, a legislative agenda that may not have at least initially majority support? Um, uh, which, which is um, you know, related to bargaining strength, organizational strength, coalition size, but it goes beyond that. Uh, what yeah. can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, and, I, and I appreciate the, the, the specificity of that question because right, most of what the legislators did, they talked about were like bargaining and how they used their identities to get their policy preferences passed or right, and how they work with the caucuses to do that. When the one interview that comes directly to mind about how a, um, a legislator negotiates, she referred back to relationships and that she, because of her status, as a longtime member in the Black in the Maryland legislature and a leader in the Black Caucus at one point, she has built a lot of goodwill and people have a lot of respect for her. And because of that, right, things get done. But it seemed to be much more like these personal relationships and not necessarily like here's a tactic of right how you could be a better negotiator. It was how to talk to people um, or how to garner respect from people. And to be honest, right, her respect necessarily wasn't um what she's done right people didn't say that it was more of like she's been here for a long time right we respect her because of her tenure um yes but no but i i appreciate the point i think that is something that we should think about as we refrain um thinking about this project because it is more probably that we're talking about more about bargaining than legislative negotiation at this point all right let's go ahead and and let that be the the end of of it you guys are off the hook now thanks so much that was uh <laughs> Fascinating and enlightening. So we'll go ahead and and uh, make way now for our final presentation of the day by Allison Craig at the University of Texas, uh, Austin. That is um, the Collaborative Congress finding common ground in a polarized house. And uh, Allison, is is that book actually in print now? It is. I am waiting for page proofs. So oh, okay, very close. <laughs> All right. It's my last slide. Is that it? Uh, coming uh, in spring oh, twenty twenty three to bookshelves I near you. It. Whoops! <laughs> it's <Sorry>. fine. <laughs> uh, hold on, let me share. So, uh, great. Uh, so, uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been a long day, so I will um, probably not be brief, but I'm going to throw a lot of information at you <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a project, obviously, that I've been working on for quite some time. Uh, and thank you to uh, David and Bettina for uh, the grant support to help me finish my manuscript, uh, which is now uh, forthcoming at uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, and the book is called The Collaborative Congress, Finding Common Ground in a Polarized House. Uh, 
Uh, and so I've presented, I think a lot of you have seen different pieces of this project before. Uh, and so what I decided to do for this presentation was actually give kind of an overview of the book as a whole and kind of a lot of its key findings from throughout the project, uh, which does mean that there are a lot of cases in which I give you models and then I'm gonna explain a little bit what went into them, but less of the setup <laughs> than you might normally see in an in-depth uh, presentation of one chapter. Um, but I can answer any questions in the Q&A, obviously. Uh, okay, so the Collaborative Congress. Uh, the book, uh, I started the book by talking about uh, the idea that there are really two Congresses. Uh, you know, we think about, uh, we pay a whole lot of attention to this like very partisan con Congress that is, you know, characterized by conflict. Uh, you know, this is the sort of stuff that the media uh, picks up when members of Congress are yelling at each other, uh, as they frequently do, making scenes. Uh, you know, this is what gets a lot of public and scholarly attention is this kind of, you know, partisan polarized Congress. At the same time, members of Congress actually are frequently working together on legislation, and we actually pay a lot less attention to the collaborative Congress. And this is a picture from a dinner of uh, a bunch of members in the Problem Solvers Caucus, actually, who had dinner uh, at, in New York at some point. Um, and I would just like to point out the part of my, this illustrates my point in that this picture was incredibly hard to find <laughs> relative to my ability to find pictures of conflict. We're all over the place, but like trying to find one of members working together was a little more challenging. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite examples of, of this dynamic uh, is actually uh, Rashida Tlaib and Mark Meadows. Uh, so in, you know, 2019, early 2019, uh, they made headlines in Politico and, and all of the, the Hill journals uh, for the fact that they'd gotten into a big fight in a committee hearing uh, in which I want to be careful about the length, how exactly she phrased it, but uh, so Representative Tlaib challenged Mark Meadows because he brought out a, uh, a witness, a uh, person of color as a witness. And so she said that he had engaged in a racist act, that he was not necessarily racist, but he had clearly engaged in a racist act by using this woman uh, as, as a token. And uh, that obviously got a lot of coverage. Fast forward six months and the two members are uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives praising each other and talking about how they worked together to pass this Representative Fraud Pay Prevention Act in which they uh, were protecting you know, senior citizens from basically being defrauded by their um, financial advisors. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the dynamic of the, of the conflict gets a lot of attention, the, you know, collaboration gets a lot less attention. And so this book is really focused predominantly on that uh, collaboration and, and, and working together. Uh, so, what I argue with the Collaborative Congress is again, alongside this partisan conflict that draws all this media attention. Uh, you know, members of Congress are actually working together. Uh, they're working together on substantive policy initiatives, and these substantive policy initiatives actually make up a lot of the day-to-day -day work of the House of Representatives. A lot of the work that's actually being done in Congress is uh, coming from this collaborative uh, Congress. I will say, uh, in you know, deference to the conversation that we've been having so far, that I do not actually distinguish between, uh, you know, negotiation and compromise in these collaborative relationships. Um, I have evidence of both occurring. In some cases, it is much more of a integrative uh, negotiation between members of bundling their legislation together. And in other cases, it's members compromising on language. Um, but I don't have the ability to tease out the two with my data, unfortunately. But yeah, someday. Uh, okay. So thinking about the collaborative Congress. So why do members of Congress collaborate? Uh, well, you know, if you're thinking about this, it fits really well. It actually fits pretty well into the goals of members of Congress, kind of our traditional framework of re-election, uh, institutional advancement, and good public policy. Uh, you know, members of Congress need accomplishments to be re-elected, uh, and collaboration facilitates uh, policymaking. It also serves as a uh, credible signal to, you know, interest groups and activists that a member is actually working pretty hard on an issue. Uh, members of Congress also gain influence through their relationships, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, their, uh, if they're interested in, in institutional advancement, uh, relationships are obviously a very important part of that. Uh, they're also more effective uh, when they have more relationships or stronger relationships. Uh, and then finally, I mean, at the end of the day, lawmaking is a bipartisan effort. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Really, the collaboration facilitates policymaking because you need bipartisan support to enact the vast majority of legislation. 
but why not collaborate then? <laughs> if it's so good, you know, why do members not collaborate? Uh, obviously, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that as well. Uh, you know, partisan competition that we see incentivizes conflict, uh, as we all know. Um, but also there's a lot of variation, you know, across issues and across members. You have some issues that are much more contentious than others, you know, obviously. So I also did a bunch of interviews uh, for this book project and interviewed uh, about 20, 22 uh, senior congressional staffers. Uh, and, you know, several of them actually specifically cited abortion as like the issue that they just didn't even bother. They, they were not even going to bother trying to collaborate on uh, that or they were using the more you know, broad social issues type of thing. Um, so some issues are more contentious than others. Um, and then some members are less effective, you know, which you get more benefit from working with some members than others. And, uh, you know, to some degree from the interviews, the larger sense is that some members are jerks. Um, again, that's not easy to measure. So <laughs> I'm going to focus more on the part about members being more or less effective because I can measure that. Um, all right. Uh, so to kind of tie together these uh, you know, somewhat conflicting expectations of why members might collaborate or why they would not collaborate, I draw on social exchange theory uh, from uh, the you know, sociological and psychology uh, literatures uh, in which the idea of social exchange theory is that relationships form when uh, two people expect that the benefits of doing so, of being in a relationship are going to exceed the cost. It's a fairly you know, standard cost benefit framework on its surface. Um, but it's you know a little more complicated than that because the exchanges are frequently of intangible goods, feelings, and you know affect. Um, uh, you know, kind of the you know, uh, trademark illustration or you know one of the initial illustrations of the theory is you know if you think about any time that you've had like an interaction with someone and you've walked away from it just thinking like wow that was really draining or on the other side you know that was actually like a really invigorating conversation like that's an example of how social relationships can actually convey uh, these you know, more intangible uh, benefits or costs. Uh, and so I argue that collaboration is really a series of exchanges in which members are trading ideas, strategies, access to key players, endorsements, uh, and, and other uh, dynamics in pursuit of a shared policy goal. But importantly, the shared policy goal is not enough to facilitate a collaborative relationship. If it were, you would see um, you know, somewhat famously a few years ago, uh, I honestly don't even remember the issue, but uh, AOC and Ted Cruz agreed on an issue publicly on Twitter and said, you know, we should work together on this. And that never happened because at the end of the day, you know, they can agree on the policy issue, but there's still a lot of barriers to actually preventing them to form a collaborative relationship. And a lot of that is what I explore in the book and how members consider whether the value of working with a particular colleague on a given policy is actually likely to exceed the value of working alone. Um, that's going to be based on their expected uh, costs and benefits of collaboration, which are shaped by previous interactions and reputational effects and institutional factors uh, and you know, a lot of different moving parts going on. And so that turns into a whole book. Uh, but underlying all of this, uh, in which it's shaped by, by uh, you know, these opportunities and incentives, uh, is that you know, throughout all of it, we should think about collaboration as a function of both self-interest and interdependence. The important thing is that members have to be motivated to collaborate, the self-interest aspect of things. They have to believe that they're going to get something out of it. But they also have to find, be able to find someone to work with. They have to be able to find someone who thinks similarly, who, who also thinks that they're going to be able to get something out of it. And that's the interdependence angle. And both of them are really important to understanding relationships in Congress. All right, um, so I measure uh, collaboration in Congress using uh, Dear Colleague letters. Uh, I have a data set of uh, over 90,000 Dear Colleague letters sent from 1999 to 2010. Um, and these are drawn from an email list serve uh, that is then distributed to all house office, uh, how, all house offices. Uh, and I use Dear Colleagues uh, because they, uh, there's a couple of advantages that I think Dear Colleagues have in terms of measuring collaboration. First, they reflect really the earliest stages of the policy process. Uh, and so this is an example of a Dear Colleague from Congressman uh, Bart Gordon and Jim Sensenbrenner uh, from uh, 2009, uh, talking about the Combat, Combat Methamphetamine Enhancement Act. And you'll notice that they're asking people to be an original sponsor of the Combat uh, Methamphetamine Enhancement Act. They're actually reaching out to members to try to get support for the piece of legislation before it's even introduced. And that's really common with these Dear Colleague letters is that they're actually sent out in the, you know, before a bill is even introduced, members send this out, try to recruit original co-sponsors uh, so that they can introduce the bill with already kind of a groundswelling of support. 
Um, and then the other reason that I use Dear Colleague letters is because the members who are signing, I argue that the members who sign a letter together are jointly claiming credit for the underlying policy initiative. Uh, and you can see that in the language that is used in this letter here, in which uh, you know, they refer to the legislation as kind of our legislation. Uh, at the end of it, they talk about, you know, if you want to become a sponsor of this, you can contact either one of our offices. It's really a joint endeavor by both offices. And importantly, they're sending a signal to the other members of the House. Hey, this is actually a joint effort between the two members. Uh, so I have uh, Dear Colleague letters, and I identify these relationships through members signing the Dear Colleague letters together. Uh, what does that actually look like uh, in practice? Uh, so the letters are sent for a variety of different purposes. One of the other reasons I think that Dear Colleagues provide you know, some unique insights into collaboration is that they're not limited to legislation. Uh, about half of the letters are recruiting co-sponsors for legislation like the previous uh, slide. But the other half are actually dealing with uh, you know, non-legislative initiatives or um, amendments and, and floor votes. And you can see that here uh, in that, you know, 20% of the Dear Colleague letters are actually asking members to sign on to another letter. <laughs> so you have the Dear Colleague letter, which is asking members to sign on to an underlying letter, usually that goes to the Appropriations Committee asking for increased funding for a particular you know, project or to the administration expressing outrage or support or, you know, <laughs> so on and so forth. Uh, and so that also uh, comprises a large uh, group of these uh, letters. Uh, another about 20% of them are invitations uh, to events. Uh, these are frequently, uh, because this is all congressional activity, so there's no campaign activity involved. Some of those events are you know, things like a lobbyist will have brought zoo animals actually <laughs> to the Hill would probably end up with a dear colleague associated with it. Um, but also a lot of them are actually uh, invitations to briefings on particular issues. So they're still very policy focused. A lot of them are very policy focused. Uh, a pretty small percentage, uh, just under 10%, uh, pertain to floor action. Uh, this includes not only vote for, or vote against this bill, but uh, the largest uh, group within that category are actually amendments. So vote for our amendments, vote against the amendment to this bill. Uh, general information is uh, frequently things like don't use the doors on a certain entrance because they're going to be locked. <laughs> a lot of administrative stuff. And then finally, a very small percentage um, is about members of Congress joining congressional caucuses, like recruiting members to join caucuses together. All right. Uh, one of the other things that I think is pretty uh, unique about these letters is that they really represent you know, small scale collaborations. Uh, so this is a distribution of the number of signers uh, on each letter. And you can see that about half of the letters are sent without any other members attached to it. So it's just one member sends the letter by themselves. Uh, and then the other half are collaborative. But of those collaborative uh, le letters, almost all of them are signed uh, by about two to four members. Uh, so these are, again, you know, really uh, just a couple of members working together, um, which, you know, makes it easier to find agreements, um, makes it easier to negotiate uh, when it's, you know, only two considerations that you're actually uh, balancing rather than, you know, 20. All right, so getting into models. Um, so one of the first things I, I do is think about, uh, you know, when do members of Congress collaborate in terms of thinking about policy? Uh, because one of the things that, you know, the assumption is frequently that, sure, members of Congress are working together, but they're working together on naming post offices. You know, that, that what they're doing is not actually important. Uh, and so I estimate a series of models in which I, um, predict the likelihood that a letter is going to be collaborative um, based on whether it is commemorative, substantive, but not significant or significant using the Bolden and Wiseman uh, breakdown, um, which is based on CQ reports. And as you can see here, that um, the significant legislation is actually the most likely to be collaborative. And a lot of that's driven by within party collaboration. So those are frequently major collaborations within the majority party. It's two members of the majority party working together on you know, sig significant uh, party priority. Um, but importantly, again, commemorative legislation is actually the least likely to be collaborative. And part of this is because, as we'll see later, you know, collaboration is a way for members to kind of you know, promote uh, their legislation, but give it some credibility. 
uh, increase the likelihood uh, that it will grab the attention of the leadership. Uh, and there's less of a need to do that and, and demonstrate that it's not necessarily as contentious as it might seem. And there's less of a need to do that uh, when you're naming a post office and everyone assumes it's fairly uh, non-contentious. Um, but yeah, so a lot of this is actually, um, significance is, is the smallest category of letter or letters of legislation um, in total. So the, excuse me, uh, the vast majority of collaborative legislation is actually in the substantive but not significant category. Um, and it includes things like, uh, you know, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, uh, Child Labor Protection, uh, Paycheck Fairness Act, you know, a lot of actually like pretty important legislation that uh, falls under this, you know, collaborative umbrella. Uh, and so one of the first things I model then is again, the probability that a given letter is actually collaborative. Um, and these are results from a, a multinomial logit for all uh, letters. Um, and what I argue here is that what I'm really interested in is thinking about the degree to which the issue of a letter you know, shapes the uh, likelihood that it is collaborative. And so I look at uh, the dimensionality. I, I classify all of the uh, letters according to like the policy agendas project uh, topic coding, and then look at the dimensionality of each one of those issues, uh, drawing on uh, uh, Joachim and Jones, who uh, basically identified the degree to which roll call votes on a particular issue topic can be explained by a single left-right dimension. And so the higher the dimensionality uh, means an issue that is not split nearly on neatly on left-right lines. Uh, and so as you can see here, uh, you know, when you have uh, as expected issues that a letter is on an issue that is a high dimensionality issue, which is things like agriculture. Um, is our go-to, um, it is uh, much more likely to be collaborative um, for both partisan and bipartisan collaboration. So BP is the bipartisan collaboration and P is partisan and the reference category here is just non-collaborative. So these are all compared to non-collaborative uh, letter. Uh, I also look at whether or not an issue is on the leadership's agenda uh, using uh, some of the um, uh, using Francis and Jim's uh, data from the back of their book, um, is uh, looking at whether or not these issues are on the leadership's agenda. And I find uh, that uh, when issues are on the leadership's agenda, they're more likely to be bipartisan, uh, which I attribute largely to people trying to kind of get their bill attached to something that's moving. So for example, uh, when the Affordable Care Act uh, was, when everyone knew that they were doing health care reform at Congress, actually before the Affordable Care Act existed. Everyone knew they were doing health care reform uh, that Congress. There was a flurry of collaborative health care letters because members were trying to demonstrate that, oh, well, you know, I have this idea. It's a very small idea, but it has bipartisan support. And so therefore it should go into this bill. Uh, letters that actually pertain specifically to legislation are less likely to be collaborative relative to particularly like the policy letters um, where members are sending letters to appropriations uh, or, or the administration are much more likely to be collaborative than legislative letters. Uh, letters that are in opposition to a given policy, which are a very small subset of the letters, um, but in those cases you'll see that opposition letters are basically never bipartisan and always partisan uh, if they're collaborative. Uh, and then finally, when letters are signed first by the member of the minority party, uh, then they're uh, much less likely to be collaborative. All right. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to go kind of quickly through this part, but thinking then about who the collaborative members are, right? So we talked a little bit about how collaboration really varies across issue areas. Members are much more likely to collaborate on issues that are less contentious, as you would imagine. Um, but there's also a lot of variation uh, among individual members. And so this is the degree, to, the number of collaborative partners that individual members have in the 111th Congress. Um, and the average is around 20. So the average member uh, collaborates with about 20 of their colleagues uh, in a given Congress, but it ranges from zero to 90. Like some of the members are out there just you know, making friends with everyone. And so uh, here again, I model the, uh, the outcome that I'm modeling here is the uh, number of collaborative partners that a member has. So I'm trying to identify the factors that make members more or less uh, likely to collaborate with more or more or less people. Um, and so these are, um, I, I shape, I, I frame this in terms of uh, the fact that you have both incentives to collaborate, the idea that 
uh, you know, members who introduce a lot of substantive legislation who are more policy minded have more incentives to collaborate because they want to create policy. Um, and uh, members who are ideologically extreme have more of an incentive to collaborate because they can moderate the appearance of the bill, like or, or the letter, will seem less extreme if they collaborate with uh, a more moderate colleague, whether it's in the other party or the same party. Um, and so that's two examples of of members that have you know strong incentives because the substantive legislation is significant, even though it's you know a tiny little dot on the line because my ideological extremity uh, coefficient was so large. Um, but then also when I look at opportunities, you know, thinking about this exchange, we need members to not only want to collaborate, but also be able to find someone to collaborate with. And that's where we see, um, in terms of opportunities, uh, you know, uh, the main one there is this social opportunity measure uh, down towards the bottom of the chart, uh, which is actually a function of how collaborative your friends are. So if you collaborate with someone who has a lot of friends, uh, the idea is that that actually makes it much more likely for you to be able to form more connections because you can actually reach out to them. Basically, it's much easier if you're looking for a co-author to uh, talk to a mutual friend, someone who you have a mutual friend uh, with than to cold call a stranger. Same thing to do with writing legislation. Uh, okay. Um, I also then look at this from a network perspective, uh, looking at the degree to which, so members in this case uh, are the nodes. They are connected when they uh, sign a dear colleague letter together. Um, and you can see uh, this is the network for the 111th Congress. Uh, this is a substantially more bipartisan network than you know, any of the other networks that we see of Congress than the co-sponsorship or um, co-voting networks. Um, that can be illustrated here if I just look at the percentage of ties that are bipartisan versus Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Democrats frequently will collaborate with their co-partisans, whether they're in the majority or minority, and Republicans generally do not. Um, they're a little more likely to collaborate with their co-partisans when they're in the majority. Um, but uh, bipartisan collaboration is, is very common. Uh, and then this is, again, model results about when members of Congress are much more likely to collaborate. And the main things here are that uh, it's a function of strategic considerations uh, in which members try to collaborate by part and across the aisle, um, but they also kind of want to minimize the ideological distance uh, between them and, and their partners so that they don't have to you know, go too far in terms of the agreement that they want to reach. Uh, it's also a function of personal relationships. Uh, the uh, uh, triadic closure and preferential attachment coefficients are like network dynamics that reflect uh, existing relationships in Congress, uh, and then shared policy interests. So members from the same state, members who sit on the same committee, members who co-chair caucuses together. Uh, I don't put all caucus members in there because that gets really messy really fast, but members who co-chair caucuses together do have a shared policy interest, and, and so they are much more likely to collaborate as well. All right, and then finally, the outcomes. Uh, so why does this matter? Well, it turns out collaborative legislation is more successful at every stage of the legislative process. Uh, so this is, um, you know, the first step is uh, gathering co-sponsors, uh, and we see that uh, collaborative legislation, the predicted number of co-sponsors jumps from around 11 uh, if there's no letter sent to 51 when that letter is both collaborative and bipartisan. Uh, then if I look at the probability of a bill being reported out of committee, uh, here, it is, again, significantly more likely to be successful if it's collaborative, but there's no bonus effect for bipartisanship. So that's important here is that both in the committee stage and on the floor stage, collaborative legislation is more successful regardless of whether it's partisan or bipartisan. Um, and part of that's because the partisan collaborations are really being driven, are, are, are driving a lot of that significant legislation, you know, the kind of major party priorities. Uh, that you know, are fairly successful, um, but uh, but yeah. So finding that uh, collaborative legislation more likely to succeed at the committee stage. Um, this is breaking it out into significant uh, and uh, these substantive but not significant uh, categories. So you can see that there's a nice increase for members that are trying to pass the substantive but not significant letter uh, legislation for of, bi of bipartisanship. Um, and then it is also more likely to pass on the floor. Collaborative legislation is more likely to pass on the floor. Again, uh, whether or not it's partisan or bipartisan. Um, and at the end of the day, it is also more likely to be enacted. Uh, and so this is, uh, 
when I measure enactment here, um, what I did was I not only looked at whether the bill was signed into law using our you know, standard metrics, but I also tried to account for when le uh, legislation is incorporated into other pieces of legislation. Um, to some degree, you know, limited success of doing that, but using some of the GovTrack data on whether or not a bill was incorporated into another bill, I was able to identify instances in which legislation of that exact wording was enacted or, um, and frequently that ended up being like the Senate counterpart version of a House bill was enacted. Um, so all of that ends up getting incorporated into this, um, which increases the probability of enactment over what you would expect normally. Um, but yeah, here we see that again, bipartisan collaboration or partisan and, and bipartisan collaboration um, are both more likely to be enacted. And these are house bills um, than non-collaborative legislation. Um, and then when I look specifically at this category of substantive but not significant legislation where we see more bipartisan collaboration, that's where you see that it's really the for the um, by, benefits of bipartisan collaboration are largely for the rank and file members who are trying to get attention for their issues, who are trying to get them through the legislative process. Um, and, and those efforts actually do pay off uh, in that they're much more likely to get through the Senate and end up being enacted if it's, it originates as a bipartisan collaboration. All right, so, sorry, that never again will I attempt to do a book in 20 minutes. <laughs> Minutes. But uh, so in the collaborative Congress, uh, members of Congress uh, routinely collaborate uh, and jointly cr claim credit for these policy initiatives, which I then measure through dear colleague letters. Um, I argue that collaboration is a function of both incentive and opportunity that you need both to have self interest and uh, interdependence have, you have to come from both dynamics to understand collaboration. Uh, members do choose their collaborative partners strategically. They look for people who are going to be an asset to them. Um, they collaborate on substantive policy issues. This is not a world in which everything is post offices. Uh, and at the end of the day, collaborative legislation is more successful at every stage of the legislative process. And for more details, there is a book coming. I went over, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're, you're fine. Um, so I'll I'll exercise my my prerogative again, and and I the question that I have uh, is one that I've heard you speak to before, and and I may have even asked you this um, before at at one of Craig and Allen's things or some version of it. But um, so I noticed your slide, uh, and I don't know, maybe it might be useful to pull it back up. But the the one that that showed um, you know the different regression coefficients on likelihood of collaboration across the the all and then uh, partisan and the bipartisan and and you know the the co or the the models or the um, effects relating to um, Republican uh, party ID. Uh, if you can find that slide again, I, I want to reference it for others. Yeah, trying to go back instead of um, yeah, well, I think, the one. Uh, yeah. So the first slide on on the left and and the third one, uh, I think you know don't come as any surprise. Uh, to to me, um, and and again, like just to sort of give people a sense of where I'm coming from here, and 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 you, and I, but I, again, I think you already know. Uh, you know, we know that Republicans are less likely than Democrats to actually want to get stuff done, right? They a lot of them don't actually go to Congress with the goal of of getting stuff done, being um, at the top of their agenda, unlike Democrats because they don't believe in government as much. Blah blah blah. And so if you don't believe in getting stuff done, then the incentives to actually collaborate are, are far fewer because, you know, as you've shown us, right, I mean, collaboration helps you to get stuff done, helps you to be effective. Uh, and so therefore, the first frame doesn't surprise me, right, that very significant uh, and large coefficient there for Republican identity. But the second one um, is, a, is a surprise, right, showing that, that Republicans are apparently more likely than Democrats, um, pretty significantly so. I think it's the biggest coefficient in your table there um, to collaborate in a bipartisan way. And, and again, that just, um, that's counterintuitive to me. And so I was wondering if you might speak to that and maybe also to my to my broader kind of premise that I, that I put out there. Sure. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, and it's, you know, I, I <laughs> spent a lot of time like staring at that before I kind of was piecing it together. And and yeah. this is a, it's actually, um, if, once I, I thought it through, finally, I realized it's, it's actually not that difficult to explain if you think about it in terms of what we're referencing it against. 
And the answer is that Democrats are pretty much equally likely to collaborate within their own party or with members of the other party. Whereas when Republicans collaborate, they're basically only going to collaborate with the other party. They don't actually seem to see a lot of value of within party collaboration, a little bit more so when they're in the majority. But if we go to, again, as I was going very quickly through all of my slides, uh, this example where I actually break down the percentage of ties you can see that lightest gray category is the Republicans. um, And they're just very consistently Republican to Republican relationships. They're just much less likely to collaborate within their own party. Um, And, you know, I think there's a lot of potential explanations that I can use. Um, You know, to some degree, I do think that there's an element of, you know, if you're policymaking, uh, if if your motives are to create policy, you know, you have more of an incentive to collaborate. But there's also a strategic element in terms of if they view the primary benefit of collaboration as being bipartisan, and that's very common, like among the congressional staff, a lot of them were not even thinking about like partisan collaboration as being helpful. Um, So one of my findings that was more surprising was actually the benefits of of partisan collaboration as well. But if you view the benefit of collaboration as only being in terms of bipartisan collaboration, then strategically there's really no point in like trying to go find a within party friend to work with. Yeah. Um, so it can also be attributed to, in theory, uh, the Republicans being a little more strategic with their time and efforts, or possibly more antisocial. I mean, I don't actually have a great explanation. <laughs> All right, I can't. But maybe they're, I maybe they're um, you know, more unified. Uh, I mean, maybe there there's less need uh, to find a partisan friend, um, because there's less, there are fewer divisions within the the Republican caucus writ large than there are within the Democratic caucus. So, so maybe that's less of a necessity. That's possible. Uh, um, you know, it's also one of the reasons that I think we see a lot of um, Democratic uh, collaboration, and and particularly like the Dem- some of the, you know the Democrats are among the most collaborative members. Um, is they really do just seem to engage in a lot more relationship building. Like they just seem to be more interested in making friends yeah. <laughs> um, and, and looking at, you know, a lot of different types of relationships they form. They really are you know, more engaged in that kind of relationship building. And so if you think about the decision to collaborate as also being a question of, well, you know, so I have to think about the benefits of this. The benefits largely come from bipartisanship. And then I have to think about the costs of it. And the costs largely come from finding a friend or someone I you know, know or know the friend of to work, reach out to. But I haven't actually put all that much effort into forming relationships. Um, then that would also explain less, but definitely something that I think needs to be, you know, it's on the list of things that I talk about that should be explored further (laughs) because I don't get fully in the weeds on it in the book, but oops, I think you're muted now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was just saying, and yeah, I get it. And it's like, again, it's like fascinating stuff. And so great work and and I'll uh, shut up now and and let you uh, answer questions from others. Sure. Uh, Laurel. Uh, So great to see the kind of growth of this project and congratulations on it um, nearing the final completion. Um, So I guess the question that I have built a little bit on David's question, which is thinking a little bit more about this kind of surprising finding about the the intra-party, like the the partisan collaborations. And I was wondering there if you've unpacked that more in terms of what the successful like partisan collaborations look like. And kind of what I'm wondering is, you know, you can think about particularly on the Democratic side, you know, are those more successful when the collaboration signals agreement across the kind of progressive and more moderate ring, wing of the party? Um, or kind of other ways of thinking about like the, the same kind of information that we might get from a bipartisan collaboration in terms of like, this has the potential to kind of have a coalition behind it that could pass, you know, yeah. if we need a majority to pass and, you know, if we got some bipartisan support, that's going to be easier to do, or especially if we need a supermajority. Well, you know, if I'm only want to work with my own party on it, I still might have a better success if I'm signaling that same kind of information. So, um, I just wondering if, if you have looked at that or if think that that would be a relevant kind of way to think about the success of the partisan collaborations. Yeah, so I dig into this a little bit um, in the in the chapter in which I show all of the effects of collaboration um, and a couple of different things. So first, it should be said that this is the success of partisan of 
of partisan collaboration is driven entirely by majority majority collaborations. I have two instances in the entire data set of a minority minority collaboration actually then passing the house. And in both cases, it was, um, well, basically like a post op. It wasn't actually a post office, but commemorative legislation. Um, so it's driven entirely by majority majority collaborations. And then within that subset of like the majority majority collaborations, um, kind of tying into some of the work from earlier today, uh, it is very common that they are, it's actually a collaboration between the committee chair and then the chair of the relevant subcommittee within that committee. Um, and so that is something in which like, it's a little bit of, you know, I do run into the issue of would that have been successful even if it hadn't been collaborative? Well, you know, maybe because it's, it's the committee chair's bill, sure. But in a lot of those cases, it's actually the committee chair throwing their support behind a bill that's actually introduced by one of the committee members. And so I think that's actually fueling a lot of the like partisan partisan dynamic is that it's actually that a powerful or influential member of the majority party is throwing their support, is demonstrating their support for a piece of legislation um, that's introduced by a more rank and file majority party member um, is my expectation. I don't, haven't teased it. Like, the data becomes really challenging to identify like who actually like initiated the relationship, uh, unfortunately, because members are also very strategic in terms of the order that they sign the letters. Um, you'll see in like when letters are sent from one Congress to the next, they actually change the order of the signer so that the first signer is you know, usually the majority party member. Um, so, you know, that makes it challenging, or is the chairman actually in a lot of these cases. Um, but I do think a lot of that is just driven by, again, kind of more influential members supporting their colleagues. Um, yeah, so that answers your question. Uh, Catherine. Great, thank you. And Allison, thank you for a great presentation and I'm excited to read the book. Um, I had a question about the slide about the relation, the collaborative relationships coefficients. And you noted that you had caucus leaders, uh, but not caucus members, which definitely makes sense. But I do wonder if caucus relationships are also a mechanism at work for the female to female collaborative relationships and the same minority relationships. Because you wouldn't necessarily expect the, that the Congressional Footwear Caucus is going to you know, bring about a lot of close relationships, but you would expect that from the CBC or the Women's Caucus perhaps. Um, and so I'm wondering what do you think is going on with the caucus leaders, because some of these caucuses are so sort of random, you almost wouldn't necessarily expect that the chairs would have a great relationship, but some are so central that you would. And so if you could say a little bit more about those results and whether or not you truly looked at every single of the hundreds of caucuses and their co-chairs and relationships. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of, I, I grabbed the caucus leader data from Jen Victor. Uh, so, um, you know, yes, there are, it's very possible that I missed some caucuses in there, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably the best data set that we have that I've seen anyway. Um, and so in terms of this, it's, you know, in, so in fairness, to some degree, it's being driven by that, like 2% of letters in which the caucus leaders are actually sending out a dear colleague letter asking people to join their caucus. <laughs> But it's also, the caucus leaders also frequently collaborate on issues that are relevant to their caucus beyond just recruiting members. And so that's actually, so the caucus leaders that are being trapped by this, I, are, I, I expect are largely the more active caucuses in the sense that they are also then the caucuses that it's like, well, we run this caucus together and now we're also as this caucus going to send a letter to the appropriations committee asking for money for you know X and you should please sign our, our letter. Um, so that's probably the largest subcategory of the caucus leader letters that, that I see observe in the data. Um, in terms of, you know, I do think that the you know, Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Women's Caucus um, do more to foster relationships that exist outside of that very narrow world in which we're going to write on Footwear. <laughs> actually, I choose Met as an example, actually, because the, the co chairs of the Congressional Methamphetamine uh, Epidemic Caucus actually frequently do a lot of uh, dear colleague letters on various bills that they're promoting, letters uh, that they are sending, et cetera. Um, and, you know, those four members, I think, do actually have, you know, they end up developing uh, friendships over time. Um, but, you know, certainly there's no relationship building that's happening among the rank and file members of that caucus because it functions largely as a mailing list, essentially, of like, you know, are you interested in this issue? Here you go. 
Um, whereas I think that the Women's Caucus and the uh, Black Caucus, again, do foster much more of that relationship building among their rank and file members. And that does actually probably explain the same minority and the gender effects that I'm seeing here. I think that it probably does play a large role in, in that. Yeah. Uh, Steve. I, I too think it's a great project. Um, I'm wondering in the context of um, <clears throat> this more general project though, how much these um, the collaborations, especially the Dear Colleague collaborations reflect um, signing on to a popular idea. Uh, in the case of bipartisan collaborations, uh, one that really doesn't have any partisan uh, uh, relevance, um, and how much of it actually represents some negotiation among co-signers? Um, uh, is there any, I, I, I assume that from the, uh, from the letters themselves, that cannot be determined. Uh, but I wonder if uh, there's uh, a way to elaborate a little bit more about what the politics are that go into the collaboration. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so you're right that it is unfortunately very difficult from the letters itself to actually determine the degree to which these two members work together, the degree to which they, uh, you know, came in with the same opinion in the first place or actually had to work to find an agreement. Um, so I try to strengthen you know, that side, basically arguing that this is a valid uh, measurement by looking to the interview data that I did with congressional staffers and talking, and also uh, various, a lot of actual media reports of members working on these dear colleague letters. Uh, with each other. And so um, in terms of the popularity aspect of things, um, again, a large part of I you know fight against that to some degree by just uh, looking at the letters. So in a lot of cases, letters are sent multiple times. Like a member will actually send a letter, uh, you know, initially to say I'm introducing the bill and then they'll send it, you know, two, three, four more times to say like, please support this bill, please support this bill, et cetera. Uh, and you'll see in a lot of these cases that members will list the co-sponsors on the bill and that list just kind of continues to grow. But the number, the signers, the initial signers actually remain the same. And so I always in these cases grab the earliest letter, uh, which is frequently one that comes either before the bill has been introduced or shortly thereafter, like basically immediately upon uh, inter introduction to for bills um, to try to combat against the you know, popularity uh, effect. Of course, that doesn't necessarily address the part where it's just a good idea or a popular idea. Um, and so from talking to congressional staff, you know, there is there are certainly cases in which, uh, you know, members, a member will go to another member and say, hey, I'm working on this project. I would like you to be like our lead sponsor in the other party. You know, will you sign this dear colleague letter? Um, and sometimes they'll say yes. Frequently, they will say, well, maybe, but I want to change the language this way and this way and this way. So there's always like, just, you know, there was always at least a little bit of members just being particular uh, <laughs> about things um, and, and trying to customize things to their, their liking. Um, but you know, one of the things I, so I opened my book actually with this example of, um, uh, of two members that were working together um, on a, a piece of legislation to make the um, like pandemic preparedness officer, a member of the National Security Council. Uh, and this is a case in which uh, the Democrat uh, who was pushing the bill, you know, knew that they wanted a Republican lead. They went to a Republican member who they'd worked with before and said, hey, I have this idea, not like the legislative language, but I have this idea. Um, would you be willing to sign on to it or work with me on this? And the Republican agreed that they would, but only if, you know, certain caveats were met. And so they actually ended up spending about a year and a half working out the language to try to find, craft the language in a way that both offices would be okay with, um, because the Republican was very concerned about doing anything that might be perceived as criticizing Trump. Um, and so they had a lot of, kind of demands in that regard. Um, so that's probably more characteristic of, of the bulk of these relationships in which, you know, one member probably has the idea and goes to the other, but the working out, working out the details is actually going back and forth between the members uh, in many of these cases, at least from my discussions with congressional staff. And in some cases, actually, I had a couple of conversations with members who were, or staff who were in the minority who described instances in which they actually did the bulk of the work of like drafting the legislation and then like handed and, and like the supporting materials and then handed it to the majority party colleague to like, you know, tweak to their liking and then introduce, um, which I enjoyed in terms of like the idea came from the minority member, but they just gave it to a majority party member to introduce uh, instead. But 
yeah, in all these cases, like there's at least some, you know, there's in most cases, I should say, I assume, I think it's reasonable to assume that there's some sort of interaction and negotiation about the language, whether it's a question of we're going to work out the compromise of what's in this bill or the letter, or in some cases, it's a matter of I have this bill and you have this bill. And so let's bring them together and make, you know, a new bill. Like that's another example that I have uh, a fair number of in here. Okay, I uh, I think that that might be it. Well, thank you very much, Allison. Great. Oh yeah, I can and, stop, uh, so I can stop taking over the screen. Yeah, and and thanks to everybody uh, for. Um, you know, sticking with us today and, and for all of your participation and, and great comments and questions. I, I certainly have found um, this invigorating and, uh, uh, you know, I have new ideas that I want to pursue and, and uh, continue this conversation with all of you. And so, um, you know, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of, of your weekend. Uh, and let's, you know, continue this this effort to, to learn more uh, about legislative negotiation and and, legis and the, you know, I suppose adjacent uh, areas uh, to legislative negotiation. Uh, I think Bettina might have a few uh, words to say as well. Do you, Bettina? Yeah, first off, I mean, thanks to everyone for a really terrific discussion and, uh, all your engagement and what the work you've done in your scholarship. I'll be circling back to several of you along with David. Um, some have not spent all their funds. We are gonna have probably a little more time to deal with that. There are some basic deliverables that everybody had in their original grant, things like blog posts and a few paragraph summaries, not a heavy lift, we'll send you an email. Uh, originally all that was due in October, but because we have a little more time, we're gonna ask you, um, how much time you need to get some of these items done if your work is completed with respect to the funds that you have. Um, and then for those who uh, are gonna keep working, we'll talk to you as well. So stay tuned for an email uh, that'll deal with those kind of deliverables so we can wrap up that administrative piece. And, um, and thanks again for everything you all have done. We're really um, pleased to have been able to be a part of it. And we do have uh, as I mentioned, another uh, tranche of money that we are going to invite people to apply for. So we'll circle back on that as well. Yeah, and we'd love to see, uh, you know, proposals from some of you folks here. Uh, mm -hmm. who are grantees. Definitely. And, and some of you, you know, previous grantees as well. Nice Halloween decorations, Chris Clark. Those are great. I can't take any credit for it. So but I'll, 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 I'll take the thank you. I should have just lied and pretend like I did it. <laughs> All right. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. And like I said, have a great weekend and take care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.